behalf of the county commissioners, I wanted to welcome everybody here to our uh, one meeting of the month, I guess one county commission meeting, the July 13th meeting. We'll have a two o'clock session, then followed by public hearings at six o'clock. Um, so it's just great to have everybody here today. And um, we are going to start with invocation from Reverend Pritchett of the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance Church of St. Petersburg. And we'll follow that up with the pledge of, uh, led by Commissioner Justice. Thank you, let's pray. With wisdom, power, and love, our God is an awesome God. God, you have kept us through a global pandemic you have given us vaccines for our body. You've protected us from Hurricane Elsa. Only a creator can make hurricanes and storms obey. Thank you for the wisdom, power, and love you show this county daily. May our public servants use wisdom in the power you have given them. May we all show love to each other in our words and in our deeds. May we not forget the poor, those in nursing homes, and not though not forget those who are homeless. And may those who look for hope, compassion, and love here on earth see it in us. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend Pritchett. Thank you for being here, appreciate it. All right, we're gonna have um, four presentations, awards, if you will, uh, this, this afternoon. And um, I'm gonna go up here to the podium in just a second. Uh, we'll be talking about National Parks and Recreation, a couple of employees, uh, four employee recognitions. We have a partner presentation uh, from the Botanical Gardens and then a business presentation uh, with, from Paul Pfeiffer at AFC Urgent Care. So we have four of those and we'll get started uh, right away. Thanks. first one is going to be for National Parks and Recreation Month, and um, uh, Debbie Chayette, who's the chairman of our Parks and Conservation Resources Advisory Board, isn't here today, uh, but Peg Cummings, who's the vice chairman, is here, and I'd like to invite her up at this time. Good to see you. Welcome. Um, dear friend. Uh, and we used to work together at Dunedin, so it's good to, good to have you here today. And um, uh, you're going to be accepting this on behalf of the residents for National Parks and Recreation Month. I'm going to go ahead and read the proclamation and then take a picture and turn the microphone to you. Parks and Recreation programs enhance our quality of life by contributing to a life, healthy lifestyle, community building, economic development, and environmental sustainability. Parks and recreation activities and leisure experiences provide opportunities for people to live, grow and develop into contributing members of society, as well as boost the economy, attract new business, and increase tourism. Pinellas County's parks and preserves provide outlets for physical activities, socialization, scenic beauty that create personal connections and experiences which help strengthen families. Pinellas County's parks, playgrounds, nature fields, open spaces, cultural and historic sites make the community an attractive and desirable place to live, work, play, visit, and contribute to our ongoing economic vitality. Pinellas County Parks, preserves, greenways, and open spaces provide a welcome respite from our fast-paced, high-tech lifestyles while protecting and preserving our natural resources. The National Parks and Recreations Association and the Florida Recreation and Park Association designate July as National Parks and Recreation and now therefore be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that July 21st be recognized as National Parks and Recreation Month. So we'll do that, take a picture. Microphone 
Rogers. Thank you so much, Chairman Eggers. And on behalf of Pinellas County's Conservation and Parks Committee, I accept this proclamation with honor. As uh, our chairman indicated in that proclamation, it's filled with so many things that parks and recreation does for citizens. We mentor children. We isolate elderly from loneliness. We conserve green space and parks. And because I'm a former recreation director, I have to throw in all the rec side. But Pinellas County has been always the leader in green space and parks. When I moved here, I was amazed at Pinellas County Park System. That is a credit to all of you and those who've come before you. And I just want to thank you for acknowledging the value and the importance of what this department and this committee means to our citizenry. So I just want to thank you so much. I also want to take the opportunity to acknowledge and thank Paul Kazi and his team for all the hard work that they do. And it's not an easy job. Thank you all. <laughs> I knew she'd talk a lot about recreation, um, but also recognizing Paul, thank you for doing that. Paul, you and your team do a great job. I had an opportunity to work with a lot of them this past week or two out at uh, one of the parks, and uh, they just do really great work every day. So, uh, and we, speaking of our employees, we get a chance to recognize employees from time to time for just the great work that they do to keep our residents safe, um, care for our environment, strengthen our economy, do a whole lot of things for our community and our residents every day. And our employee appreciation program that we do from time to time is a way to thank individuals or teams that really have done an outstanding job. And today, we're gonna to begin our recognitions with an employee from our Veterans Services Group. And every single day, Cleocinda Mitsutani helps Pinellas County veterans access services that they have earned and deserve. As we are about to see, she has proven herself to be a tremendous asset to the team at Veterans Services and to the vets themselves. So I'd like to invite Office Specialist Cleocinda Mitsutani to the podium while we watch a video about her role and accomplishments. Cleocinda, come on. Veteran Services team member Clea Senda Mizutani is that first friendly voice. Thank you for calling Pinellas County Veteran Services. A Pinellas County veteran or a family member speaks to when they turn to the county for assistance. Her role is so important in our mission because she's the person that makes sure that customer, that veteran, gets to the correct subject matter expert to assist them with whatever their needs are. Hi, Ron. One of your clients came by. Not only does Cleocinda ensure veterans get connected to the right staff member for assistance, she also recently connected veterans affected by the COVID-19 pandemic to financial assistance through the COVID Cares 211 Financial Assistance Program. I'm lucky to be a part of the Veteran Services Division because here I'm able to work uh, with veterans who are giving back and serving other veterans as well. Clea Sinda also helps homeless veterans get the services they deserve. Cleo was instrumental in developing, assisting us in developing our homeless guide. And our homeless guide is a, is a resource that, that puts together the different resources that homeless veterans will use to assist them in um, getting shelter, shortening the length of time that they're actually homeless. So that guide is instrumental, and she was a big part in, in putting that together. Combine that with her efficiency, effectiveness, and her outstanding work ethic, and Cleo Senda Mizutani definitely deserves to be recognized for a job well done.
I would like to thank the Board of County Commissioners for this award. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank uh, Human Services Department, the Veteran Services Division, my coworkers, my family, and uh, the veterans that we serve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, the folks, the folks over there do such great work for our veterans and um, just having them a part of the team and part of the effort and working with our VA down, down county, it's just been, just been an awesome working uh, partnership to have. So thank you, Clea Um Our next recognition involves a group of employees. Um, and so Pinellas County's Building and Development Review Services Building Department, our de building department's been going through a lot of uh, analysis, investigation, we're kind of looking at re reformatting re and changing our delivery there this past year. Um, and with, and so, so our, de our department works with public every day in guiding plan development and building project with homeowners, architects, contractors, and developers. That's quite a difference. You're working with professionals every single day, but you're also working with individuals, like if I came in for a permit, and they have to deal with the emotional person that I am versus the professionals that they have to. So they have to deal with all, all of us on a day-to-day -day basis. And by helping seamlessly transition to the Acela permits software, Layla Carradine, Michael Hauser, and Dane Morris have helped the county streamline staff workflow and provide greater access to our customers. And so uh, I, I know Layla's not here today, or unless she decided to come, I'm not sure, but I know that uh, project coordinator Michael Hauser, engineer Dane Harris, I'd like them to come up and join me at the podium. And so we'll have a video here to, to uh, recognize the three of you. And Blake Lyons is here to uh, represent Layla. Yes. Pinellas County invested in new software to improve multiple departments, including building and development review services. Converting a complex department to new software can be a difficult task, but these three employees help make the transition a much better experience. Layla Carradine, Michael Hauser and Dane Morris tackled the multi-phase project with the end user in mind. We really saw three of our team members rise to that occasion, help us map out all of our business processes, help reach out into the department and get those frontline users, take their feedback, bring it back to the bigger group and, and really try to help streamline the overall implementation process. So that's where we got some real added benefit from the team. The team also helped develop and implement training for employees. They've done a tremendous job in helping to train our staff, make sure not only our staff got to the point where they were comfortable um, you know, implementing the, the use of the software, but also really helped uh, our customers as they came in and make sure they felt comfortable with the new system. The 24-month process really paid off for employees with improved work processes and for the public with convenient 24-7 access to the data and records they need. Congratulations, team, for a job well done. to say a few words, you're more than welcome. This is your, come on, just an opportunity. <laughs> We're all really nervous. Um, you know, this, this wasn't done just by us. Um, BTSOTI helped us out a lot and everybody else in our department. When we were sitting in configuration meetings for hours and hours, uh, other staff had to pick up the slack uh, and make sure that things were getting done because um, people need their permits. That's really what it's all about. Thank you.
kind of like reiterate the same thing that Dane said. Um, it, it's we, and it's like just like the lightning. It's a we. It's team. And that's what this is. It's not just about us two or three or OTI or it's, it's the whole BDRS um, team as a whole did this. We just kind of sat there and cheered them on and pushed for this at the end. So I just, this is really everybody in the whole department. And Layla sends her apologies for not being able to be here. She had a family wedding to attend. Um, but I also wanted to take a moment to recognize Bastina Creighton who's here in the audience with us today because she was the project manager from the OTI side that really took the opportunity to take on the technical piece of it. So while we did a lot to do uh, to address the business side, we really relied a lot on our technical partners to help us address that as well. So thank you very much. Great job, everybody. And we get the uh, wonderful opportunity to hear from uh, Vernon Bryant, who's our executive director of the Florida Botanical Gardens. He's, he sent us their strategic plan this week or this past week, and we had a chance to look at that. But welcome. Good to have you here right, right here at home um, yeah. <laughs> for you guys. But uh, uh, please, uh, the microphone is yours. Um, thank you. I have a little slide presentation with you. Um, as uh, I was just noted, I am Vernon Bryant. I'm the executive director of the Florida Botanical Foundation, Gardens Foundation, and it is an honor to stand before you again to talk about the Florida Botanical Gardens, the foundation, and our partnership with the county. Oh, oh I'm having technical difficulties. Ah, there you go. There we go. There we go. Um, so I want to thank Paul Kazi for extending this opportunity to us to speak as a testimonial to the work that we have been putting together to continually, re continually refine our partnership and our relationship with PCR. We are honored that he asked us to do this partner presentation. I want to acknowledge our extremely hardworking and dedicated board of directors, many of whom, several of whom are here and many are observing online. It is an irrefutable fact that our work would not be possible without this group of people. I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge our other great partners and collaborators, including Pinellas County Extension, Creative Pinellas, Pinellas Farm Bureau, uh, Florida West Coast Orchid Society, Sierra Club, the Florida Nursery Growers and Landscape Association, or FNGLA, and, and Tampa Bay uh, Times. As was just alluded, we just updated our strategic plan, and it reflects our work to clearly define our relationship and our work here at the Florida Botanical Gardens. And again, a copy was sent to you earlier, and we hope you had a chance to review it. To highlight a couple of things, our new mission statement is the Florida Botan Botanical Gardens Foundation is committed to creating an environment at the Florida Botanical Gardens for the community to come together for education, inspiration, and enjoyment. The plan, this one, okay. The plan sets forth uh, six governing values about our work and about our relationship, not only with PCR, but with our other partners and collaboratives and collaborators. They include advocacy, collaboration, diversity, equity, and inclusion, financial security, inspiration, and finally, stewardship. As we looked at our work and our plans for the future, we felt it all fell in five areas, five areas that truly define the foundation's work, especially as we partner with PCR. First and foremost, to enhance the garden, then to grow our organization in numerous ways, to educate the public, to engage a larger and a more diverse audience, and to be advocates for and the champions of the, the botanical gardens. The plan further defines a, a number of strategic initiatives, and again, we hope that you have looked at those, but we want to highlight two. First, creating uh, completing the creation of the Children's Discovery Garden, and then the other one is creating a welcome center by renovating the, an existing tropical pavilion and courtyard. We are working through permitting issues, and thanks everyone 
that is weighed in to help us get those resolved in regards to the Children's Discovery Garden. We have refined our timeline to complete the permitting by the end of summer and then to begin construction in uh, January 22 after the conclusion of our holiday lights in the garden. A little brief update. We have raised or had committed 1.3 million. We have committed another 500,000 from our reserves. We have been caught in the crazy COVID-19 world where prices have risen significantly. So now we have a, pro a price tag that's approaching 2.4 million. But we have been working to pare down and uh, come up with a um, phased approach to accommodate our available funds. We are continuing our capital campaign. Hopefully we can fulfill the gap and be able to build the entire CDG. And we have been, uh, again, we want to state that none of this would have been possible without the partnership of PCR that has been instrumental in every step of the work that we've gotten, had to take to get to where we are. Next, the tropical pavilion and courtyard are slated for renovation to allow the foundation to have a more consistent presence in the garden. This includes renovating and repurposing the existing tropical tropical pavilion as a new location for our botanical bounty gift shop and for a small office for the foundation. Again, thanks to PCR for partnering with us and providing a portion of the funding to help that renovation happen. The project also includes renovation of the adjacent courtyard uh, to allow this area to serve as a welcome center. We, are, uh, we'll be, we will be providing our guests with new seating, colorful shade structures, revamped plantings, uh, engaging information kiosks and improved traffic flow in and around that part of the garden. In addition to those two major projects, we are looking forward to resuming our events, enhancing many of them and adding new ones in collaboration and partnership with a myriad of organizations. Again, our partnership with Parks and Conservation Resources is critical to the success of every single event that we have. You are also provided with a list of our tentative uh, events, and we would love, love, love to see our commissioners at many of those events. We also hope to uh, encourage that, that you would encourage your constituents to come out and support our events and activities and to visit the garden. So in conclusion, I just want again want to thank you and also PCR again for this time and this for this opportunity and for your ongoing support. We I encourage you to please look at your strategic plan and where you as individuals or as a board can help us to meet our strategic initiatives. We hope that you won't hesitate to do so. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Vernon. That was uh, really good. Appreciated the, uh, the, uh, the plan in advance. So we can have, take a look at it. Um, any questions from any of the commissioners? Well, thank you again, and thank your board for all the work that they do. Will the do. Foundation. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Thanks. Okay. We have uh, one final presentation, and again, I'll, I'll come up there for that. And, um, and while, I, um, while I talk uh, about uh, the, the business today, we've, we've had a, it's just been fun to bring forward businesses that are doing work in Pinellas County. It's one of the things that I really wanted to focus on this year and working closely with economic development. We've, uh, we've really had a, a, a great fun identifying specific companies that have done great things during the pandemic, but just that normally do good work throughout the year. So while I speak a little bit about the organization, um, I'm going to ask Paul Pfeiffer, the owner of AFC Urgent Care, to come up and get as much time as we can give you in front of the camera. Welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit, take a picture, and then turn the microphone over to you for a few minutes. Um, AFC Urgent Care um, is a, a medical clinic treating any non-life-threatening injury and illness, and really no appointments are necessary to come to their, to their care facility. They also provide employer services to assist injured employees, 
provide pre-employment physicals and drug screens and COVID testing and vaccines. Paul opened his first urgent care clinic in Clearwater in 2012 and is continuing to grow his business in Pinellas County. The company now has three clinics, impressive, and in Pinellas County and the greater Tampa Bay area and employs uh, at, at the team 45 people. Please join me in welcoming Paul Pfeiffer for doing business in Pinellas County and welcome him here today to share with us his overview of his company. Again, Thank you. congratulations. Let's take a picture first. Well, thank you very much, uh, Commissioners, uh, for this recognition. Uh, we're really pleased. Um, I'd like to give a special uh, thank you for the SBP, SBDC uh, organization in Pinellas County for helping businesses, startup businesses particularly. We started our business, our first clinic in 2008, or 2012, and to get started, uh, they offered some free services, business services, to get uh, uh, business started. And so I really appreciate the, the work, uh, particularly Kurt Forrester from that organization to really provide uh, business guidance and, uh, and uh, support. We started, uh, like I said, our first clinic in 2012. Uh, we do a lot of things. Uh, we, we, we opened seven days a week. Our objective was to offer uh, a very affordable, convenient medical care for the community. Uh, and at this point, uh, when I add up all our three clinics, we served over 270,000 people in, in the community for medical care and, uh, and those types of things. So uh, it's, uh, it's been a real uh, pleasure being part of the community, Pinellas County, uh, and, uh, and the involvement we get in the community. We work with a uh, variety of different organizations. Uh, we do free medical services for the Special Olympics, and we try to do some other things for the community to provide uh, convenient and affordable medical care. So again, thank you very much for this recognition and I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, well, thank you uh, all of you for, for being here today and, and, and sharing a little bit about uh, what it means to either work here or play here or, um, you know, retire here in Pinellas County. It's just great to have all of you here this morning. Really appreciate our employees and the work that they've done. Uh, I really am excited to see the work going forward for our building department, development review services, and all of that as it relates to working with our business community. So again, thank you for the work that you all have done. All right, we're gonna move into uh, just uh, some citizens to be heard part of the meeting. Uh, we do have uh, several uh, here. And so we will start with um, David Ballard Geddes Jr., uh, followed by Kenneth Brandt, and then Nancy Obarski. Good afternoon, Commissioners. David Ballard Geddes Jr., I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Did Abraham Lincoln write the 14th Amendment? Based on, federal, based on the Federalist Papers, I feel that Hamilton wrote three constitutions, the former, the latter, and the last resort. Article six of this Constitution states, this Constitution, under this Constitution, as under the Confederation, the Confederacy not being described as North and South, but as a Confederacy of land and water in Federalist Paper 12. Prior to this Constitution, the Articles of Confederation recognizes a jurisdiction as having privileges and immunities both therein and thereof in Article 4. Article 9 in the Articles of Confederation gives rise to the capturing of water in claiming of such jurisdiction. And as requisite of this Constitution, uh, a vessel of war is revealed in Article 6 
of the Articles of Confederation in which this Constitution, the capturing of water, is recognized in Article 1, Section 8. The capture is revealed as a ship of war, again in Article 1, Section 10, and as qualification requisite to this Constitution as enumerated from Article 1, Section 2, the birthing of individual independent water jurisdictions is given rise to under the 14th Amendment before ratifying this Constitution, Federalist Paper 39 also recognizes an enumeration clause, again seen in Article 1, Section 2, and a jurisdiction of such. Thus, I feel Federalist Paper 39 was already cognizant of the 14th Amendment. George Washington, in his farewell address, also makes reference to a constitutional provision that gives rise within itself for its own birth, birthing an offspring of its own choice, mentioning a particular navigation by water. Abraham Lincoln did not write the 14th Amendment birthing of a water jurisdiction, but he did amend it to include a rebellion clause taking hold to and nullifying the Book of Common Rebellion written by Cramner in the year 1549. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kenneth Brandt and then Nancy Obarski and then uh, Don House. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kenneth Brandt. I'm here with, well, uh, as part of a capstone program with St. Petersburg College. Uh, and I am actually speaking, okay, let me just, it was not, all right. Uh, yeah, I've been doing a feasibility study on a tree giveaway for the unincorporated county. And honestly, I'm thinking it should, the, a pilot program should begin within the next, well, it, for the next Arbor Day where it's practical, it might, it's probably too late for 2022. Uh, but the county currently has a, a partnership with the Arbor Day Foundation that is actually uh, fairly recent. It started in 2020, as far as I can, well, yeah, it started in 2020 uh, with a $10,000 donation to the Arbor Day Foundation uh, to provide 230 trees to residents of the county. And it's a very good program. It just doesn't leverage all of the expertise that the county has in terms of uh, arborists and horticulture and everything else. Like we, I mean, you see, when you go in out here, it, there's a lovely garden uh, that was in large part created by urban forestry and IFS and everybody else. And it's a shame that we can't leverage that and have a mechanism to get them in contact with more of the county more easily. I, I've spoken to them uh, several times in the course of this. They're lovely people. They're very informative, very helpful. And for $10,000, we could run a pilot program with 800 trees covering somebody for 160 hours uh, of labor and with all the volunteers and everything. And we could just see where that goes. Uh, if it works out, uh, and everything else, and it would be, again, a significantly lower cost. It would be more like Clearwater's or Dunedin's programs, where instead of having the tree delivered to you, you show up, you speak, you have a, a chance to interact with a county and a extension personnel and the volunteers and everybody else to help you pick a tree that best suits your property and do everything else, uh, and do everything else that you need to do, how you need to plant it to get it to actually survive, how you need to do it so you're not planting it in a right of way, which is a thing that I've heard about happening a lot with some programs. And yeah, that's it. It's uh, just a quick little pilot program for next year or the year after. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well thought through. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, Nancy Orbarski, uh, followed by Don House. Uh, and then Pastor Mac. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Nancy Obarski, 708 Beach Trail in Indian Rocks Beach. If Pinellas County's goal uh, was to drive a 
bigger wedge between the beachfront property owners and our non-beachfront neighbors. You hit the mark last week. With the help of the post-ELSA news coverage that we all saw on Bay News 9 and on Channel 10. The Bay News 9 story once again put the onus back on the property owners and no doubt instigated this Facebook post that I woke up to at 5 a.m. this morning. And it's sad. It's by a resident from Indian Rocks Beach. We all care about our beach and beach renourishment. Approximately 10 homeowners who live on the beach are not willing to sign the paperwork so the equipment can go on their property. This means our beach will not be renourished for 10 years. There is a meeting at IRB Town Hall tomorrow evening, July 13th. All who care about the beach, please go and let the city know your thoughts. <clears throat> Another resident weighed in on that same post and said, how thoughtless of those few. This protects their homes and their properties. Well, first of all, some needed fact checking here. It's not just 10 holdouts. It's less than half of the 461 easements you've requested that have refused to sign to this point. And it's not just for beach renourishment. It's a perpetual easement that goes way beyond that scope. But I have to say the misinformation is not this resident's fault. As I stand here today, we have no earthly idea what the status of the renourishment is. The Bay News 9 piece said that the project was removed from the Army Corps budget. The Channel 10 story gave an entirely different impression so while you're busy asking me to give up important property rights, I'm being forced to do internet searches to determine what my fate is going to be. And probably what surprises me the most is that no one at the county or in any of the cities has ever expressed one scintilla of interest into the information compiled by two Indian Shores residents, one who is a retired attorney, one a practicing attorney, questioning the Army Corps' legal standing on whether they can even ask us for the easements in the first place. Maybe there's nothing to their information, I don't know, but I would feel much better if the county, instead of waiting for the Corps to hand us down their edict, would have at least gone down this road to see if their information holds any water, no pun intended. Instead, all I see is more divisiveness, which is, what can you say? That's just what we need, more divisiveness in this country. Going on TV and angering those of us who make up such a significant portion of your tax base accomplishes what besides making the hair on the back of my neck stand up and me be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Don House um, and then uh, Pastor Mac and then Greg Pound. Don House 21 on 4 Beach Trail, Any Rights Beach. Uh, I live on the beach also, and i uh, like to echo everything Nancy has said, but also in the um, attempt to get uh, answers, we uh, uh, attended a couple of meetings where we're lectured to about all the, the, uh, the good things about sand dunes and all that <laughs> other stuff. And it's like we're idiots and we don't understand anything. We have to be lectured to all the time. And no one listens to a thing that we say. You know, what are we concerned about? I saw uh, John Bishop on the other day saying, well, the, the, the beach renourishment, the beach is the first line of defense against uh, hurricanes. And it's not. It's my house in my neighbor's house. We're the first line of defense. The beach would have to be miles out there for it to be any defense against a hurricane coming up. And uh, I've got two very lousy neighbors that um, uh, the, 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 the first time the water gets any higher than the seawall, it's going to come rushing in because there's nothing there to stop it. And it's the city of Indian Rocks Beach. The walkovers are right there, and there's nothing there to protect the water over the seawall. So, you know, for us, to, for the chastising of uh, us that are informed or want to be informed but don't want to give up our rights, it's, it's a very um, perplexing, and I think uh, the, whole, uh, the whole process has been uh, not thought out and has been very unproductive. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Pastor Mac. Greg, uh, yeah, uh, hold on one minute, Pastor. Yes, go ahead. 
Excuse me, but before uh, Pastor comes up, Barry, could you please um, <clears throat> share a little bit with these constituents who've just spoken with us about what has been going on, how many meetings we have had about that issue, and how the fact that we do have experts within county government that are very knowledgeable, that have been doing everything they know how to do to communicate. But obviously, there's an information gap somewhere. I think it's important to share and just let them know. Well, without um, Kelly here, I can only speak in more global sense. Um, Jill, if you would like to come up, maybe you have a little bit more. I mean, we 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 actually did take the residents' concerns and the need for these easements, and have used our our federal consultant to assist in trying to change the Corps of Engineers' approach to this. Repeatedly, we have fought that, fought that, fought that, and we've been told, without a doubt, with all of our congressional help that without those, they will not go forward with beach nourishment. And so um, we've, we've been down this path, we've worked with the cities, um, and to, to date, we have not been successful in changing that. So that that is, I, I, I can't get into all the individual information, I don't know that. I know there's been a lot of meetings, um, and, I, and from our perspective, that information um, is has been misconstrued in terms of what would be allowable with those easements, but um, beyond that, I can't really speak to it. It's certainly not intended to debate or um, you know challenge the residents' knowledge of the issue. Um, we've actually been on their side. We don't think we should have to have that perpetual easement, but the Corps of Engineers has, has drawn a line in the sand on that, literally, and um, we've been unsuccessful in changing that. Jill. Good afternoon, Jill Silverboard. Yeah, um, the administrators got it spot on. The gap is, and the reason that we haven't conveyed what's happening is because we're waiting to hear from the core. We continue to work through our congressman's office to try and adjust the, the easement requirement. So that is the status. Um, and that's been true since March. So yes, several months have passed. Um, but and, and when it is true that there has been, you know, a gap in communications, but we've been hopeful that we would get something that we could at least definitively convey. Um, the Corps has only in the last week reached out to us uh, with any kind of uh, additional information. Um, doesn't look positive, nothing official, nothing in writing. So, you know, we're continuing to, to do what we can to try and um, resolve uh, this project. Um, so, yeah, the administrator well, got it right. And I know that, and I apologize, Mr. Chair, but I just wanted to make sure that people knew that we were not asleep at the switch. I personally have been out on Indian Rocks Beach with the mayor from out there, with Congressman Christ, and with the Army Corps and talked to them about the things that we can and cannot do. And so the fact that they're not hearing any new news is almost a good thing because nothing is really yeah. either moving forward or backward. It's just at a standstill until we get more information. But thank you. And as soon as we know something, we will definitely be, be sharing something officially. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Yeah. Thank you very much. I uh, was going to ask him to do that at the end, but then um, Nancy and uh, Don may have left by then, and that's, I just wanted to, that's good to bring them up at that time. So thank you, uh, Barry and um, Jill, for that, uh, for that update. Um, okay, Pastor Mack, try again. Come on up. And then Greg Pound, um, and then uh, Jacqueline uh, Pakel. I hope I said that right. Uh, good afternoon, and again, <laughs> thank you for this uh, Close. Uh, excellent opportunity to share a few things, uh, uh, primarily from God's Word to our hearts. Uh, I do say God's Word because, again, I know uh, before I became a Christian, I was kind of like an atheist kind of guy. And uh, I just knew the Bible could be proven wrong. And I went off to Bible college, and guess what? Uh, the Bible proved itself to be correct and right. So I wanted to share a verse with us uh, today from the Bible because really a real preacher is called a preach the Bible and not himself. And so that's what we do. We go, we study the Bible, we learn that, and we bring it to our families and our friends and even to our enemies. You know, when we have enemies, we shouldn't have any, but sometimes people uh, get upset with us. So we try to love everybody anyway. A real preacher, a real pastor. Uh, 
Here in Psalm 127, verse 1, it says, Except the Lord build a house, they that labor, labor in vain that build that house. Now, you know, when you think about building a house, you put everything that we put into uh, making this house come together, and then we go to work with what we've laid out. Uh, the Bible teaches it the same way for our lives individually. Now, we're going to have a, a, a county or a government, anything's going to really stay together and be counted, we have to make sure the Lord is in the house. And we need to, by faith, trust him to build our, our house, our family, our lives. God has to be the builder, guys. I mean, he put us here and really he made us in a way to where we try to do things and we leave him out. Uh, you're just laboring in vain. And so that's the message God wanted uh, us to hear today because, you know, whatever you're doing, if you're not learning to put him in place, uh, we're just doing some stuff. And the next thing you know, the whole thing comes tumbling down and you wonder why. You left God out. Thank you very much. God bless you. And uh, we keep praying for our community in our county. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Mack. Uh, Greg Pound and then Jacqueline. I'm not going to say the name again. I think I didn't say it right, Pacol. Pay, pay, pay you'll, you'll correct me when you come up, please. Um, Greg Pound, Largo, Florida. Um, I just want to bring the issue up of what's going on in Pinellas County and our families. You know, we see since our county government has kicked the creator, God, out of our school system, our court system, destroying our families. We've got a major problem now with reprobation, perversion. Our young people are being sodomized, out of control. We got massive corruption by our leaders. And it's amazing how it says their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their hearts could wish. They are corrupt. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lofty. They set their mouths against heaven. And this is what we've got now as a society, and that's why we're under judgment as a nation and as a people. And that's why China and all these other countries are just, we're being sold out. We're being oppressed, beat down our families. If we don't start teaching sex outside of marriage is destroying families, destroying relationships. It's, it's, it's called sex. Sex is outside of marriage. Relations is marriage only. That's one man, one woman, till death do you part. And that's not taught in our schools. It's not being taught to our children. Look at the filth on television. We have become a reprobate, evil culture in America. And our leaders are doing nothing about it. They're a part of it. They're not the solution to the problem. They're the problem. And this is what we've got. And so the only thing that we can do is, um, is pray for our country. I mean, I went to church Sunday. I've never seen so many fat people. And the first two temptations in the Bible were with food. First temptation for Adam and Eve was food. First temptation for Christ was with food. Now, if you want to talk about getting it out of control, that starts with the food issue. And so what happens is we have now a system that's out of control. And how are we going to get it back? It's going to take the men. The men are going to have to get themselves under control. They're going to have to stop having sex outside of marriage. They're going to have to be faithful to one woman. And they're going to have to get their love from Jesus Christ. The Bible says husbands are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church and die to themselves for their families. And that's what we're called to do. And so we just, um, you know, we, we, I mean, if you folks don't see it, we're in, we're in big trouble. We've got another planned, pandemic coming to America. They're going to keep pushing the vaccinations to wipe the people out. And the American people are so compliant to this corruption. It's, um, you know, I mean, look, look at our leadership we have in this county. We've got an illegal sheriff. We have illegal county commissioners. We've got people doing whatever they want. There's no accountability. It's like they're above the law. The rule of law has been trashed by our leadership. And so if we don't get back to the Constitution, we're in big, big trouble. And that Constitution is simply a contract to hold you people accountable for what you do. And once you break that contract, you're to be fired or thrown in jail for being traitors. So thank you very much. All right, uh, Jacqueline. And then we have one uh, com uh, coming in via Zoom. So. Welcome. Thank you. My name is uh, Dr. Jacqueline Paykel. I am from 3608 Shady Lane, Palm Harbor. 
Good afternoon, and thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. I am here, and unfortunately, I do not have my PowerPoint available because I'm here under very short notice. Um, I have, um, and the PowerPoint that I wanted to show was the destruction that is occurring at this moment in Wall Spring Park. There are a number of mature trees that have been cut down at the intersection of Shady Lane and Hillsborough Road. This is going on so that they can place dumpsters there. We have been in uh, communication with Ms. Wind, who is the project manager, and we have asked why this is occurring. And so we have a number of concerns about this. First of all, I would like to read for you exactly what was said in response to the question of why um, are the dumpsters being removed and relocated to Wall Spring Park from the current recycling plant. The Dunn facility received a lot of calls about after-hour solicit solicitors that are th uh, there after hours. People are accessing the current facility after hours. We've been experiencing people hanging around after hours. Residents who are dropping off stuff may not feel comfortable with people walking around. We've had complaints about individuals lingering around. They spook people out. The idea is to put it behind a gate in Wall Springs Park, which closes at 8 and uh, the gate is only used by park rangers thereafter. Whether people jump over a fence, I don't know. We want to put it behind a controlled gate or in a controlled environment. So there is a significant concern about this because it's in the middle of a neighborhood. We live on Shady Lane. This is happening at the intersection of Hillsborough and Shady Lane. We have a number of individuals that are very concerned about this, but, we, but the concerns are numerous. First of all, the destruction of beauty and wildlife. We moved to this area specifically because it was in the uh, middle of beauty. Secondly, the health of the citizens, the pets, the wildlife, and the water supply in the area. We are unfamiliar with any studies that have been done. Nobody in the neighborhood has been notified that this is going to occur. The property values of some of these homes currently sit uh, in excess of $3 million. And now we are going to be driving down the street past dumpsters? Totally inappropriate. So, and also of, con of significant concern is that there was no notice given to any of us. Perhaps there was notice that was uh, sent out after the trees started to be removed from the area. Is that my end? Yeah, are you almost finished? Dr. I am almost finished. Okay, go ahead. I do have Finish. to say that this is a collaboration between the county park system and the solid waste department. And they felt that it was not um, of significant concern or a large enough project to notify or to have a hearing about it. So nothing has been heard in the public about this project. And here they are destroying one of our most beautiful cherished uh, parks in Pinellas County. So I would say that there are 210 acres in this park and that there should be a reconsideration of where to locate uh, these dumpsters. Thank okay, you thank very you. much. Thank you. Um, Barry, did you have any update for us on this? Because I know we got these calls earlier this morning and called yeah. your office immediately. Um, so please give us a, an update. Well, I'll, I'll provide the information that I have. Um, this was a, a collaboration between parks, utilities, um, and um, solid waste in terms of where to place our recycling collection centers. This is These are not garbage sites. This is a, our recycling centers, which we're pr currently over at the uh, Dunn site. Solid Waste PCR partner to install recycling centers um, as they do in me many regional locations. Um, this will, uh, the Wall Springs Recycling Center will only be open when the park is open. That allows uh, PCR to uh, patrol the site and ensure its cleanliness and no illegal dumping. The location will see three to four containers that will be picked up weekly by solid waste contractors all during normal park hours. Um, some of the trees did have to be removed to provide for the concrete slab uh, area necessary to support the containers, but new trees will be planted to mitigate the loss of the existing. The site will be fenced to provide a visual buffer. Work is being completed. Um, and uh, so that's the information that I have at this point. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to make a statement and probably am immediately going to be wrong, but I've just been thinking about all of the parks that I'm somewhat familiar with um, and our recycling centers that, that I'm familiar with, and they don't seem to ever be at the, in, in a park. Now, um, at least in the parks that I you know, go to frequently and, and the recycling places that I go to frequently, they're not in the, in the parks. And I, I just, and again, without regard to necessarily this specific case, it just seems um, like there might be a better place for it. But anyway. Well, they, um, just so you know, I mean, it's part of an active construction site. It is ongoing as we speak. Now, to this, uh, again, I got this information five minutes before yeah. the meeting when I knew this was you know, going to be I brought understand. up. Um, in terms of the communication with the residents, I do apologize for that. Um, that I, I, we probably could have done a better job with that. Um, I, I'll have to collaborate with them on that, but it, I, I just don't want anybody to. You know, I'll follow up on this. Thank you. But it is—it's an active construction, you know, site. This was part of a planned project. So. Okay. Yes. How long? <coughs> excuse me. How long has this plan been being worked on? I have no, I, I don't know the answer to that. I have. I mean, obviously, for a long time, if it was—it's gone through a permitting process and things like that. I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to follow up. Thank you. I, I would appreciate it as well. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Appreciate your bringing that to us, and we'll look into it right away. Um, okay, uh, let me get my agenda back. All right. We now we have a, a number of items under the consent. Mr. Agenda. Chair, I do have one individual oh, online. Oh, thank you. I, um, thank so you for keeping me straight there. I did, and I did want to uh, just say once again that. Um, really proud the commission has made the decision to allow folks to uh, communicate with us during the during the meeting um, via zoom uh, as long as you register the day before by five o'clock I believe um, and if only the chair would remember that you're online like I almost forgot so thank you Kat for keeping me straight and go ahead all right, I have one individual who pre-registered to speak online uh, under Citizens to be Heard, uh, Rory King, who has already raised their hand. So once you're muted, if you could uh, spell and state your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for accommodating me today. Um, again, my name is Rory King. It's spelled R-O-R-Y, Rory King, K-I-N-G. Um, I reside at 175 First Street South in St. Petersburg. Uh, the topic that I uh, want to discuss today or bring to your attention is, pertains to the CPACE program, standing for the Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy Program. Uh, this energy program is a tool to finance energy efficiency and renewable energy products for commercial properties. I want to, talk, to set the context a little bit by talking about the program's success nationally. According to PACE Nation, through 2019, the CPACE program has added about 18,000 jobs and $1.9 billion has been invested in over 2,500 projects. There's a, a numerous studies have been done about the uh, program and its success. One is by the Schwarzenegger Institute, which is part of the University of California. Uh, the study is entitled Impact of PACE Funding for Solar Adoption. And it found that the availability of PACE roughly doubles the number of solar installations at the commercial level. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there have been a number of studies that have documented the success of this program. Uh, setting the context uh, brings me to the um, issue that I want to discuss as it pertains to the implementation of, of this um, uh, program in Pinellas County. Um, apparently, there is an ordinance that prohibits the disbursement of funds un until the end of the project, so after a certificate of occupancy has been issued. And it makes the program impractical to participate in, and thereby partaking in uh, the benefits, some of the benefits that I mentioned earlier. Uh, impracticality stems from the following two reasons. Uh, one is that in the beginning of your uh, project, you uh, put together a budget, and that budget is submitted uh, for evaluation for participation um, in the uh, PACE loan program. From the time that, that um, from the time approval is given, you start paying interest. 
but you don't have access to the funds. But you still have to uh, pay your vendors up front. So that requires that you get a bridge loan, a mezzanine loan, or some type of financing uh, to pay as a project proceeds. So now you're paying interest on two loans. I'm, my understanding is that the restriction on the disbursement of funds until after the uh, certificate of occupancy has been issued is um, stems from an interest in protecting uh, participants. And I would maintain that uh, for commercial projects, uh, there are a number of protections in place uh, that renders that unnecessary. One being construction contracts that are written so that payments are made on a progressive basis is and that, payment is withheld. Hey, Rory. Until, uh, yes? Rory, you've hit your three minutes. If you just got a, uh, you've just got just a few seconds, wrap it up, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there are a number of protections that are in place. Um, from the construction project to the number of lawyers and professionals that commercial borrowers have surrounding them that would make that protection unnecessary. So I have just three rhetorical questions um, at this point, but I will be in touch. Um, what, the, what are the objections to changing, if any, this restrictive ordinance? Uh, what's the process for changing it? And um, can exemptions be made? Thank you, Rory. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Gerard. I had a question, I'm not sure to who, but I'm wondering, since we passed the commercial PACE ordinance, how many projects have we actually had come through? I, this is unconfirmed, but to my knowledge, none. Well, I think she has a point. Hi, I'm Cindy Margiato, Economic Development, and that's correct. We haven't had a project yet. We're hoping for one soon. Have you had Have you had folks inquiring about the project? Um, we, you know, we're not the administrator of it, so I could not tell you that. We get reports um, every quarter, and we just haven't had a project. Well, it would be nice to know if we've had inquiries and what the issues might be. So we have heard from a few companies about the progress payments being an issue. Okay. And I think her point, I talked to her earlier, was that commercial project, it's different with a residential project, which we don't even have, but a commercial project costs a whole lot more and is a lot more complicated than a residential project. And we, we talked about putting that in the beginning, and for some reason, the attorney's office wasn't willing to do that. But I, I think that's wrong. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also spoke with the young lady that called in in depth, and thank you to staff also for answering my questions and doubling back with her, just trying to get some additional clarity on how she can um, stay in business, get business and stay in business. I do understand with larger um, developers, they may have that type of financial uh, setup where they can wait on delayed payments for that period of time. But if we are putting small businesses as a part of our focal point, but we're not making sure that our policies are conducive to support their needs, that's where this rub comes in. And that's what I took away from my conversations with her. Um, she did appear to be a person who just genuinely wants to make things work. It's just that she and other businesses have concerns when that reimbursement payment is so way late that, you know, they, they can't handle it. So I don't know if maybe at some point we can maybe have some future dialogue and discussion. Um, and if there's a willingness to look at within lawful realms, what can we do with our internal processes to make things a little easier and smoother because you know, we want small businesses to remain in business. This is just one of the barriers. Yeah, I mean, we, we clearly said that we wanted that part of the PACE program. And so if we want it to be viable and something that works, then we just need to make sure that we see what is normally done. I mean, and how others that have implemented these normally do them. I mean, it's not unusual for construction projects of any size to have a, a payment schedule. 
uh, including upfront money and then holding money at the end so till it's finished. Right, during during the project. Um, and again, I, I don't know that it's that we want to get in that business necessarily of tracking the projects, but I think that's what we're talking about. And if we do, I just think it's something we need to look at, Barry. See what we see what we have out there. I know you're excited about that. Um, okay, um, we're going to go on to the consent agenda, um, and. As I usually do, I just try to identify those areas where there are some costs uh, that are embedded in it. And so under item 18, uh, there's an award to bid, uh, the, a, a bid to four contractors, Astra Construction Caladesi, Archer Western, and TLC Diversified for job order contracting for an as-needed work on wastewater treatment and water facilities underground utility repair, maintenance, and minor construction. So some of our major utility work. Um, and the bid is in the amount of $5 million, up to $5 million for each vendor for a total of $20 million um, over, uh, Barry, is that a five-year? I'd have to look. What item are you on? Uh, this is item 18. Five-year contract. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's five-year five contract. Five-year contract. So that's, that was one of, of two. And then the second one, his award of bid to Polydyne Inc. for reclaimed methanol and Colonial Chemical Solutions for virginal methanol, um, a Tampa Bay purchasing cooperative contract with us in Oldsmar. Uh, the piece for um, for us, um, let me see, is in three three million three point one million dollars um, for the county and one hundred thirty eight thousand for the city of Oldsmar. Um, uh, for reclaimed methanol, and then uh, 422,000 for the county on virgin methanol. So the total county award is 3.547 million over five years. Um, and so those two items have monetary numbers when we do a, a um, consent agenda. And commissioners, approval. could yes. I ask that you defer item number 13 um, in, in your packet? Okay, so we'll be deferring item 13 as we uh, move forward with the consent. Is there anything that, want, that anybody wants to pull on the consent? Mr. Chair, yes. I want to pull uh, 17. 17, okay. Yes, now I'm looking for my notes. And That's fine, we'll pull that one. Um, do, do I have a motion for approval of the rest of the consent, including deferring item 13? So moved. Motion by Commissioner Justice, a second by Commissioner Flowers. All in favor say aye. Aye. All of, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, back to item 17 under management and budget. Commissioner Long, do you have your notes? Yeah. Okay. Well, I can't find my notes. I don't know what the heck I did with them. I had them a minute ago. Um, I wanted to know if we had readily available how much money we have in our reserve account. Bill, you want to come up? So what this item is, is that we've we spent more money because of CARES, I mean, because of the um, uh, um, COVID on uh, cost associated with some of the departments, specifically in facilities. And so we're um, appropriating some money out of reserves to cover that. We'll reimburse ourselves through COVID, either through COVID reimbursement funds, either through CARES or the American Rescue Plan, which obviously are still being finalized. And we're only asking for a portion of that back. Some of it will be done through vacancy savings. Um, so about $900,000 that of additional appropriation is what we're requesting. And that's for money spent um, that was unplanned expenditures within the facilities budget. Yeah, I understand that. My question is, how much do we have in the general fund, in, in reserve? In reserves? In the yeah. reserve fund. Yeah. Bill's looking uh, and Bill, Bill is looking that up. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I'm trying to call that up right now, and actually it's part of our budget presentation that's coming up uh, as part of the proposed budget. Oh, actually, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at your backup, you will see the amount that is in the contingency. Now it's opening five times, sorry. Uh, the amount that's in the contingency account uh, in general fund reserves is still going to be over $76 million. 
Um, our total reserve amount is still going to be over 20 percent within our FY21 budget. And most importantly, I think, uh, for you all in terms of the 22 budget, which we'll be presenting the proposed version of, is all the figures that you see in there are based on the assumption that this budget amendment would take place. So the reserve levels that you're going to see spoken about for the general fund, which is going to be a 21.7 percent reserve amount in total for FY22, are based on the assumption that this realignment takes place. So, this so is, is that helpful? No. My question is, I get it's a 21.7 percent reserve. What does that equate to in dollars? She said that 70, 70, yeah, 76 million. 76 million. Right. Is that okay. right, Bill? Uh, it's more than that. Hold on, because that's only the contingency reserve. There's that's another contingency portion reserves. of reserve. Okay. So if you bear with me for one second. So our general fund reserve would be 152 million. And that's our FY22 proposed budget general fund reserve level. 152 million. Correct. Got it. I wrote it down. Thank you. You're welcome. More to come on that. Yeah, yeah we'll have more discussion about that in just we, a little we while. Will. <laughs> just a little while. Uh, yes, Commissioner Flowers. While you're on that, just a question. Sure. The, the funds that we uh, took uh, in order for us to assist with the Gladys Douglas property, which I know that, you know, I read the beautiful article about our submission for the what? The Gladys Douglas oh, okay, property. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I read about, you know, of course, we said we were going to submit an application to be mm -hmm. able to recoup those funds. But it's going to be a little competitive. We hope we hope to get those funds. So, does that also take into account restoring that dollar amount? Um, yeah. So, the uh, on the Gladys Douglas property, we set aside money for part a land acquisition, and so that money's coming out that we used for the purchase of that property for our portion. Um, we did get an appropriation okay. um, back, so we know, we already got the appropriation. We may receive more okay. from the state forever funds. Those are competitive, and those decisions haven't been made. Okay. But I would want to add that uh, when I was giving the figure for the reserve level, that was for the general fund. The funding that was used for the Gladys Douglas property is the capital projects fund, Correct. which in effect is our penny for Pinellas. That's what I was trying to say. Yes. So, so it really, it, the two aren't, the, they're two separate. Two separate two funds. Two separate funds. Yes. Two completely separate funds. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll have more of this del delightful budget discussion coming up later. Um, and that's just a little precursor to get that's your computer deep. awake. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Bill. All right. Uh, any other questions on this item? Uh, and then I do I have a motion for approval of that item? Second. Commissioner Flowers on the motion. Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. We are moving on to regular agenda, and it's under our Convention and Visitors Bureau talking about our elite funding for the year. Mr. Burton. Item number 23 is so you're uh, asking for fiscal year 2022 elite event funding recommendation. This is a, a recommendation from your Tourist Development Council, but this also includes a waiver of the elite event funding program guidelines scoring or for one project that uh, scored below that. That's for the local pol local Tilapia, <laughs> Topia, local Topia um, event. And uh, so that didn't meet the minimum scoring guidelines. The TDC did recommend that for funding, however. Um, and so what this does is this will enable staff to negotiate the final um, uh, terms of the agreements uh, and bring back each event if approved. Okay. Is Steve here? He is. Okay. Maybe, Steve, you could come up and just give a, a sense of of the TDC meeting, um, ever brief or, or not, however you would like to let us know how that went in the discussions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Um, at the TDC meeting, the committee that uh, went through and graded the applications uh, for next year um, was in agreement on all but th uh, all but two. There was discussion around one event, whether it met 
um, whether it met the, the qualification of being a cultural event. And then the second one was related to uh, local topia. On that one, on the voting, it scored 670, which was 30 points shy of the 700 that was needed. Uh, everything else met the scoring um, uh, uh, requirements. Um, on the local topia event, then there was full discussion at the TDC, and in that they went through, and the recommendation was to waive the guideline for that event, which was also done this pat uh, for this year's event. Um, and I think this this last year was the second year in a row, or second year that we had funded uh, a local topia, and that's a unique event that supports uh, small business, whether it it be arts, culture, uh, food. Um, just general things that happens uh, in in uh, downtown uh, St. Pete. Okay, um, and just just uh, again briefly, maybe you could just again just say uh, what the elite funding is for, the kind of events that it's for, why we do this, that kind of thing. The, the, the um, elite program, for those that may not be aware, um, is a way for us to support events that are bringing people into our community uh, that not only from an attendance standpoint, but those that are going through and staying overnight. Um, we had over 20 applicants this year. Um, and again, we funded everything from uh, a max of up to 125,000 all the way down to a max of, of 25,000. And there's different criteria levels uh, that they meet. There's a full application they have to fill out and then is uh, graded by uh, uh, members of the TDC, a, a small committee from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you talk a little bit about the Pelican Tournament? That's a new, a new event, correct, for um, us? Uh, y yes, Commissioner Justice. That event is actually an LPGA event uh, that took place. Uh, the first event was this last year. Uh, it'll now go into, I think it has um, three more years. It may be longer than that. It's on national television, much like uh, Valspar. Had a great attendance uh, from players. This year they were not unable to have fans because of the pandemic. Uh, so they're really looking forward to get folks out, out to that um, and great exposure for this area in a again a new way reaching a, a different golf audience any other any other questions um, I, I just thought the, the process was really really smoothly handled and the, the areas where there was some discussion I thought went well um, maybe also just talk a little bit um, as we look to the fall and taking a look at the program again. Uh, just maybe speak to that, because I think that's important as we we may or may not pivot from where we're heading, but just that there might be some adjustments, so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so one of the things for this fall is we will be getting together members of the TDC for a workshop, and part of it is to look at the guidelines that we have um, and how can we enhance what we're doing uh, that, again, remains fair and equitable ag across all the various uh, different events. I believe in the past uh, these have been modified before. Previously, I think 2019 was the last time. So we'll take a look at that. Um, there's also some opportunities to you know, look at maybe is there uh, smaller grants that might be available for certain types of events, how we go through and grade it, the guidelines, all the various things uh, that we look at and help helping bring visitors to our communities, but also helping to support these things that really make us a great, great destination. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think there's, we've been kicking around some ideas. I look forward to that conversation. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Appreciate it. Second. Yeah. second. Uh, Commissioner Gerard on the motion, Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Under economic development, item 24. This is an application to Florida Job Growth Grant Fund in the amount of $4 million. This would assist us in building the Tampa Bay Innovation Center. Um, and so uh, we ask for your approval to submit the grant. So could you just give a, maybe a brief update where we are? I mean, I keep hearing the end of July and that's like right around the corner. Just maybe a brief update on it. So the total project cost is currently estimated at $15.6 million. This is, you know, with everything, um, this is higher than the, um, uh, the 
original budget um, by about $2 million because of construction cost. There was also an estimated $1.5 million for furniture and fixtures and things that were originally planned that they would have to raise. Um, we've asked them to also cover the cost of that increased construction. And so to fundraise for that, they're actively doing that. I've met with them, they're making progress. Um, but it's fundraising, so it's a work in progress. Um, again, applying for this grant it just would add and you know help them with covering all of the various aspects of the program. So that's the gap, originally estimated at 12 million. It was gonna be funded by Correct. the grant of seven million or so, Correct. seven and a half. It was and seven and a half million. Right, mm -hmm. along with the county's original four and a half million dollar match or well, commitment. And, and again, the, the county putting in the dollars, we were also hoping for these grants, okay? And so we, we still are trying to apply for grants to lower our cost associated with the program. Um, but Kevin, do you wanna to speak to that? He's been trying to help bring this in. Yeah, so Barry is exactly correct. I'm Kevin Knutson, Assistant County Administrator. He's exactly correct. We're trying to offset the county's portion of the, the cost through grants. Um, you did ask where we were at with the construction. Obviously, we had to get started by July 29th to meet the EDA grant deadline. And so we've already gone through the process of hiring a contractor to start clearing the land, moving trees, and preparing it for construction. And so that, that will start it, that, in the next week or so. That'll, that'll keep us okay with the uh, yes. original grant. With the original grant, yes. Mm -hmm. So that 12 million is now uh, estimated to be, I guess, uh, closer to 14 million in terms of construction and then an additional one and a half on uh, FF and E. That's our expectation and yeah. uh, the design team has, has helped revise that budget, but we still have to go out for bid and see what it's right. actually gonna be. But the, the, the real point here is that we're working to get grants to lower that four and a half million dollar exposure correct. that yes, we sir. have. That's correct. And they're still fundraising for the piece that's on their side. And at some point, we're going to resolve that. We're going to have the bids in. We're going to know what it exactly costs. We're going to know what they're able to raise. And then we have some decision points. Okay. Okay, so, yes, Commissioner Law. Who's the point person for raising the funds? So the TBIC um, director, Tanya Elmore, is the point person. But she's hiring a new staff member who's going to go out and work in the community to do that. She has not yet identified who that is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. I, I know Tanya that. for 20 years, probably. Yeah. Uh, still a lot of work, a it lot is. of work to do to, to bring this home. Okay, and this is just a grant application to try to- It is. Try to mm -hmm. narrow that gap. Okay, any, any other questions? And do I have a motion? Second. Commissioner Flowers on the motion. Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 25. Item number 12 is our first of three applications for funding under Penny for Pennells for the Employment Sites Program. And I would, I would ask Teresa um, Byron to come up and uh, provide you a brief overview. I think she has a little presentation since this is our first of our Employment Sites applications. Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Teresa Bryden, I'm the new Pinellas County Economic Development staff person, and uh, the uh, sites program is one of my big ones to help manage uh, along with your assistance. So I'm going to go quickly through this. Uh, the first thing is just to talk a little bit about this is a brand new program. We've never done anything like this before, and we are uh, working at educating everyone, including ourselves on many days, uh, we're like, uh, as we get questions asked of us. And I just wanted to show you kind of a quick timeline of where we've been and what, where we are today. So we've had 600 emails, we've had numerous conversations with uh, the local municipalities on trying to explain the program. And at the end, it's again, not a program that we've done before. And people ask us a lot of questions and they come back to try to figure out do they fit in this particular project? What we know, these are not um, topics or conversation bits that you have not seen before. These are uh, discussion points that have taken place over several years. Um, even in my past uh, appearances before, these are topics that we know exist in Pinellas County. And we have to, to work at what we're doing. The next two slides that I'd like to present really help us understand why we started the Employment Sites Program, and that is market statistics. I think this is key information. Over 80% of our industrial inventory is 40 years old or older. 
Um, there's over 33% of it was built during the 1980s. And if you look at the chart, I know it's really hard to read and I apologize, um, but we talk about industrial ceiling heights on these buildings. When we look at 2020 and, and now, any of the buildings that we're producing these days are at least 22 to 24 feet high. Back in the 80s, they were 16. So we are in a, uh, a negative when it comes to being competitive in the market for new um, opportunities to bring in businesses. So that's that particular one. I will tell you that right now, even with the stock that we currently have, our, our vacancy rates were basically 1.2% in the gateway market in mid-county. Mid in South um, Pinellas, it was 64 and, and then in Gateway, in the Gateway area, I'm sorry, it was 6.4, and in South Pinellas it was 13%. And the reason why it was 13% in South, um, South Pinellas is it's the oldest <laughs> industrial buildings that we do have in the county. And here's office. I think it's really critical for us to understand that we're extremely weak when we talk about Class A office space in our county. We have, you know, 351 total buildings, uh, a little over 13 million square feet of space, and our Class A uh, only makes up 10% of that. But the big kicker here on this particular slide that I'd like to point out is once again, we have um, most of the buildings were constructed in the 1980s, but the biggest piece of this is the majority of our office space is under medical uses. It's not other professional uses, which is more on target. We're looking for target industry clusters that's not what we're seeing in our office space these days. Outcomes. So the reason why I threw this slide in, because I thought it would be very um, helpful in understanding, it's not just about property taxes when we look at these businesses when they come to our markets. It's about the tangible taxes that they produce, and that's not even talking about what these employees generate when we look at that. You see their average wages, 99,000 and 88,000 and change respectively. When we talk about what is the median for Pinellas County, it's almost 52,000. So these are significant um, reasons why we look at what's going on and why we need to do what we're doing with the ESP program. Our first round of applications, we were very fortunate um, all three of the projects that I'm presenting to you today um, are ready to start construction. I think that's very important for you to understand that, you know, as we talk to the businesses and the, the developers, these are all projects that are shovel ready for the most part and ready to go. There are two developers uh, based projects and then one is constructing, constructing a special, a speculative, is a unique product that can enhance the DOD businesses. Our first application in front of you today is Booker Creek 5, and it is basically, um, they're asking for funds to cover the fill dirt required to build their project. It is a speculative building um, at the point when they did their application, and I think that what you'll find is that um, they're ready to start construction because I think probably there are people in the wings asking them about the development of the site and when they can start going. It's a 130,000 square foot industrial building and the funding request is a little over $900,000. So it's, it's exactly what we were anticipating to see from projects for um, ESP. Do you, any questions on Booker Creek or? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. What was the cost of that project? Oh, 15 million. I'm sorry, right at the top. Yeah, exactly. Okay. No problem. Um, and so they're asking for? 908. Eight, so five. about 1 15th, about 6% of the cost of the project and it's in the, it's in the foundation work. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I think that's important not to, because you can certainly speak to this, but that was, this is where, you know, you're trying to incentivize someone to make our site work versus going to a greenfield site somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're not subsidizing the cost of the building, we're just making it to where it's on a level playing field for a, um, a greenfield site, you know, by covering just the foundational to get it back to the same of what they would compete for. Yeah, and I think, and I think just again, for this is funded by our 
penny for Pinellas, mm -hmm. the economic development piece, there's 4.15 percent set aside mm -hmm. in this coming penny voted on by the taxpayers um, a few years ago. Um, okay. Um, so I just, I, it, it, for perspective, I think it's important um, where this is, where it's coming from. And I, maybe a couple other points in a minute, but go ahead, please. Oh, Commissioner Justice, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to wait to the end, but <laughs> <It's okay>. um, <laughs> no. since we're talking about this one a little bit more in depth, so we're, the idea is that we're going to invest 900000 into this site to make it more ready for mm -hmm. development of the, the private industry. I guess what's, is it, is it a, an investment in a hope, or what are our clawback, what are our guarantees, what are our, I mean, there's an anticipated 300 jobs, but what are our, our guarantees? And if there are none, then that's a decision point. But if, if we do have clawback or we have some security, I'd like to know what those are. Sure, I completely understand. That's later in my presentation, but I'll be glad to address that right now. Basically, we will, um, once you all have given conditional approval for us to move forward, we will sit down, we'll do extremely, we'll do much more due diligence on the projects themselves to make sure that the dollars actually match up through a third party consultant. But also during that time, it's when we will sit down with county attorneys and start to, to put together the, um, the agreements that each individual one's going to have to have a unique one because as you can see if, you know, from the package that we provided to you, every, every applicant is, is unique and different. And so I would say that um, I'm a true believer in clawback clauses um, from my previous life. And, um, and I do believe that, you know, that we have to be good stewards of how we dole out our, our funding courses. But at the same time, we need to balance that and make sure that we're getting these projects up out of the ground so that the rest of my team at Pinellas County Economic Development can backfill those spaces. And that's really where the critical issue is. So I know it's like, trust us, but I promise you that, you know, if, if, you, if we move forward, there will be checks and balances throughout the documents um, in, in order to be able to facilitate this. This and this is in a mar this is at, up in the Oldsmar market. You had mentioned that the vacancy in Gateway Air was 6.4, South Pinellas 13 percent. You had a 1.2 percent. Was that up in up in the Oldsmar area? Okay. Yes, sir. And I think that's relevant. Um, <laughs> they're just, they have no space. Yeah. Um, and and I, I I guess I probably hear more calls about space in that area because it, it accesses Pasco County, it accesses mm -hmm. Hillsborough County, mm -hmm. it's right there at the junction of mm -hmm. three, almost three counties, and exactly. uh, really an attractive location. I think it's mm -hmm. obviously very needed uh, for that market, for sure, so. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the next case is um, CMNY Transitions. Uh, this is based, this project is in Pinellas Park, um, so it helps a little bit. Uh, the, the reason uh, this project is in front of us is because uh, we're, help, we're being asked to help underwrite the reconstruction of their stormwater pond system. Uh, their original system was built back in the 1990s, and it was only for a portion. I think, um, I don't know if we can see it or not, but um, down here underneath the concept plan, there's actually an existing structure. And that was a facility that is, you know, housed by someone else and, and all. And the stormwater pond is basically where they want to build this new facility. And so they're trying to accommodate uh, that, all of that. So we're looking at a vault system where we literally, they'll be undergrounding some of uh, the stormwater that they're looking at um, to, to, to redo in order to meet the rules and regulations um, that are at Pinellas for Pinellas County stormwater systems. And in addition to that, they are looking for a little bit of assistance because we kind of said to them, well, we, we appreciate that you want to build a 44,000 square foot structure, but can you bump it up and make it even more square footage? Because really and truly, it's the bigger footprints that make, make what we're looking for important. And so they've agreed to build out um, another 42,000 square feet with a little assistance from us in some of the material costs. And that's why you're looking at the funding request of 1.7, so to speak, in this pro particular project. Again, we will negotiate these and make sure that after we do due diligence that these are accurate figures and numbers. We're not just going to go in and say, sure, <laughs> this is what we're doing. Um, we are going to be extremely cautious in how we set these up and make sure that the project goes through fruition. And this is another one where you've got um, a site that is literally constrained by roads. They, it, mm -hmm. it can't grow 
without some kind of an investment. So it's it's an it's an it puts us at a competitive disadvantage if they were to look into lower the cost of redevelopment and go into another spot. So by us helping invest in the infrastructure, it enables them to really get down in the central part of our county, another large industrial site. Um, on the first project, that was um, a spec building this from a developer, um, not from an owner of a business, right? Correct. Okay. Both of these are developer-led projects. Okay, so this one has no, it says, anticipates at least 190 jobs for the facility. That's, mm -hmm. where did that come from? So it's based on what their parking standards are and what the square footage of the uh, of the industrial footprint is. Okay. And that's how we, we kind of took a shot in the dark and said. Now, it could be even more than that if they go to second and third shifts. We just don't know because, once again, this is a speculative okay, building. Okay, so it's a spec building also. I just yes, want to sir. make that clear. From that statement, I thought it might have been an existing project. Um, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In this um, portion of Pinellas Park, they typically have some concerns with flooding. And I think I heard you say that they were going to build that vault system to have the water move underground, but with that 195 parking spaces, that's less aptitude for percolation for water to go down. So I'm just asking that through the whole process, please just look out for that piece, because in this okay. area, they certainly have a lot of flooding. And if you're going to have that vault system going down, it's also going to cause some additional uh, moisture in the ground that won't serve the residents well around in that area, especially totally during understand. Heavy, heavy storm season. No, Thank great you. insight. Thank you. So, um, and then the third one that is in front of you today is a multi-use SCIF, a sensitive compartment information facility. Um, this one is a little bit different um, in that it really doesn't fit 100% of what we've, you know, we've just got finished talking about with the other projects. They don't quite fit the mold of what we were doing for um, ESP for this first round. But nevertheless, what we see from a staff's perspective is this is something that benefits fits over 800 different businesses in Pinellas County that work with the Department of Defense at any given day. Um, over the course of COVID, it's been a huge impact because SOCOM is where they all used to go, across over to McDill. But because of COVID, they shut down McDill and made it extremely difficult for a lot of our smaller companies to be able to access this type of structure in order to be able to bid and or interact with the Department of Defense on their project. So on this particular one, what's happening is the university is requesting that um, this program underwrite the SCIF itself because it's a self-contained SCIF and then the installation of it and then the university will be responsible for, um, you know, doing all of the bookings, doing the security clearances, all of the various things to keep it up and running and available to all of our um, DOD clients throughout Pinellas County. Yeah, Commissioner Long. Oh. So, oh, you go first. <laughs> uh, so this is USF? Actually, no, this is, um, oh my gosh, I've gone blank. Um, this is the National Forensic Science Technology Center as part of International, Florida, Florida International. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing about this a couple of years ago when uh, mm -hmm. we had a, Correct. a forum with defense manufacturers mm -hmm. and this was something they really needed. And exactly. We didn't have at all. So that's great. Commissioner Law. So as a result of that forum and mm -hmm. uh, the fact that many years ago I used to serve on military and veterans affairs, I am very aware of a local group who is working very closely with SOCOM. And I would, on this kind of an issue relating to a SCIF specifically located in mid Pinellas County. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to request that we delay action on this item uh, for about three weeks to give uh, an, an opportunity for an alternative analysis so that you and Kevin and Barry and the rest of the staff can have an opportunity to understand the bigger picture that's going on that maybe everyone isn't aware of today. I think it could be a much better and bigger opportunity for the county um, if, if we could just delay it for about three weeks. Um, 
that's fine, but I would argue that, in all due respect, that we have over 800 um, small businesses. I know that. That would, you know, really like to have access. And if we have more than one, then I'm okay with that too. And I think a lot of us, because of the availability of it. Um, but I do hear what you're saying. A lot of times what happens is, is that, um, the Department of Defense, somebody has to underwrite or support the the skiffs that are going in. So you know, there's question as to whether or not you know who's underlying, you know, who's doing the under um, underpinning or the, the the request to say this is a good skiff to have. Um, so it's fine. Um, we could come back at a later date, or if you would trust us, we'll still do our due diligence, and if we find that it's something else, then we can we can cancel the agreement. Did you, did you have anything there? Well, Commissioner Long brought this up earlier. Um, again, I don't know anything about it or yeah. what this other proposal is, so th this is, we have this before us. Mm -hmm. so if we delay it, we can go back and follow up on that. It's kind of up to the Commission. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is, is delaying it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious what the benefit to the delay is, and I mean, I, we can only look. I mean, well, the benefit to the delay is there are, there is a lot more money on the table with folks that are already, uh, already have very high security clearances from the FBI that are working on this issue. Some of them all are part of the 800 small businesses that you spoke of that some of us were at that conference. This is before you came, Kevin. Sorry. <laughs> um, but it was mm -hmm. an extremely valuable informational opportunity with tons of those small businesses. In fact, I would venture to say the room was packed and sold out, so I think most of those folks were represented mm -hmm. there. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What we're doing today is conditional, it's not a final. Mm -hmm. So if we gave approval on this agenda item today, it wouldn't preclude you from bringing that information forward, correct? Mm -hmm. No, if we still, well. Correct. I mean, we wouldn't be entering into any agreements with anybody. Does the We'd final still, agreements come back to the commission? Or? They do not, they go directly to they, you, sir. They go directly mm -hmm. to me, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the time frame on that? Oh, we're, we're a ways away. <laughs> we are. So what's the difference? So, I'm sorry, if I could ask, so if we give conditional, this will be the last we see of it? Yes, sir. Unless you want us to bring it back. Well, that's a little different than how I, I thought it was written, but okay. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, Delaying this for three weeks, which means it still has to go through whatever process it needs to go through for you to do your due diligence and then get it over to Barry for his signature. What type of impact will that have, if any, that you may be aware of on the businesses that are requesting this for the potential to be approved for certain contracts sure. through this? I don't want to delay someone from having that financial opportunity because of something that may or may not happen based on other people coming together you know, I'm not sure uh, what the other information is, but um, I'm not I'm not understanding why we would need to delay someone from having this opportunity, even if there is a bigger picture. There, there's a lot that can happen elsewhere. So, well, may I speak to that, Mr. Look, Chair? Commissioner George, go ahead. Did you have a question? I just wanted to I, ask she that. Didn't an, she didn't answer my question. Though. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I was asking well, is, are there financial opportunities that this organization would miss out on because we would be delaying it for three weeks? Um, Let me answer that. It's, it's, it's a new opportunity to, to, to bring a skiff to where companies can access outside of the fence, mm -hmm. okay, outside mm -hmm. of McDill. Um, so obviously the sooner you have that, then it's easier for companies, but it's hard to say that there's a corresponding with the missed opportunity because we don't know if they have access to McDill or not. So I, I understand your question. I'm, I'm not sure we can answer that directly. Well, they, she was saying that they shut down McDill's, and the access to, to the skiff at McDill. So if that's the case, 
they don't have access right now. And if you go on the government's website, I do this for my other life, <laughs> you'll see a number of potential grants and opportunities that are out there yep. related to the Department of Defense. So I'm sure that if this were in place, they would then venture to apply for those things, especially with us having so many organizations within some of our commercial hubs that deal specifically with items that the Department of Defense utilizes. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm asking that question. My, I'm so, I, I didn't mean yeah. to be like poppy. No. No. My understanding oh, is McDill is still closed. Um, that's what to I thought. Yeah. The outside. That's my. That's the only thing I can. And that was going to be my only response back to you. Is, is I have I, family in the military, and that's why I know that yeah. they're still closed. So, <laughs> so I, that's, that's my I'm only asking. response I can give you is I don't know anything more than McDill is still closed. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 Janet, I appreciate what you're bringing to us. I wish you were able to give us maybe a little bit more well, information. To I, I, I have the answer to your question about why I am requesting the delay. The National Forensic Science Technology Center and the company behind this uh, SCIF is owned by a, a veteran small business owner in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. The folks that I have been, that have been, I am aware of, are located here in Pinellas County with manufacturing companies here in Pinellas County. And I'm more interested in working with our local folks, if it's possible, than I am with a company that's based out of Jacksonville. So would supporting this particular entity mean that we could not support the other individuals who are located here oh, if they were to present an application? I'm asking the question. We have, we have businesses that have their home offices or home bases all over, and then they have other pieces of their operation here. So I'm just not, I mean, I, I agree with supporting home first, but this isn't the only company that has a location in another city in the state of Florida or even in another state that also has interests here in our county. Thank you. I'm just wondering if you could give her the information about these people that you know of from Pinellas County so that she could contact them. I talked to, Bar I talked to Barry and I talked to Kevin. I did not know what your role was going to be here today, so I apologize. I'm happy. I've already reached out based on the conversation I had before. I think it would be important for them to reach out to these people. I, but I, also, um, I would want to make sure that that was going to be a completely open process. I feel good about doing business with the university, that it's going to be open, it's going to be available for whoever that needs it. If you're talking about private entities and private companies, I would want to make sure that everybody had that access and not just those that were partners. So I, that's the only, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do, because but we do I can't have talk to you personally, so I'm trying to say if you will just give those folks an opportunity, and by the way, they are working hand in glove with SOCOM at McDill, so why they, while they may be closed, there's a lot of work going on there right now. Okay, but also, can we not support both of those efforts? I made the request. It's all up to you. I just wanted to say those people had the same opportunity to come to economic development and ask for support or to say, hey, we're already doing this. You might, you know, this is something you should know about. And hopefully they will do that. So, and this isn't the last time we're going to be funding such projects anyway, right? I hope so. Well, <laughs> I hope so too, since we have many millions of dollars waiting. So my last couple, two, I have two more slides, and that's Go it. Ahead. And um, so it's recommended actions. It's just um, one that the, these three applications, if you, you know, the recommend the board action, conditional approval, 
uh, allow us to do significant due diligence on the three applications that are in front of you to make sure that the numbers work and that uh, what we're asking makes sense uh, for the community. And then following that, uh, that you would delegate to the county administrator uh, to be able to negotiate and execute these agreements. All of these agreements will be negotiated based on their project requests, all of them. You know, There's a good chance that when you see them, there'll be a lot less money that they're getting from us. At what point, just because of how things are coming through. Um, there will be language, and I think it's very important for me to stipulate this. There will be language in these agreements that identify call black club claw back clauses absolutely will be part of that. And the disbursements will be made um, within these agreements to be able to say at certain benchmarks, these dollars would be allocated based on what they've accomplished so far in their project. And we would go from there. All in all, it's two point, a little, it's around 2.8 million that we're requesting. And uh, we'll be glad to keep you updated on everything. I have no problem making sure that uh, that Barry has this information and shares it with you as soon as we, you know, complete tasks with these things. Um, just as a quick reference, we did do round two um, of our uh, of our applications. Uh, we received four, and the unique thing, and I think this was critical, is, is there was only one developer in this round, and there were three businesses that came through requesting dollars through the ESP program. And I'll be very excited to be able to bring those back to you, um, hopefully before the end of the year, to be able to share that with you. And with that, I am finished and be glad to take any other questions you may have. I, I'm, I'm just not comfortable with making any changes at this time. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand this third option. If you could maybe explain a little bit more what this third project. Oh, the third project? Yeah, this what year. it is, mm -hmm. uh, the unique so. nature of it, and, you know, so that we, I mean, so that I understand it. Sure. I mean, I, and I like to help me understand the industry that we're talking about that so, supports this. So, do you want Go right ahead. Okay. I, 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 per, I heard about it two years ago when I got here. I did a tour. I'm sure you guys, many of you have been on that I same tour, um, but go ahead. So, um, so what's being proposed is a, um, a self-contained uh, unit that is manufactured in Jacksonville by a veteran-owned company. And they've manufactured numerous uh, through and have shipped them throughout the United States. So this isn't you know, the first time that they've been making it. They've been around for a long time. Um, so what happened is, is that the university actually had had conversations with them and engaging them to talk about putting this particular one inside their existing structure off of Bryan Dairy Road. That's exactly where it's going to be housed, is it will be inside. Um, the, uh, the forensic group used to have a skiff when they were at their previous location and um, had access to it and did a lot of different things. And what it hold, is... Hold on. I'm, you're, you're, you're way ahead of me now. Okay. A so, skiff is a way of, con of communicating and corresponding with the Department of Defense on sensitive items. Okay. So you have to have security clearance to be in there. It's on bid documents that's not open to the general public. It doesn't go out on common email. It's in a controlled environment, and that communication is in a, um, in, in a format that is secure. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, that's where I was going next, but I apologize. Um, so yes, that's exactly what it is. And you can't transact businesses if you're working on a DOD project, you have to do it within one of those facilities. Okay. All right. So now we have another company that wants to produce these things. Not produce it. Because though this, this whole a, a skiff is an incredibly um, secure facility that, and you can, uh, when you're working on highly sensitive intelligence work, you can only do it in a skiff. Right. And only certain people can work in them. Right. You have to have the highest level of security. I'm, and I'm telling you that many of those manufacturing companies that were at that meeting, uh, the Congress, the congressional folks were there, and the appropriation chair were there. 
and they talked about it then in, the, in that uh, forum that we had. And all I'm suggesting is it came to my attention very recently that I didn't have an opportunity to sit down and talk to Barry or Kevin or anybody else to alert them that this group is here in Pinellas County. They've been working on it for a long, long time. It, what they are they working on? But, pardon? When you say it. What SOCOM are they? is working on bringing this skiff to Pinellas County, a large one. So I'm just asking. So they're for bringing, the, they're, they're, they're not talk, they're not producing it. This other company that we're talking about doing, they're actually making the products, yes? Well, that's what I think. There's a lot of information. We're paying for a unit to be manufactured out of the city of Jacksonville. No, that's, that's not the question. The, I, we don't know what, what the other companies produce. We, I, I don't know what it that's is. That's right. We, we don't have an, and that's all I'm asking for is to do an alternative analysis. Should take about two weeks to get on everybody's calendar and bring it back. I mean, it's, I just think it's a mis I think it's a mistake, and I think you're not giving enough opportunity for, and I don't know, I can't answer your question, Commissioner Rod, about why they didn't know about it, why they didn't come forward before, probably because it's such a big secretive deal with the military. I don't know. I'm not speaking for them. I just said I would ask for consideration to rethink it for a couple of weeks to give them an alternative to get on the calendar, which I already asked them to so, do. So the idea would be waiting a couple weeks, they come with a bigger project that we are more interested in and then not do that project? Or do you do or both do them of both. them? Or do both. I don't know. I'm just saying, can we have all the facts before we move forward? Uh, Commissioner Justice. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if, if we approve this tonight, though, we don't have another meeting for quite a while. Um, the information that you, you're contact has could be shared with you and then with administration and if it was a knock your socks off this is a much better path then the administrator and the economic development team could certainly hit the pause button and say right am i is that correct i could if the direction is to to pursue this i could evaluate it before i sign the final deal that that being said i i do worry about any time that we've got a grant out there an rfp out there and we're at a final decision point, and then someone comes in and says, wait a minute, I've got a better one. I, I do worry about that part of the process, because um, we do that every, every week. We approve budget items, yeah. and someone could come in and say, wait a minute, before you do that one, I, I didn't apply for it, but I've got a better deal. And so I, I do, that one makes me a little nervous. Commissioner Gerard, did you have a comment? Well, and again, I don't think there's any drawback to, to moving this one step forward and finding out more about it. That if SOCOM is behind this other one, they're probably paying for it too. They have a whole lot more money than Pinellas County does, <laughs> particularly in this fund. Um, so I don't know what the conflict would be in having two. So. Uh, Jewel, any issues from your perspective that you see? Uh, none that I see. I mean, the only thing I would offer up is that if you wanted to have an opportunity to look at these again, you could eliminate the delegation to the county administrator. But frankly, the project that you all are spending the time talking on is within his normal delegated monetary authority anyway. Um, but you could certainly choose to direct that, the, that all three of them, or even this one in particular, be brought back to the board for the final execution of the agreement. That might be one way to to move this forward yeah. while at the same time assuring that it comes back to you. Yeah. So we could take the first two separately? Yes, you could. Okay. And then the, the other one, um, I'm, I'm still want to make sure I'm clear now. You, you, you're you're going to evaluate the other op opportunity? If, if the direction is to look at yes. the other opportunity, to Joel's point, you could approve the first two, which would be then delegated. You would see those up on my delegated log of things that I approve at a future point. Um, and then you could take this one up and say that you'll do conditional approval subject to final approval by this board. Okay. 
Yes. When you say bring forward, that means that whoever this entity is, they're going to make an application like everybody else. They're going to go through a review process like everybody else, and there would be a presentation. Well, I think at this point, I just find out what we're talking about because I don't know anything of what we're talking about and um, whether or not there is any kind of project out there. If they're looking for funding, I, I don't know anything. So yeah. okay. I, I don't know whether it would be something that they when they would have to apply for future funding in one of our future rounds which is what I would suggest if, in fact, they're looking for funding. Um, so it's competitive in nature. Um, but I, <laughs> yeah. I can't answer that question. I, I don't point. have a problem with taking them separately. I just, you know, I, I can't see the vision of why this project needs to be delayed in order to make room for the conversation about something that may be larger. We have a growing county. When you look at the number of businesses that are coming here that are technologically driven, that are working in the Department of Defense, I think that there is room for both. Um, but I, 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 I have no problem with voting so, on them separately because I know for sure this one is coming from a manufacturer who's going to manufacture, they, they have their offices in Jacksonville, and they're bringing the item here to be utilized. So we know what that is. We know how big it is. We know where it's going to be housed. Mm -hmm. um, the other potential project, it, we know it would be a skiv, but some of the other details we don't know yet, but would know at some point. And I don't see why we could not so we can go get back and take a look at funding that as well if it's so so again to, to what jewel was saying we're going to give conditional approval on the third one but it's going to come back here can it come back here at the next meeting will we have enough information on the other one i don't want to hold this one up well no i mean i think the even just through a negotiation process it's going to take longer than two weeks yeah. to okay. to to finalize that i mean it may be quicker but um that it on this one it's small it, yeah. this one's pretty straightforward you're going to buy a box you know and somebody else is going to operate so probably a little easier than the other ones but yeah. um but we we would bring it up whenever it's ready to be brought back as a as a contract approval um so we could do that and then whether that's two weeks or the following yeah, meeting after that or whatever okay Okay, so are we just crystal clear? <laughs> Mr. Chair, may yes. I just ask, uh, can we take the, I don't want to vote no on all three of them. So if we- no, we're gonna take the first two. Thank you. Yeah, so I need a motion for the first Mo two. Move approval for the first two. Second. Okay, any other comments? It's just a question. Are we approving it as written so that we're delegating the authority to the administrator to just move ahead? On the first That's, two. On yes. the first two, yeah. And I have a problem with treating them differently, so. Okay. Well, we then we'll we'll deal with that one real soon here. Okay, okay all in favor of that of the approval of the first two say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. So four to one in favor of the first two, okay? Now, the motion on the, the, the last project is to conditionally approve it. Oh, uh, you're conditionally approving it But bring it back. But the, the difference being that the, you want that, this one to be brought back to the commission. For, for final, final approval. approval. Okay. So, do I have a motion for that? I have a motion for that. Do I have a second? Okay, so is there any other motion that we want to entertain? I'd like to make a motion that we go ahead and approve item number three um, with the same uh, formatting conditions as um, stated or listed for the recommended action from staff. Okay, there's a motion and a second, okay. To, to actually do the third one is just like we're doing the first two um, without, without delay, although we know that there is gonna be plenty of time to see the other project as well. 
Everybody uh, in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Four to one, the motion passes. All right. Well, uh, in, in predicting the, converse, uh, the flow of the meeting, that one was not in my, you know, I didn't predict that long of a discussion over at the 183,000. Um, okay, okay, yes. The first one passed by what vote? Four to one. Oh, four to one, okay. I was thinking three, two, never mind. Four to one, okay. Um, all right, we are now on to housing and community development item 26. This is a resolution adopting forward Pinellas' safe streets, um, Pinellas action plan and vision zero approach to county decision-making policy development. Um, and so it is here for your approval. Okay. Move approval. I saw Witt here. He is here. Yep, Witt, did you wanna come up and make any comments or? We also have Carolyn Lamper from Community Development. The team. We are a team. We are. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Whit Lanton. Um, I'm Joan Rice, Pinellas County Public Works. And I'm Caroline Lanford, Planning Division. Just okay. briefly, uh, Ford Pinellas initiated the Safe Streets Pinellas Vision Zero effort a little over a year ago. Uh, we went through a planning and analysis phase, and then we developed this resolution um, for all the local governments in Pinellas County to adopt uh, to support safe streets in our community. Uh, we do have a serious uh, injury and fatality uh, problem in Pinellas County on our roadways. The city of St. Pete has been, uh, St. Pete Beach has been the first to adopt the resolution, so we are encouraged by that. As you know, the Ford Pinellas Board adopted this a few months ago. Pinellas County staff have been working to modify the resolution a little bit, I believe to acknowledge some of the good work that Pinellas County is doing on safety uh, and we encourage all the local governments to adapt the resolution as need be. And I don't know if you want to speak to any of that, but we're happy to see the uh, partnership and the support in making our roads safer for all users of the transportation network. Anything else, you guys? I'd just like to say that we wanted to tie it back to our health and all policies uh, initiative because, um, you know, obviously they're, they're related, so. And, and with this includes the the realistic approach towards Vision Zero. I mean, I know we had this conversation, like we have no deaths as our goal, which is clearly our goal, but it's going to take time. So that's right. The the goal is a 2045 goal. Um, in the meantime, every two years we adopt a safety target that is based on the track record of safety data over the last five years. And that is achievable because we look at the lowest number of fatalities and serious injuries on our roadway over the last five years, and we're above that. So we want to get back to where we were, say, in 2014 or 2015. So what do you think the two or three things that we're working on that, that gives us hope um, to actually have, you know, to address this, this problem that we have in Pinellas County? I think the first thing is awareness. Uh, the second thing is looking at roads where design modifications can um, help reinforce people going the speed limit because speeding and reckless driving are two of our biggest factors. Uh, law enforcement certainly is a big part of that. Um, and really it's just uh, working with local governments around the, the, the county and the state of Florida to ensure that our roads are designed properly and that they are lighted properly and that people who are vulnerable road users are protected, um, either through a shared use path or separated bicycle lanes or mid-block crossings that are highly visible, things like that. And it's the appropriate treatment in the appropriate location. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And how are we doing on, on our trails? And, and do we have a way of measuring those injuries and or deaths on our trails and you know where we're intersecting roads and the, we sure and do the like we have a crash data management system that keeps track of all serious injuries all minor injuries all crashes uh, all fatalities on not only our roadway network but our trail network so we keep that data and honestly the last time i looked at it we don't have that many serious injuries and fatalities on the trail network it's a pretty pretty sparse number compared to our roadways, but they, we do occasionally have those. And you know, any crash is a serious crash for the person who's a victim. 
Any, uh, any questions for Wit? Um, the only other thing I'd ask you is maybe just comment briefly again for awareness sake uh, uh, to our residents. Uh, what type of vehicles are now allowed on our trail? Um, it, it once was very simple and pretty straightforward. Sure. Um, so the trail, uh, the Pinellas Trail in particular, uh, my understanding is is that um, based on state state law that allows bicycles to operate or electric bicycles bicycles to operate everywhere there's a bicycle, is that as long as they're not ex exceeding the speed limit of 20 miles per hour, they can safely operate on the trail as a pedal assist class one or class two. Uh, bicycle, and that's what electric bicycles are codified in state law. Yeah. M my understanding is that the Parks and Recre Parks and Conservation Services Department are, is changing some of the signage to be more clear. Uh, right now, they say no motorized vehicles, right. and that certainly sends a mixed message based on state statute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction. Yeah. Right. Anything? That is correct. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions? Um, Thank you all. I really appreciate the effort on all of your parts. So hopefully we'll hit that 2045 number. But in the meantime, I do think the awareness piece is so important. Um, you just got to just keep working at it, you know. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, do I have a motion for approval? Second. Commissioner Flowers on the motion. Commissioner Justice on the second. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carries uh, four to zero. Okay, Barry, on to item, item number 27 two. is a Brownfield Site re Rehabilitation Agreement with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, this is for funding uh, for the Bay Point uh, Golf Court Brownfield Site. Any questions for Barry on this one? This is under Public Works. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Gerard on the motion, Commissioner Justice on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Under safety and emergency services, item 28. Mr. This is approval and, to, and issue of a certificate of public convenience and necessity to MedTrans Corporation for helicopter ambulance service. Move approval. Second. Okay, I have a motion. Did you get that? Or by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Justice. Uh, any questions on item 28? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Under county attorney, item 29. Under item number 29, I'm asking the board to authorize uh, the county attorney's office to file litigation in the referenced case. This is a code enforcement matter located in unincorporated St. Petersburg. I have a motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Justice. Any questions? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 30. Under item number 30, I'm asking the board to approve staff's recommendation on the confidential uh, settlement proposal in this case as uh, set forth in the confidential memorandum, which I have briefed each of you on. Commissioner Gerard on the motion. Commissioner Justice on the second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 31. So items 31, 32, and 33 are all related. These items each relate to the opioid litigation uh, that was filed on behalf of Pinellas County by your outside counsel in this matter. Uh, I'll take item number 31 first. This is uh, a matter that was again brought to you under a confidential memorandum because this relates to an active matter in litigation. Uh, this, these were items that, as you will recall, were discussed at the SHADE meeting that we hosted uh, back, I believe, last month, uh, where you did get an opportunity to hear from your outside counsel and ask questions. Uh, I will note that each of these three items are being brought forward to you under the recommendation of your outside counsel in this matter. So under item number 31, I am recommending that you approve staff and your outside counsel's recommendation uh, on this matter. Um, and this is the bankruptcy proceeding, to be clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Motion by Commissioner Long and second by Commissioner Gerard. Any, any, um, I know this is, I guess, 
confidential. And, and this, just to be clear, this is the bankruptcy item that is referenced there in Purdue Pharma. Uh, this is the ca one of the cases that we spoke about in the shade matter. Uh, I know that some of you all, we did speak to individually about these cases and we did address this. Um, I will say it's active litigation, but much of this uh, information is in the public domain. Uh, this case, we have a deadline of tomorrow um, to report back to the, the bankruptcy court. I will, um, this is basically your um, input on what you feel about the plan. Um, that is not going to necessarily sway the court. The court is going to do what they deem appropriate in this matter, but the, the recommendation um, and your approval of that recommendation would put your thoughts on the matter um, before right. the court. And this is a bankruptcy case. The new company, so to speak, is really dispersing any of the assets that that we're talking that, about. That here. would be Across true. Across the country. It, correct. Yeah. In all of these matters, when they come to you, we're, we're one among thousands and thousands of litigants, many local right. governments, states, et cetera, um, throughout the country. So as these matters come forward to you, many of the dollar amounts that you'll hear us are very large dollar amounts. Keep in mind, we're just a very small part um, of the, the more broader litigation that's occurring across the country. And voting for it would be keeping our oar in the water. Correct. Okay. Um, any questions? We had a motion already in a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 33 or 32. So under item number 32, and I will mention we, you know, this is one that we don't mind talking about in public a little bit more, and I did invite Christy Pemberton from my office in the event that you all have any additional questions. I know that there has been much talk about uh, the Attorney General's role in this case and settling this case essentially by means of an agreement with the Attorney General. Uh, this is this uh, agenda item is recommending to you all, not necessarily that you approve the agreement because I don't know that we have absolutely final language on it. What we're asking is that you um, approve a resolution that delegates to the county administrator the ultimate authority to enter into that agreement, of course, in conjunction um, with my office and outside counsel working out some of the final language. Keep in mind, we're one of 67 counties that the AG is trying to reach concurrence on, so there, there are uh, some discussions going on with some other counties that are looking to have some language um, modified to a certain extent. However, what this agreement would do is, again, set the, um, kind of establish the framework for what a settlement in the state of Florida would look like. I can have Christy come up and talk to you all a little bit more if you want to hear some of the details. Pinellas is largely positioned, I'll say, to be considered a qualified county. We certainly meet the population threshold. There are a couple of other actions that we will likely need to take to just, just to solidify our place as a qualifying county, which does position us much better to receive a greater, sh or, or to be able to direct um, the usage of a greater proportion of funds. Keep in mind, all of the funds are going to be restricted insofar as they may only be spent on opioid abatement um, and treatment. So um, no matter what you all decide, any funds that we generate will be going back into the cause of why we're in this litigation to begin with. But 32, again, would be approving a resolution delegating to the county administrator the authority to enter into the final agreement with the attorney general uh, once that language is finalized. And, and to the extent that we have this agreement, and whatever funds do come to us, we would then, working with our partners locally, be able to direct those funds to the use that you mentioned as opposed to the state or some other group directing the funds that may or may not come to the area. That's correct. What this is largely going to do, there's three different pots. There's a state pot, there's a regional pot, and then really more the local pot. So the local, the local pot, the city and county, you know, we're, we're good there. It's really more those regional funds that we're trying to ensure are directed back into Pinellas County as opposed to some other county in our region. Uh, this will, um, this together with the next agenda item will get us into a better position to make sure that those funds are spent within Pinellas County on Pinellas County citizens um, that are suffering from this epidemic. Okay, any other questions on item 32? 
Okay. Do I have a motion for that? Motion by Commissioner Flowers. Second by Commissioner Justice, I guess. Is that okay? Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 33. Now, 33 is the agreement. Again, what we're asking is, is that you delegate the authority to the county administrator. We're still trying to work on some moving pieces on getting these agreements finalized. I believe the city of St. Petersburg will be taking action on this um, on Thursday. So um, this is the piece that does get us into the better position in regard to those regional funds. Uh, we are entering into an agreement with the litigating municipalities within Pinellas County. So in other words, the, the cities that have filed suits similar to us, that is the cities of St. Petersburg, Pinellas Park, and Clearwater, by negotiating with those three cities, uh, thanks in large part to Barry and his staff working with, uh, with Christy, um, by entering into the agreement with the three litigating cities, that gets us over the threshold that we need as far as population and some other caveats that are present in the Attorney General's agreement that gets us into position to have more control over the regional funds. Now, there are a couple of other things that we will be doing as far as setting up and or informalizing an opioid abatement task force and some other measures, again, to be implemented to make sure that we're satisfying the Attorney General's agreement, but also establishing a framework so that these funds can be spent throughout the county where there is a need. Okay. Any questions on this one? Okay, do I have a motion, please, for approval? Okay. Commissioner Long on the motion, Commissioner Flowers on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 34. Um, under item number 34, again, this is the redistricting placeholder that we have. I don't know that we have anything uh, really new to update. I, know, I understand that um, some of you are have met or are soon meeting with the consultant on redistricting. And uh, you will be seeing, finally, at long last, your appointments to the redistricting board at your next meeting on August the 10th. And after that, we will begin to hopefully see some things start to happen on this and in very short order have that census data, we hope. Commissioner Flowers. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I um, discovered that the person whom I wanted to be considered is going to be moving out of state, that's Canaan. And so I've already begun to query other individuals about serving. So I just wanted to share that if that was not already something that was known. Um, I just found that out and communicated with him and um, we'll miss him, but yeah, I got to find somebody else. So thank you. I'll, I just wanted to share that. Okay. And we'll be doing that at the next meeting. Um, and then they'll be meeting. I think um, in talking to the consultant said that he would be presenting, they would, the group would be presenting their findings to us in November and then we would be taking final action in December. That's correct, yeah. and you do need to act during the odd-numbered year. So again, we have talked about this uh, throughout yeah. this calendar year. It's going to be a very compressed schedule due to the late yeah. delivery of the census data. But I also understand that you can, if we whatever, we may not get it all taken care of this year. We can wait and do something in 2023. The statute is oddly written. It does yeah. require that redistricting be done in odd numbered years. Yeah. It does not necessarily state which odd numbered, yeah. it yeah. does not state yeah. which odd numbered year. I mean, to the extent that we can get it done, that's great. Um, so there may, be, I, there may be other issues that are a little more complicated that may have to wait. We'll see. Certainly, yeah. and you could always move forward with new districts now. And you know, again, in doing some just background reading on this topic, there are other local governments that have undertaken redistricting at times other than right after the census. Again, you just need to make sure that you're doing it in an odd numbered year. Yeah. Uh, your consultant, Mr. Spitzer, is confident that uh, we can accomplish this on the compressed timetable, but. Yeah, he was a part of the original going from five to seven. He was, yeah, so he was. He certainly has historical knowledge. History. So. All right, yes. Just one question. We'll have the information about who's left on, 
can somebody go down that list of people that applied and make sure that they're all, I yeah, mean, I, I know mine is still available, but there were others that were not, that were sort of um, at large. Yeah. Can we make sure all of them are still available before we put yeah. them on the? I think we've done some periodic checking, okay. but I think you're right. Before we come back next okay. meeting, we'll get a definitive. Thanks. Okay. So we had a motion in a second. Um, oh, we don't have a motion in a second. Um, on, on the redistricting efforts, it's done. <laughs> motion in a second. Okay. All right. We'll move on to county. Is that all you had, Jewel? Okay. Uh, Barry? I have several things, Commissioners. Uh, first off, from the, the folks that showed up earlier in the meeting and you asked a question, we have, we have recycling drop-offs at eight other regional parks. So this is pretty commonplace for us to embed them within a locked park facility that is staffed. Um, but um, Jill did provide or get their number and she will be reaching out to them and meeting with them and walking through our project. Yeah, Commissioner Gerard. Did I understand her to say there are three or four containers? Yeah, I think that's what it was. It was, it was I think it was three, is that, is that right, Jill? So it'd be three recycling containers and so they have to put a pad on them and you know, and right. they pick them up. But there's but not it's, like it's, a dozen in, in a yeah, row. It's not, it's not a dozen and it's interior to the park. So, I mean, I haven't looked at it. it. I was trying to pull it up on a map, but I, I wouldn't imagine our staff being putting it, it up in, in a buddy in a residential area. But that's the type of things that we'll look at, so. Yeah, and and since we tore down the, or took down the trees, I'm sure we're replacing those trees. We are, Yeah, and that's uh, part of the site project and they go through any yeah. type of permitting that anybody else would go yeah. through. Um, yeah, I really would like to know specifically about this project, though. So she's going to follow yeah. up. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. <laughs> I just wanted to um, also provide some additional information. Because this is an active contract, we've contracted for this work. Um, Paul Sacco and I have been communicating. It is our intention, because it's scheduled tomorrow, to go out and grind the stumps of the trees that have already been cut and do the grading. Um, that work is scheduled for tomorrow. We would prefer to go ahead and finish it because it'll look worse if we don't do that. Um, and then we've been asked to postpone the project until we have an opportunity to meet with, with, uh, with the, residents. the residents. So there will be a cost involved in remobiliz remobilization of that. So just, you know, it's not, it, it's not typical that we would have a community outreach on on an improvement in one of our parks where it's kind of been our practice, but um, certainly want to, you know, uh, give some deference to the concerns about the visibility and, and what this may look like, uh, but there will be a cost involved. So I just I wanted to let you know, though, there's still work that's scheduled tomorrow that may cause some concerns. So I've asked staff to contact um, the resident that spoke, uh, Dr. Um, I don't know how you pronounce her name, yeah. um, and let them know because they will see activity tomorrow. Yeah, well, the, the, the quote, the trees are gone, so we're right. just trying to clean up. That, that's yeah. correct. Grind the stumps and Regardless do some grading. Regardless of what happens going forward, yes. that correct. you guys are going to, yes. yeah, that has to be done anyway. So. Okay. So that was that was one item. Um, the other item you asked for is a report from Dr. Cho. Um, Dr. Cho is on vacation this week. He said he'd be happy to come at a future meeting, um, but however, he did provide an updated report, and I wanted to read that to you. Um, the message here is, is really clear. If you're unvaccinated, get vaccinated. And that is the message. Um, over the past four to five weeks, we've seen an increase in both cases and our percent positivity. We're seeing this in Florida and throughout the United States. Our seven-day case count has increased to 116. Our percent positive is a 7.1 percent, um, which is up from a low of 2 percent in May. Um, our highest case rate is amongst 30 to 39-year-olds, followed by, by 20 to 29-year-olds. Most of those cases are from the unvaccinated population. There's been a decrease in testing during this period, which obviously impacts the higher percent positivity. So we do understand uh, the correlation between them. In terms of hospitalizations, we've not we have not seen a significant increase in the pop in the COVID admissions, um, and or an increase in the death rate. However, we know that the the new variant is real. Um, it is very contagious, um, and it is spreading. Uh, unfortunately, our vaccination rates remain static. Our total population, our total population, um, having at least one dose is 51 percent. Um, those 12 ages and older are is at 57 percent. Um, we're doing 
65 plus is 78 percent with VA numbers 82 percent. So we're doing very well in terms of our elderly population. Vaccines are readily available at pharmacies, DOH clinics, um, Department of Health clinics, um, community health centers, and many other medical clinics. And we continue to participate in various outreach events, school-based events, health equity initiatives, uh, partnering with businesses. We've done some things with the Rays, with the Dolly Museum and others. We'll continue to try to get creative and making it readily available and accessible and just continuing the message that it is safe, uh, that in fact, you know, you, we, we would encourage people that um, have questions to see their physician, talk to their physician um, uh, to where they get comfortable with making that decision. Um, just a couple other points uh, that he was making here is with the Delta variant is a major concern because of its transmissibility. It's now the dominant strain in the United States. Um, I can go into the effectiveness, but it is, you know, even with your COVID vaccine, it's 88 to 95% effective. So that's not 100%. So, you know, um, and so it's out there, but it certainly does protect you. And if you do get it and, and you're vaccinated, the chances of having significant impacts on your health lessen. Um, so again, that's really the message um, that he would like to carry. It is real. You've read about it. We've read about it. They're watching it, um, but it is up. Barry, and, and this, uh, on, on our website, do we have the, lo uh, the general locations where they can get, you just read a whole list of them, including I'm, some of our efforts that I'm, we're still working on. I'm sure, I'm sure we do. I mean, Mar you know, Barbara's back there. I'm yes, sure she's we do. I'm okay. sure she's shaking her head. Yes, yeah, she is. She is. And they really push out. They worked hand in hand with the Department of Health when we do these events um, and to increase marketing. And they have a whole uh, public information outreach group that's, okay. you know, a uh, public information group um, that's been working on these initiatives together. Okay. Um, so that was uh, one uh, report uh, I wanted Barry, to Barry, hold on one second. Commissioner Long had a question. Sure. So, Barry, does anything in that report reflect what the symptoms might be of if you're coming down with the variant? Um, I don't, Do we know? that's not in the report. Do you um, know, Lourdes? Same, same as with your various COVID. I have a, a family member that did catch it. They were vaccinated, but it was pretty much the same symptoms, but I'm sure that's going to vary dependent upon the person, whether you have mild symptoms or severe symptoms, just like with COVID. Um, but similar, the similar, the same type of symptoms. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on that? Okay, go ahead, Barry. Um, the, the last item that I wanted before we get to the budget was, you know, we've been out talking, Lisa Foster has been out really talking about our modified maps and, and our resiliency effort in adopting a higher standard based upon our mapped storms, <laughs> what we've seen. Um, and I think they've been very successful in, in showing that it doesn't make sense to lower our standards over, especially on the Gulf side where just because of the FEMA map using 2012 data says that we can. They've been very successful. I think there's one, one or two communities that haven't committed to that yet. Three, okay. Um, and Lisa can come up. But we wanted to answer any questions that you had. It's been out in there. We're gonna bring back a resolution asking you to, uh, to keep our standards, to adopt a higher standard. Um, I think it only makes sense from a resiliency standpoint. And then what we're talking about is when you do construction, why build lower when we know what our storms you know, are doing? And so it doesn't Im impact anybody. It certainly, I think, can help us with our rates, with our flood insurance rates. Um, but we wanted to bring it up. And if you're hearing anything as we're talking to communities before we bring it back to see if you had any questions or concerns along the way. Did, Barry, did, 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 did I do exactly what you said? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Barry, did you, do you have any sense of uh, when you get things like this, do we filter that through our, our, our our committee of construction, you know, the folks that we've talked about with our building department, just to get their take on. on we have, okay. and at least presented to them. He's, she's presented to the city manager. She's presented to mayors. Uh, beat, I think you'd went to the big C mm -hmm. um, and, and others and any other individual community that um, would have us. So what did the construction industry or our business industry people say? So the DCAG didn't really have a whole lot of feedback. Um, they had, they had feedback on stormwater stuff more so than on this stuff, <laughs> on the map stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, you did get a letter from the Realtors Association supporting um, the higher standard. Yes, we did. Pinellas Realtor Organiz Organization recognizes that, you know, 
it's their folks that will need to sell the house in 50 years and they would like that house to still be there and not have a huge flood insurance policy associated with it because they built too low. With the risk rating 2.0 coming into play in October, it's really going to impact uh, what those flood insurance rates look like for all the new development. And of course, this only impacts new and redevelopment. This isn't going to affect anybody that's currently currently built. That, that would be, they would get on the glide path if they have a policy in place before October. Was there a, in the general difference in the two? What was the what was the height? If, if one depends of, on the area. But it depends ahead. on the area across the county. The average difference um, between our current effective map and the vulnerability study 100-year uh, floodplain is about a foot. It's two feet in some places over on the Gulf side, and it it really varies uh, when you compare it to the preliminary map map because the preliminary map, well, the pending map now, is going down so much on the Gulf side. I mean, we have decreases of, you know, four feet in some places on the Gulf side and all the way up, um, you know, into the Anclo River as well. And so we really, the reason why I wanted to really do an outreach along the beach communities is to get a consistent development standard. Um, not only make us more resilient, but also be consistent. Um, and I think we've, we've, we've largely achieved that, but we have a few communities that um, have not adopted that or agreed to that. We're going to be reaching out to them directly. I'm reaching out to one in particular right after I get back. Um, I'll be gone next week, and so I'm going to talk to them after that. There are a handful that are also waiting to see what the county does. So mm -hmm. it's, it was a lot of, you know, kind of going around in a circle. Well, what are you guys doing? Well, what are you guys doing? And <laughs> it's a lot of back and forth with them. Yeah. Be happy to answer any questions, okay. really. Go ahead. No. I don't see any other questions. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, go ahead, Charlie. Just before you jump into that, uh, just got a message that for the redistricting applications, the four at-large positions that we will select as a group, we still have 22 available and interested applicants. Very good. Go ahead. Okay, so the last piece of uh, the commission or the county administrator's report is the proposed 2022 annual operating and capital budget. Um, and so I'm going to have our short timer operate the uh, the slide presentation here. So it's a, this is his last budget. Um, so this year when we were looking at the budget and I wanted to really format this in a, in a different way because a budget is really not a, a numbers thing it's really about a, a, a obtaining your objectives you guys set out clear strategic objectives and we were trying to find a way of matching what you asked us to achieve and what you want to achieve for the community with what it takes to fund that so when we looked at our 2022 budget, we really looked at how do we address the strategic needs around behavioral health, public safety, parks, sidewalks, sustainability, sustainability and resiliency, our transportation system, some of our technology improvements, and affordable housing. When we look at that, we really tried to look at rather than always layering, always adding, we said, can we find operational efficiency to start shifting dollars? Um, from areas and finding efficiencies to achieve your strategic goals. Uh, that's what you'll see throughout this. At the same time, we want to make sure that we protect our long-term financial position um, with our operating budget. So let's talk about some of those strategic initiatives. As you're well aware, within this budget, um, we have we completed the optimal data set and established a way of having a performance management approach to a coordinated access model to achieve results around those and needing behavioral health services. This budget funds and, 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 and has set aside dollars for into the future for designing and operating a coordinated access model that will allow for transparency and how people enter into our behavioral health system and get services with wraparound services to where we can track the actual health outcomes of those people that need assistance. It doesn't stop there around behavioral health because the sheriff is also, and you heard him during his presentation, talk about the need, rather than it just being a law enforcement response to somebody in crisis, uh, that you have mental health professionals as part of that response team. And so he's, he's asked us to expand that. 
He's, he developed a pilot program this past year. We support that and we want to expand that out. This will require some additional um, personnel. We think as they, as they roll out this model that he'll be able to find efficiencies, but he's going to have to get data and stuff to be able to suggest that. In other words, you usually have two officers responding. Now you're having one officer and a mental health professional, and so then that frees up resources elsewhere. So we don't necessarily, right now we're adding. Um, we think that that won't always be the case as we get the data to support how do we do that. But we think this is a very good thing, and this is included within our 2000. 22 budget. We also know that within our public safety area, we had to uh, absorb some significant increased costs this past year. The body worn cameras alone was four and a half million dollars. And so this is an ongoing cost. It was needed. It adds to the uh, transparency around um, our law enforcement and what's actually occurring. This goes with their in camera systems. Um, and, it, and it requires a few new people, IT and things, to be able to manage that. And the public records request that will be associated with that will be significant. Those are built into our 2022 budget. We also heard that the sheriff needs uh, to look at a replacement to his 1990 helicopter. He's got three helicopters. Um, we've seen those assets be used a lot, most recently during our storm events. Um, and so the uh, request is for within for fiscal year 22 or 23, and there's still work to do on this, that we plan for the replacement of his um, oldest helicopter. There's also mandatory inspections that are required of that. And when a helicopter gets to a certain age, there's big renovations with big numbers in terms of uh, what it costs for those renovations, and that's the reason he's looking at that at this time. So again, we've, we've planned for that eventual replacement as part of looking at our reserve levels. And as he also uh, mentioned, that having Marine Patrol that are on board every day and, uh, and, and available throughout our waterways adds to our um, increased law enforcement, um, but actually it's a public safety issue out on our waterways and that is built within this budget. So, so that's the first one time I've heard you mention a plus FTEs, right? That is plus FTEs. Okay. That is five additional FTEs in the sheriff's office. And, there, and there's, that's additional FTEs for the mental health unit. So those are, uh, those are additional um, numbers, and I can get those for yeah, you. Yeah, if you can, please. And the body-worn cameras, which you previously approved. Yeah, but no, that, that's not additional positions. It or, is, or, because or there the, was a couple positions in the back. So you had to have a public records person <laughs> because of the number of um, public records requests you're going to get. You had to have, an, I think, an IT person. I can't re recall exactly, but there's a few positions associated with that. I, just, I want to try to keep track of those. We actually I'll, have a slide that will show okay, you that. Okay, great, great. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and it may be in your slide, but I see where you actually refine in the Marine Patrol, how many, but in the mental health and safety program, you don't. So is that in your slide? We'll, we'll break that out. We didn't break it out in here. We can certainly break that out. It was I, as the sheriff presented in, in, his, in his presentation, yeah. but I don't, I don't want to say the number because I don't remember. So when here he... Here it's, it's 11 positions. 11. So when he, when he, when you talk about that, those positions will cover the, the teams countywide, I'm assuming? It's still a pilot. He, he's talked about expanding the territory. He's going to use data. So he has a defined territory that he used um, that he just he funded out of existing positions. Um, this will replace that and then expand that out. Um, my understanding, and I would have to have him here for that to be able to you know, go through that, but his idea is then look at the data to see if those positions, how large a territory they could cover. So if it's, in other words, he has sufficient coverage on regular law enforcement, what the percentage of uh, positions are responding to those types of calls, then he can set the boundaries for that as, as a part of that program. Right. Thank you. Go ahead, Bill. Um, so, we come back, we come to you in May, and we talked about the level of service within our parks. Um, and, and we've heard this for, you know, for a couple of years regarding um, the number of positions that we removed over the years. Um, and we don't have coverage in all of our parks. It leads to how often you cut the grass. It leads to how often you clean the bathrooms. Um, and even having somebody there within that park facility uh, to be able to handle whatever comes up. Um, and at that time, we had about 31 positions, I believe, something like that, 30, 
um, that we come to you that said the level of service should be at 30 positions. Well, we really want to do this in a phased approach, and we want to measure the effectiveness of the additional resources we put in there. So what we're suggesting is that we put on seven FTEs now. That'll give us coverage within all of our parks. Um, and then next year, we add an additional nine positions. That allows us to cover all of the parks. It allows us to enhance some of the services. It doesn't allow us to add positions for covering vacations and things like that. And we'll evaluate the level of service. If, in fact, we believe there are additional positions to meet the level of service that we need, we'll come back to you in a future budget year and request that. So we're trying to take a, an incremental approach to this. Um, we, we certainly know that w the, even from a basic coverage standpoint, this just meets basic coverage request. Um, but I think that doing this in a phased approach uh, would make us all feel more comfortable rather than adding a whole bunch of positions all at once. So all we're approving in this budget would be, or the recommendation is for seven. Uh, seven for 2021 now, okay? Oh. And then next year, an additional nine starting, I think we have it budgeted for nine months for January. So it would be an additional nine. And, and we can go through that when we'll, we'll send you the supporting documentation to show you that. This gets you to where, we, for instance, you've added, we've added Wall Street, the enhancements to our parks. We've added whole new park systems. We've added Wheaton Island where we don't have anybody. Um, and so we, this literally gets us to where we have coverage within our park system. But let us, let us send that to you and you can see the specific breakdown about how those positions will be used. Commissioner Barry, I'm curious, in this um, several meetings back ago, we had a presentation from Paul Causey who talked about the parking, um, I just had a break. The, the, the readers for the, yeah, at, at our parking lots. So is yes. that included in this budget? Do you know? It is. It's a little further back, but okay, yes. Okay, just curious since we were talking about the parks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It is. Okay, keep going. And sustainability and resiliency. You know, we completed our sustainability action plan. We presented that to you back a while back. We've, uh, we're implementing the results of our sea level rise um, and storm, storm surge vulnerability assessment. We just talked about the work Lisa's done with our communities and really looking at the impact that um, climate's having on us and you know, on our peninsula. We began the purchase of our solar power through uh, Duke Energy's Clean Energy Connection Program. We purchased as much as we could. Um, but it was a limited amount, as you as you know. Um, but but getting to the some of the harder items is we're really looking at the way we do fleet practices, um, and we and we we've, we've started that we presented that program to you, looking at how we can convert to alternative fuels. Others have said, you know, don't. I had a I had a great conversation with Melissa over at Duke Energy about how they're converting their fleet, where they're successful, where they're not. And, and so we need to capitalize on that and begin really having a strategic approach, as we've talked about with you, on, on moving um, the needle in this area. Commissioner Long. So on that issue, I just want to thank you for including this so upfront in, our, in your presentation today. You know how that really rings my bell. Speaking of Melissa, when you spoke to her, did she talk to you about the partnerships that she's anxious to create? with regard to the electrification and the charging stations all over the county? We, we talked about that. We even talked about some new initiatives I'm not gonna speak out here that, uh, that we wanna pursue together. Excellent. Um, you know, around solar and other areas. So I think there's some tremendous opportunities there. Um, but, I do too. But I wanna learn from their experience. I wanna partner with them. Um, you know, and, and I, because sometimes we don't talk about it enough, but we wanted to put it up front Thank you. to your point, <laughs> because there is a lot of work that your team's working on uh, to make us a more resilient community. Good. Now, we talked a lot about sidewalks. <laughs> Boy, did we talk about sidewalks. And we talked about that backlog. Well, we want to put real dollars into this area. So we're proposing as part of this budget to take $4 million from our general fund reserves, not the transportation trust fund, from our general fund reserves to do, try to address the backlog um, in our sidewalk program. This will help us get caught up. 
but then we have to be able to maintain that. The way we maintain that is to add two additional crews, okay, sidewalk crews and the equipment associated with that. And I know you're gonna ask me how many people that is. <laughs> and, and, and I don't have the answer to that, so I'm, I'm looking back to see if they can fill in that gap as we, as we kind of go along. Um, but but that, that we, because you know, it's not just a matter of getting caught up, we gotta be able to maintain, because each year we add, our backlog grows by 10%. So regardless of what we get caught up on, we're gonna be able to main, have to maintain that going forward. Now, as we've also talked about, we, our local option fuel tax, is, our transportation trust fund is what we use to be able to fund our sidewalks, a lot of our road repairs. Um, our drainage ways. It doesn't go to general government at all. It is strictly around these capital infrastructure assets in addition to the penny dollars that we have. And we also know that that is a decrease in cost. We've seen our cost increase. Um, we've seen, um, but we've seen this because of more fuel efficient vehicles go down over the years. And so as we know, by the end of this next year, we, this will be in the red. So we either have to increase revenue or reduce cost. Um, and so the proposal to do that is through a five cent per gallon uh, increase in our, on our fuel purchases. I'm, I know there's a lot of information out there and people are spreading that information, but this is not hard math, okay? If you drive 13,000 you know, miles a year at five cents, if your car gets 25 miles a gallon, that's $27, okay? It's not $270 and some of the information that's been put out there, it's $27 average you know, car that w this would increase. Um, this, 100% of this goes to those very assets. This doesn't go to general government. It goes to these assets to be able to maintain this infrastructure. Keep going. Uh, Barry, um, in the nickel that you're talking about um, and the other six cents that are there already, yep. um, what, per what amount of those, uh, how's it limited to operating versus capital? Um, so, I mean, Bill, you want to address the breakdown no, of how some you can use... Some people have said we can use penny money for the cap, uh, for that for the gas tax, but it can only be used for some of the gas tax. Well, penny so money goes to capital assets, so we can we can repave a road with penny money, and we do some of it from there. We do some of it from the um, transportation trust fund, but there's not enough you know um, penny money to go around either. Obviously, as you as you're well aware, so we can use we can only do capital with a penny. This we can do capital and we can maintain with certain parts of those funding. In other words, we can have our road crews that actually do the sidewalks and things like that. They can be paid for out of the transportation trust funds with pieces of the penny. This new amount, 100% of it has to go to capital. Is that correct? So this new amount, the new five cent, 100% of it has to go to capital. Okay, so um, the, uh, the additional crews has to be paid for out of the existing. Now, obviously, by putting additional money into capital, and we're already using that fund for capital, that frees up dollars to be able to pay for those two sidewalk, or that, those sidewalk crews of to be able to maintain money, that of out of the other parts of that pun, penny. But again, you're exactly right. This new money, 100% goes to capital. Doesn't pay for salaries, doesn't pay for anything else. But in the original six cents that's there, uh, there was capital and operating. Operating, uh, and so yes. So you're going to be moving capital. You'll over. be enhancing your capital. You'll be enhancing it. It's not, this okay. is more money to capital. But yes, it, it can also be maintained with uh, the day-to-day -day operations. They'll, they're going to correct me when I'm when no, I'm no, no, no. There was just there was just a little startle. That's all. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, so. Um, as we also know in technology, we're looking at modernizing some of our platforms around technology. Um, these are both in terms of enhancements. We have to look at keeping up to date on our financial and human resource systems. But when we don't enhance those, we also run into security issues. Um, so this not only enhances the functionality of those systems, um, but also makes them protected uh, for financial information. Um, the, this also, though, we've included within here um, the 24-7 uh, security operations that was proposed by BTS uh, to enhance our cybersecurity readiness. And then we also fund in here um, StackWeb, which is a case management for both the public defender and the state's attorney. Within this 
2022 budget, we also in, uh, continue to look at our penny for Pinellas for affordable housing on our commitment through that. We're very proud that through June of 2021, we've committed $23 million that's produced almost 1,200 housing units, 884 of which are affordable at the 80% or less. Um, and so, you know, think about where we were just a year ago. We've made a real effort to enhance this program and we look forward to a lot more. And that number over the 10 years is at about 60 million, isn't it? We got about 80 million. 80 million in there? Yes. Okay, so mm -hmm. there's a there's an additional 50, 40 some million still, 50, That's 50 million. Go back, there was, wasn't there one other piece? Oh, oh, and just our partnership with the Housing Finance Authority. It's really important that the reason we wanted to put this in is because we're not just looking at housing and throwing money, we're looking at leveraging that money, try to bring in state and federal grants. And so we can leverage that to where you know, if for every dollar we're putting out, we're bringing in five, six, seven dollars of outside um, uh, initiatives through other uh, state and federal funding sources. Now, to accomp accomplish this, remember before I said that we really want to find efficiencies to drive our strategic um, vision and change. Well, if you look, I asked you last year, I said, let's look at this as a two year budget. Um, well, you know, a couple of years ago, in 2019, we only increased our, with salary increases and health care increases for all of our employees. We still only increased our budget by for Board of Commissioner departments by 1.5%. We were trying to really get a handle around looking at efficiencies. And then that next year, we took the full uh, levy. We said so we kept our property tax rate the same, but we decreased our expenditures by over 4% for Board of Commissioner departments. Okay, we, that's how we're achieving these other goals with what I'm about to propose. This year, we're adding some of that back. So we've looked at, for instance, I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna add in money into parks until we did the analysis on the level of service to have data to be able to make that case for you. Um, and so we're asking for, uh, through these initiatives to put some of that money back. But what that shows you is over a three year period, our overall increase for Board of Commissioner Departments is 0.7%. These are costs. These are expenditures, yeah. Expenditures um, for our BOCC. For BOCC departments. Why that's important is when we, when we throw, when you, when you look at the overall budget and you've got all kinds of different funds, well, I think people look at the kind of the general fund and our Board of Commissioner Departments a little bit differently. If you go to the next slide, we also know that we've had to address many um, changes in our sheriff and our public safety area. So for instance, over the sheriff's you know, cost, has, we've had to increase 5%, 3.9%, 6.2%. Well, a lot of these, again, are significant costs. It's outside, uh, are things that we had to do. The body-worn cameras, I don't think anybody uh, disagrees with that. We needed to do that. Um, vehicle replacement. You know, we've been leasing vehicles, and as we talked to you about during the sheriff's budget, we need to get out of that habit. That needs to be in, whoa, there it is. Um, it, that needs to be an ongoing cost, and so we're up funding that. So we're gonna fund the full value of that. That way it's built into his budget, and then those leases as they go off will simply go away, and that's an ongoing cost. We're not arguing about how many vehicles we're gonna replace every year because we know to not replace vehicles would be a um, penny-wise, pound-foolish decision. Um, we, we're looking and or we're including in these costs things that we did last year around operational improvements at the jail on some of our safety initiatives. We're including well, our mental health crisis units. Again, that's 11 you know, officers, so this is enhanced level of service. Uh, we're including in our marine patrol deputies that we just discussed. And finally, uh, helicopter inspections and then planning for not in the operating, but in the capital eventual replacement of that 1990 helicopter. These increases that you're talking about are operational and capital together? The, these are operational and capital together, okay. yeah. Okay. So we could but, have that separated out. If we and we need. can, okay. and I, but I'm, I'm just trying to show on the public safety side, there's cost. I mean, it's a, it's a people business. We're trying, we're trying to find operational efficiencies in the BOCC, harder to do over in the sheriff's office where it's people cost a 3% is different over there where it's all people than it is, you know, over in a different area. And so I wanted to break those two out it's not picking on anything. It's just a reality of the difference of where our costs are going. Our costs are going down. We're trying to drive that change. Um, there's things that are outside of that control that I wanted to highlight. 
So what changed? How did, how did we address these last three years? Well, the one thing we did is we eliminated um, targets for Board of Commissioner departments and for agencies. You don't, you know, your paper may go up, but we're asking you to figure that out. So you don't automatically get a target, an increase. You don't get an inflationary increase to your budget. We eliminated that. That's one of the ways. We said you're gonna, you need to justify everything that you um, are asking for. And so we've tried to do that. We've encouraged departments, and we're gonna continue to encourage departments. You've developed a performance management group. We're gonna continue to use data to help drive those decisions. But what we're asking for is to get more efficient. Let's figure out how to use resources to get the same or better outcome. Um, and I think that's gonna be, a, it needs to be a continuous improvement process. We began that. I think we got set back with the pandemic a little bit. Um, but we really need to continue to say that if we're gonna achieve the, the goals and objectives that you set, that we need to do that by creating efficiencies to help pay for those shifting in resources. Um, we adopted a two-year budget. Last year, we said, I'm asking you to keep the millage the same. Why? Because we didn't know what was gonna happen. We didn't know what, how it was gonna impact property values, sales taxes. There were so many you know, things that were unrealistic. And so we ask you to adopt it as a two-year budget. Go ahead. And so as a result, as we look at this year's budget, we know that our, our values have actually increased by 6.58%. But after using everything, all of our financial forecasting and looking out multiple years, I'm recommending to you that we do a full rollback of our millage rate to where it produces zero new dollars under our general fund. What, what that is basically saying is you gave us the full amount last year and we didn't need all of that. We didn't increase spending, we just put it into reserves. Now we're gonna use part of that to fund last year and part of it to fund this year's increased cost. That doesn't mean we can always do that. Listen, there's a, it's, it's, it's simple math that if you increase cost, you know, you have to find the revenue to support that. And so going forward, we wanna, we wanna have an honest budget. This, uh, I'm trying to use that as last year we didn't need that. We said that if we didn't need it, we wouldn't spend it and we didn't. And now we're giving, we're kind of giving that back and kind of holding to that by doing a full rollback, rolling our millage rate from 5.277 down to 5.017, the impact uh, and the impact that that will have. Um, we also recommend that we do that with the health department. So we can do that and that again, the first one will produce a $24 million savings um, and the other one is $589,000 savings. The average residential household um, at 175,000 is about a $53 savings as if we had, if we had kept the rate the same. So far more, far different than the other piece. And the other piece is limited to capital improvements in terms of the, the for the uh, loft um, increase. So just wanna be clear on, on the general fund millage, the amount of revenues or the amount of ex what, we're, what we're bringing in uh, this year based on property value increases and the millage is the same as it was last year. Well, so it's a full I, well, rollback. I'm, I'm suggesting, I'm proposing a full rollback to where even though values are going up, that we're not gonna capture any of that increase and uh, through a rate. That we do a rollback rate to where it produces the same amount. And the reason for that is, it's kind of like splitting it. We did have cost increases. I just went over a whole bunch of those. But we saved money, and then we're using that money that you gave us in the levy increase last year for the covering part of the cost increases for last year and cost increases for this next year. Commissioner Flowers. Mr. So Chair, um, I know we talked about passing along savings to um, the residents by any way that we can. So the general fund rollback rate, which in all my years, I've never participated in a budget where we actually not just proposed it, but did it went to the rollback rate. So this is gonna be new for me. Um, but I, I do have just a little apprehension about the health department only because the fluctuation that we've seen as it relates to COVID-19 and whatever else that may come up, um, I just wanna make sure that they have all the resources that they need um, you, we were very, um, very grateful for what the federal government did in supplanting funds for testing and all of that stuff um, and inoculation. But 
um, that just kind of gives me a little scare to go all the way back to the rollback rate for the health department. I'm just sharing, I'm not saying. And so, so you know what we did, <coughs> and, and we'll certainly share this you know, as we get into the budget, but we, we did a, a five-year budget forecast, okay, using, using a conservative approach in terms of property values and things like that. And under these, now again, um, we've, a lot of that money with the with the both the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan dollars, of which we're going to have to bring that to you at a later time. A lot of those associated impacts, we can fund ourselves back. Things that we've expended reserves out of, we can reimburse ourselves out of that. That goes into this overall model. Um, but a lot of the impacts of the health department, we've been able to use other funding sources to be able to do that. Um, but under these projections, we're still good and we still are above all of our financial projections in terms of reserve levels five years out. Commissioner Long. Uh, yes, and as I have shared with you, Barry, I am really uh, struggling with that rollback business simply because of the a couple things which I feel compelled to share. Mm -hmm. We don't know what we don't know. The hurricane uh, projections for our state have been revised from what they started out about three, four months ago till now, where they are projecting 20 storms in our area from now until we get done with this season in November. So we don't know whether we'll be in the spotlight or not. Secondly, uh, there, with regard to sustainability and resiliency, I am aware that the new threat is the heat index that we are beginning to see all over the United States. And to the point where you may be aware, Miami-Dade, the first place in the entire world has uh, hired a heat officer to study the index and the impact on our health, our economy, our transportation systems, simply because planes have not been able to take, out of, take off out of certain airports because of the heat and the fact that it has uh, shut my mic off. <laughs> so, you know, these are really serious issues yes. that we have got to keep our eyeball on. And I, like uh, Commissioner Flowers said, I've only been involved since I have been had the opportunity and the privilege to be an elected official, one capacity where we did a rollback on the millage. And let me assure you, it wasn't more than two years later where we really regretted it. Because once you roll it back, it's very difficult to come back around and then ask for an increase. I, I do, Commissioner, I do understand that. Um, I didn't believe it or not, my goal coming into this budget was not to do a full rollback. Um, I, I thought a reasonable amount would be to look at a cost of living versus a 6.58 percent rate um, and, and do something more along that lines. Um, and, and especially looking at the impact on homeowners because it's different if you're a new homeowner or a business compared to if you're under Save Your Homes. Okay, And so I, I didn't actually start going into it with that. I, was, I thought if we could do a partial rollback, that would be a decent amount. But if I look at our reserve levels and, and I look at those amounts and I look at the, that we, 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 we're reducing our cost and opportunities to continue to do that, maybe I can't do that each year. But as I project out in five years under any scenario, we still have healthy reserves. That's how I got to the fact that, you know, maybe it's only this one year. But it's this year that we really can do it, and um, and I thought compelled to put it out on the table and have that discussion. No, I I just want to say, um, considering the points that you just made, um, I don't think it's a good idea. You know, we know that putting the gas, you're talking about a rollback mm -hmm. rate at the same time you're talking about a gas 
You're right. tax, number one. Yep. Number two, on top of that, we know, Barry, that the gas tax is a Band-Aid. It's not the solution mm -hmm. to the problems with our transportation trust fund. And so then you're going to come along after you've done a rollback and ask for a, a sales tax increase so that we can fund transportation dollars? I mean, well, do you understand? We are in the bowels of public policy. The average citizen, how on earth do they reconcile that messaging? And so, uh, okay, you're not the only one that has suggested that. Another commissioner had suggested that rather than do a um, loft increase, that we um, put that through and do that under general fund, okay? So uh, through millage. We can do that. We have the amount of a millage increase that it would be needed to be able to cover that cost. Then you have two questions. Okay, one is, I, I don't forget our municipal partners, okay, because it's 60-40 under the loft that we split with our municipalities. They're facing those same increased costs. And so if we do it through that, one, 40%, 35 to 40%, the same argument we made on Penny is done by our visitors, okay? Property tax goes to our owners right here. Um, if we do it through a through the loft, through a gas um, increase, well then that's our, our visitors who are using our roads um, are helping to share in that cost. Um, and, and as we also know that you can go from one street corner to the next and see differences greater than five cents. So, you know, we, we think that's an approach. If you'd rather less look at that as a property tax, we know the amount to generate the nine or the 14 million, which is what would come to the county and the five million that would go to the cities. I think those are the numbers. Um, Bill, six. nine and six, nine and six. And so 15 million, so we, we could put that on the millage. And so then the, the next question is, do we wanna do the nine, which, which would be off of the, uh, for unincorporated areas or, or the MSTU, or do we wanna do that and shift cost through the millage out to the municipalities to help cover that cost? So there's a couple of ways we can address that. I'm ha happy to engage on that. We have the, fi the figures and the options that would give you the choices as we debate this budget. And, and, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that in a minute and, and on August 3rd. August 3rd, we're going to bring back, we're going to outline each one of those options for you and have that discussion. Any other questions before I move on? I thought Commissioner Justice had a question. No? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that, the, the dollar amount on the fuel was what I was looking for to compare it to the 24 uh, million in savings. Uh, so that, because that's the question. That's. Yep. And, and, you know, we've seen in this last few months that um, some of our local partners don't really care about the facts. They've been sharing misinformation with their constituents. Um, and so that's what I think is important as we talk about this, that make sure that we're talking, sharing those, this information uh, with, our, with our municipal partners so that when they tell their citizens that Pinellas is in, uh, proposing something that is somewhere in the vein of truth compared to with the tax increases that they have yes. had at their city level this year, uh, one city in particular that sent us a very um, thoughtful letter <laughs> that uh, that they had not had tax increases where they had a significant tax increase this year. Um, so getting that fact straight as we communicate with our citizens is critically important. That sharing the tax with the, the tourists um, is and our, our folks that come in from out is a legitimate discussion point. Um, but anyway, the main thing I wanted to ask was about the dollar amount so we could make that comparison of what would it take to save the uh, property tax? And you know, and I and I get it. It's a fair debate. I look forward to having that discussion. And you know, I think the the issues when you fill up your gas, it hits you. You know, it's 10 extra cents. You know, whatever, 50 extra cents. When you get your property tax bill, it's right there before, and you got the whole amount before you. Um, you know, it's. I've always been amazed because people would would wouldn't complain about certain things, but the property tax they would, right? Why? Because it's right there in front of you. You know, but um, so you know, uh, we've we've looked at it both ways. We're 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 asking for less than what we're giving up, you know? And so um, that's, that's how we've proposed it. But we do have options available for you if you choose to go in a different manner. Okay, um, all right, now I'm gonna let Bill get up and he's gonna go through the numbers portion of the budget and then we'll answer any questions. Good afternoon again, commissioners. So uh, looking at the numbers themselves, uh, the total 
proposed budget is $2.9 billion. And as you can see on the slide, that's a total increase of 2.5% versus our current FY21 revised budget. However, if you exclude the reserves, and again, look at the two-year budget, and the slide has a typo on it, it's actually a 9.3% decrease from the FY20 revised budget. So we're seeing an overall decrease of almost 10% versus our budget from two years ago as a result of this proposed budget. And that, again, is despite addressing those strategic priorities that Barry talked about and some other strategic priorities that I'll talk about moving forward. As far as our reserve level in the general fund, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, the total dollar amount that we have in there right now is in the proposed budget is $152.5 million. That equates to a 21.7% reserve level in the general fund. However, uh, when you talk about some of the future year commitments that Barry described, um, including things like the CAM, including things like sheriff vehicles, including things like the helicopter, that m number is actually, and this is again, looking at our six-year forecast and forecasting out what are additional obligations that are not built into our recurring budget, it's actually 16.4%. So we're more in the range of what we typically would have already accommodating future year increases that we know are going to be coming. May, may so Bill, in your numbers, does that include the approximately, and I'm just rounding it off because I don't really know, the 15 million that Commissioner Peters has been consistently requesting for the mental health facility? For the Marshman facility? That, yeah. The Marshman facility is not included in there for a couple of reasons. One is because we're still working on what is the solution and the coordinated access model is our first step forward in first of all establishing that and then implementing that before we determine whether a marchment facility is going to be necessary. Secondly, a marchment facility is more likely to be something that would look to penny for funding as opposed to the general fund. So that's a distinction when I talk about these reserve levels. I'm talking about the general fund reserve levels. The penny is a completely different funding source. Right. But I thought I heard Barry make mention of the fact that he had set money, set money aside to be able to accommodate for the, cam, the the operation of the CAM, okay, the coordinated access model, which is about oh. $2 million a year. Under any scenario, we don't see the need for a brick and mortar facility. I mean, our, 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 all of our work is it's a virtual environment. I don't care where you come into the system. The, the key is it could be with the sheriff's mental health unit. We need to be able to grab that person and put wraparound services for that person to be able to give them an appointment, get them services, and know the outcome of that right there. And so if we're successful in creating this model, it doesn't matter where you enter in the system. Um, it's a coordinated model, and it's all uh, done virtually. Okay, thank you. The future year commitment that we are talking about when it takes it from a 21% reserve level in the 22 budget to a 16%. What, I mean, how many years are we talking about? That's over a six-year period. Over the six-year period. And and a lot of that, again, that's that's kind of giving us kind of a worst-case scenario because as we talk to you about um, American Rescue Plan dollars, a lot of the, the things that we've projected in this budget are eligible as reimbursable um, items that then would then keep that reserve level at a much higher level. But we wanted to put in kind of a worst-case scenario in case you say, no, we're not going to spend the money on that because we haven't presented that plan to you yet. So what, what are the estimated reserves as we come to the end of 21? You're showing me 21.4 in the 22 budget. I'm assuming that's year end. Yes, that's so correct. So what's, what's the beginning reserve level or the ending 21 reserve level that you're anticipating? I'd have to get back to you on that because we don't look at the ending reserve level and the actual year. We look at our beginning fund balance because whatever's left in reserves rolls into our beginning fund balance. And the estimates that we use in building the budget is ultimately what drives what that ending fund balance is. So the way that the cash flow works, and I'll try to make it as simple as possible, is we have our expenditures that are budgeted and our revenues that are budgeted. Right. Then we have what's actually expended and what's actually received in revenue. When you balance all that out, that tells us what we have at the beginning of the new fiscal year. That beginning of the new fiscal year, in addition to our new revenue, then gives us what our resources are in order to be able to meet all of our needs. We have some of those budgeted and the rest of those fall into reserves. I get it. 
we've told people last year that we were going to raise our reserve levels strategically, and that's what I'm talking about. What were so, we at? So our so, so our just, reserve level yeah. in the in, at at present time when we built the budget, and that's as of May 31st, was 23.7 percent in FY21. So we're dropping our reserve level by about 2 percent from FY21 to FY22 based on what's being proposed. It went from 23.5% to 21.7% between the FY21 revised budget as of May 31st and the proposal that's before you for FY22. So part of that drawdown has been some of these things that we spent this year, like the, the body cam. That that's, was prior to May 31st. That was that was prior to May 31st. So, 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 so our reserve level is actually higher when we adopted the FY21 budget. And that's what number I'm looking for. I, if I remember correctly, that was 24.2%. percent okay, 242 Because one of the things we told people is that we would get this reserve level back down. I, I wasn't anticipating to 21.7. I was anticipating down closer to the 15 or 16 number. But you're trying to be more conservative over the next five or six years because you're going to be using some of those dollars from the reserves. Correct. Right that's, that, that's the reason that we want to provide the perspective of when we build in future year commitments, what is our reserve level at so that citizens know that, A, we're going to be rolling back the millage rate and giving back the dollars that we said that we're reserving just in case there was an uh, economic impact from the pandemic that we were fearing. We didn't realize that impact. Fortunately, we didn't realize that kind of impact. So as a result of that, we've, as we do every year, we continue to update our six-year financial forecast. We updated the six-year financial forecast and said, we can roll back the millage rate and still maintain an appropriate reserve level, including addressing future impacts. So we're being very conservative in the approach we're taking while at the same time rolling back the, proposing to roll back the billet trade. It's almost like having your cake and eating it too. Yeah, which always worries me that I'm not understanding something that I need to understand. I'm thinking that the reserve level is, is going down less than what our values are going up, the property values. And so just I'm trying to draw the connection as to how we're netting out zero. Well, um, remember that the amount that the property values are going up is being completely offset by the millage rollback. Right. So we're generating no additional dollars in property taxes in the general fund right. as a result of that increase in property valuation. And yet we're just using that little bit of reserve, so to speak. I mean, there's... In combination with all of the other factors right. that are involved yep. in the budget. So l last year, let's just, and I'd, I'd, I'd have to ask Bill to get the numbers, but last year you gave us an amount, we kept the rate the same, that generated $30 million. And let's say it take $15 million of increased cost. Well, we're using 15 from that year and 15 this next year for that two year rolling budget. Um, so we didn't, that's the reason we can zero it out and do a full rollback is because we cut our cost to where we can live with the, the amount that we had last year and that's sustainable going forward. Now, future years we have a projection, a conservative projection on property values and things like that. The programs that we presented to you are fully funded on an operating cost. We're not using one-time dollars for ongoing cost. So that's fully funded and at the end of that, in the worst case scenario, after five years, we're at that 16.4% level. That's the reason we feel comfortable with where we're at because we're still above our, um, our threshold of where we wanna be in terms of reserves and uh, keeping in mind our future operating cost. I think we can generate additional savings. I don't think we're done with that yet. Um, but so I, that's the reason we feel comfortable with where we're at. Yep. The last thing I would add to that in terms of the conservatism is that we have not built in any reimbursement from FEMA right. for the pandemic costs. We haven't built in any use of ARPA that may offset what's already built into the budget. Now that's gonna be one-time dollars, but at the same time, those will be freed up depending on what our decisions right. are made. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> so moving on to our penny for Pinellas as a reminder about that. Um, you're all very familiar with the penny for Pinellas. We've talked about it a couple of times today. You know what the priorities are around that, including housing, um, in 
the ESP program for economic development we talked about. The penny fund is balanced for FY22, but as we talked about in the budget information session, when we talked about the capital program, we will need to address the long-term penny program because the penny program on a 10-year basis is not balanced. So over the next six months, our goal is going to be to balance that program over a 10-year basis within the priorities we have, all the projects we've committed to to the public, and also in consideration of construction prices and what those may be doing. And we're keeping a close eye on that, still trying to understand what that's gonna to mean to our capital program. As of today, if you were to ask me, I would say that's gonna make it more difficult to balance that program. Um, but construction prices are variable over time and uh, the increases that we're seeing right now may be episodic. Moving on to the BCC department specifically, and Barry talked about some of the numbers around this, so I'll cover this pretty quickly. The total BCC net of reserves is only increasing 1.8% over the past two years. Uh, this part of the budget actually comprises two, almost two thirds of the budget. So what happens here is a major driver of what you see in the overall budget figures. And the general fund itself specifically is only increasing 2.2% over this year, which is a total of $4 million. Our constitutional officers, uh, the sheriff takes up 85% of that total budget for the constitutional officers. In total, it's about 15% of the total county budget. Uh, that's increasing by $18 million. A majority of that is the sheriff's decision packages that we've talked about. Our other agencies, which is all the rest of the budget that's included, and that includes internal service funds like the business technology services, risk management, HR, court support, unincorporated fire districts, our libraries, recreation services, and special districts. Uh, that comprises the last 21% of our total bu county budget, and that's actually decreasing slightly um, once you exclude the COVID stimulus funds. Getting to our staffing levels. So as far as the staffing levels, our total staffing levels across all of the entire budget, including the constitutional officers, including the independent agencies, are equivalent to our 1996-1997 fiscal year levels. If you look at the BCC specifically, you have to go all the way back to 89-90 to find the same staffing levels that we have proposed in this budget. As far as the increases that you see there, uh, the increases within the sheriff's office we talked about already, uh, that comprises 21 of the total 28 positions that you see listed there. There are also four in the uh, supervisor of elections that uh, the supervisor talked about during her budget information session, and then four with the tax collector, the tax collector talked about during his budget presentation. Those four positions with the tax collector were actually realigned from BTS uh, there will be a change to what you see in the tentative budget to actually remove four positions from BTS that were not yet removed in this proposed budget. So that's um, one change that you will see when you see the next version of the budget. As far as the parks level of service, uh, we talked about those positions and the changes there. Uh, five of the positions that you see added in the 16 total net increase for the BCC are actually changing from temp services within Public Works to full-time county employees because we've been using those temps for several years. It's a permanent need and our policy and uh, practice is if we have a permanent need, we use permanent employees to fulfill that need. Uh, we also had three project coordinator positions uh, that were added for permitting. You're all familiar with that. We talked about that a little bit earlier to improve the permitting process for our customers. Uh, that's something that was actually done during this year, but because we compare to our adopted budget, that's something that shows up as an increase. So all those things I talked about, those comprise more than the 16 that you see because we actually had some positions decreased in a couple of departments under the BCC. So that's how you have a net of 16 increase there. So Barry talked about some strategic priorities that we have included in the budget. This is a list of additional strategic priorities that are addressed that are important, uh, but not quite to the level of importance that Barry talked about. So I'm gonna run through these pretty quickly. Uh, you have them all in your slides, and these are all things that we talked about during the budget information sessions. But what's important for you to know is each of these is built into the proposed budget you have before you. And I wanna keep re-emphasizing that because, again, we're proposing to roll back the millage rate 
despite addressing these priority needs because we built up reserves with a two-year budget last year. We didn't have the economic fallout that we were concerned about. And we're in a strong financial position and able to be able to sustain over a six-year period the appropriate reserve levels at the new millage rate that's the rollback rate. So as far as these decision packages, the community cat sterilization vouchers, restoring the creative Pinellas support to the levels before the pandemic, downtown Palm Harbor streetscape and parking plan, that, that one specifically was actually offset entirely by eliminating a position. And the good news about that is that that position's eliminated on a permanent basis while this is a one-time need in terms of funding that study. Uh, Commissioner Long, you asked about the license plate recognition uh, program, parking meter upgrades. That's all part of this budget that is included, um, as well as cellular service for the tablets within PCR for the implementation of the work order management system that we call CityWorks. The, the license plate recognition, I missed that, I apologize. What is, what is that? So that's a change in the way that we would actually do the parking enforcement out of Fort DeSoto, and there are two benefits of it. One is a better enforcement mechanism. Uh, the other one, which is more customer-oriented, because obviously customers don't want to be enforced all the time, uh, but the more the customer-oriented one is that it'll eliminate having to stop at the toll booth at Fort DeSoto Park in order to be able to pay to get in. Okay. All right. Thank you. So moving on to other decision packages, we have a couple of technology decision packages. Within Public Works, we have the 50-year-old mosquito control helicopter that we're going to replace. Um, I know they're excited about that. Uh, fiber infrastructure expansion, which is gonna be a major enhancement for our ability to be able to communicate between buildings across the county. And then we talked about the five FTEs, which are actually not new FTEs when you consider the fact that we already have employees performing that function. They're just not county employees. Within safety and emergency services, they went through a whole list of different things that they want to be able to accomplish. Uh, these are listed here. It's a total of five FTEs in, in, in the aggregate uh, that would be accommodated through this. Most of those are not general fund funded. Constitutional officers, and, and again, these are in addition to what Barry talked about. So when we talk about the law enforcement vehicles, that's what Barry Hatton specifically talked about and outlined earlier in the presentation. Uh, supervisor of elections, uh, there's the historical scanning and indexing of the voter registrations that we talked about. Uh, BTS, in addition to the security enhancement, there's also accessibility and ADA compliance tools built in. User fee changes. Most of these user fee changes are inflationary increases and uh, normal course of business that we do each year. However, I did want to highlight the building permits because that was a topic of a discussion when we had the budget information session. We talked about the building services fund and some of the challenges that we have there on a long-term basis. Uh, based on the feedback that we received, we decided to go back and we're going to take an inflationary 3% increase in the fees instead of a steeper increase this year, and then we'll reevaluate next year and we'll do that on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, we feel more comfortable that based on the permit volume that we see, that we may be able to accommodate continuing to keep that fund sustainable with a lower inflationary increase instead of spiking it and then going back to an inflationary increase. Under solid waste and utilities, these are the rate increases that we talked about in prior years. So this is sustaining those plans that we already made. And then finally, our budget timeline of, as far as what you can expect next. So we referenced a couple of times August 3rd. On August 3rd, we're required to certify with the property appraiser the maximum millage rates that are included in the trim notices. So August 3rd is going to be an important date for us to be able to talk about what our actual millage rate's going to be that's listed on the trim notice. Because once it's listed on the trim notice and certified with the property appraiser, we can go lower, but we cannot go higher when we adopt the budget. Uh, so we'll talk about those millage rates. We'll talk about the loft again, uh, because if we decide that we want to accommodate the opportunity to be able to use property taxes to fund the transportation needs, then we want to make sure that the maximum millage rate that we list on the trim notice accommodates that higher rate. So we'll talk about that on August 3rd. Um, August 23rd is the date that the property appraiser will be mailing the trim notices out. August 24th is the date that we'll bring forward the local option fuel tax ordinance. 
uh, seeking your support for what's proposed as a five cent increase to that tax. And the reason we're doing it on August 24th ahead of the adoption of the budget is so that we know definitively, are we or are we not going to need to use the millage rate to be able to address that need. So moving into September, the tentative budget will be posted to the website on September 7th, two days ahead of the public hearing. And then on September 21st, we'll adopt the FY22 millage rates and budgets and fiscal year 22 will start on, on October 1st. And with that, the last thing I just wanna do is say thank you to our departments, our independent agencies, our constitutional officers, all of you for the feedback you provide all the time um, to county administration and Barry for the support they provide to the budget office. Um, but I personally wanna just thank uh, the entire budget office for the work they do every day. Uh, you've seen the budget document, you have a copy of it. It's about yay thick. Um, you could use it for weightlifting if you wanted to. Um, it's got a lot of information that doesn't come easily. Um, but it's through all those partnerships and it's through the work of the budget office every day and all the 30 people we have in there to make that happen. And in particular, I wanna thank Cecilia McCorkle, um, our operating budget manager, uh, for the Herculean efforts she's made over the past year uh, and not only performing her regular role, but also helping us implement Questica, our new budget software, which is enabling us to do even better work than we were able to before. And we also want to thank Bill. You know, um, you go through these budgets, $2.7 billion, and the amount of institutional knowledge, history, options, alternatives, things that he brings to the table every day, it's going to be a, a huge loss, you know, in terms of knowledge, institutional knowledge, um, and just the way he approaches the budget every day, his collaboration with departments. Um, it's going to be a huge loss, but we do wish him the very best. He's not going away yet. We've got more to say about that, but this is his last budget initial presentation. We just want to thank him for all of his work. <laughs> we, we thought about that. Uh, about five, ten minutes ago, you had some... Um, nice paragraph that you were talking. You were speaking about the overall approach to this budget. And, you, and it was quite eloquent, but I was trying to follow it carefully. And I think that would be something to think back through and write out again, because I think it, it helps synopsize a lot of stuff that we've heard today um, as, we, as, we, as we have to communicate these these preliminary, uh, um, I guess, reactions to your budget proposal. Um, and there's a general theme behind it. I thought you did a nice job of articulating. But anyway. Go, and there. as you look at the transmittal letter, you'll see kind of that theme. And I think the, the real theme is transparency in the budget. We said what we were going to do. We said we were going to reduce costs but increase reserves as a buffer to the economy. And we want to deliver on what we promised. We kept our costs down. We didn't spend that money. Um, and so now we're trying to uh, do a budget that reflects that promise. Um, and so I, I think you'll see that. We've also segregated a fund. Somebody says, well, why do you increase it over here to increase it over here? Well, we've tried to outline that. This is a user fee. We kept it that way. It all share, so shares with our cities because if you're in a city and you're driving down a road, that may be a city road that they have to pave and those costs have went up. And so we wanted to be able to share in that. But again, we, we've outlined it a couple of different ways. We presented it. We have some options available to us. So we can, you know, slice and dice it. This is our, our initial budget proposal. We have the next two months to figure that out, work collaboratively with you. Be happy to prepare any options, alternatives that you'd like us to, to prepare and present back to you um, to where we can ultimately make a, a good final budget decision. Yeah. And, and, and obviously that August 3rd meeting, which will be a workshop, is, is going to be an important meeting. And yes. I think that's going to be, I mean, I always tell people that when it comes to September, it's, you know, it's, I mean, changes can happen, especially right. that first meeting in September, but they, it's hard to incorporate changes at that point. This is the time, this meeting, which is really about presentation, not really changes, but the next couple of three weeks and that meeting that you're talking about are where the real critical cha uh, changes or directions going to have to be given. It, that, that's correct, Commissioner. 
yeah, August is the time. We again, we'll be happy to. I, you know, this is a budget recommendation. It's your budget. You know, and so where you want to take that from here, we'll be happy to help you get there. Yeah. Any comments before we? And this as a whirlwind, obviously, of information delivered um, and still sorting through all that. And I'm sure you're going to have several different thoughts and several different ideas. And but we'll be back in touch for sure. Anything else before we? Uh, well, I guess we're not finished yet. So <laughs> let's let's go ahead. Barry, did you have anything else under your part? That's the end of my county administrative report. I think that's enough. Okay, and then um, under item 36, we have reappointment of, of the uh, Parks and Conservation Resources Advisory Board. I think there are three applicants, but only two are qualified. That's correct, Mr. Chair. we are appointing Chair. two. Correct. Okay, and I know you have ballots for us, but I think we can probably handle that. Sounds good. Um, did you have a comment, question? Ready to make a motion? Yes, please. We move the appointment of Ms. Cross and Ms. Wilhelm for the Parks and Conservation Resource Advisory Board. Second. Second by Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And then item 37, anything pertinent, pertinent and timely and short? <laughs> we have about 15 minutes or so. Uh, we'll probably go to about 6.10. It's 20 till 6 now. And we'll start the meeting back at 6.10. They'll give us a half hour to get some food and, um, and then kind of regroup. All right. Seeing nothing, we are adjourned.
got <coughs> five or six public hearings and varying uh, lengths of estimated time, so we've got a lot to do here tonight. So we're going to go ahead and get started with item 38, our countywide planning authority. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Agenda item number 38 is the first of two public hearings regarding a proposed ordinance amending the countywide rules to create a senior housing bonus. It also revises the map adjustment process and includes other minor housekeeping changes. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Okay. All right. Who is up for Lisa Fisher with Ford Pinellas? If Lisa would come up and she'll provide a staff overview. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Uh, this is a package of proposed rules amendments in response to input from our local government partners and uh, the private sector. Uh, the two major uh, topics of the amendments are the creation of a senior housing bonus and uh, revising the uh, provisions for map adjustments. Um, and then we're also uh, proposing just a few housekeeping items and I'll talk briefly about each one. Um, beginning with the senior housing bonus. Uh, senior housing uh, covers a variety of different living types that are designed to meet the needs of aging residents. Um, that can include independent apartments, assisted living facilities, nursing homes, uh, and a range of care in between. There are even some developments known as a continuing care retirement communities that offer all of those types of care on one campus. So there are a lot of innovative housing options uh, for senior residents, but as our population continues to grow older, uh, we're gonna need more of this type of housing to help meet their needs. So we're proposing to allow local governments to incentivize senior housing uh, by offering a density or intensity bonus um, the bonus can be measured in residential units per acre, in residential equivalent beds per acre. Um, that's normally used for more institutional settings like nursing homes. Uh, or it can be measured by floor area ratio or any combination of those elements. So it's designed to be flexible to meet the needs of each community. Um, and it's similar to how we've structured the bonuses we have today for affordable housing and missing middle housing. The local government would need to adopt definitions uh, and a methodology for applying the bonus. Um, we're also uh, encouraging the senior housing to be designed in a way that uh, promotes physical activity appropriate to the ability level of the, the residents being served. And the bonus is not able to be used in the coastal high hazard area where we prohibit a lot of these uses from locating anyway. So that's the first proposed amendment. Um, the second topic is the map adjustment process. The process governs changes to the preservation and recreation open space categories or submerged lands that either occur naturally or are permitted by the state agency with jurisdiction, which in our case is the Southwest Florida Water Management District. Since these changes are just following the determination of the state agency, they don't require discretion by the Forward Pinellas Board or the Countywide Planning Authority. So they occur outside of the normal map amendment process and they don't require public hearings. Um, we get a lot of questions about the section of the rules. There's a lot of confusion about what qualifies. So uh, the purpose of these, uh, this particular amendment is to make this process clearer and easier to use. Uh, first, we wanna clarify that the map adjustment process is primarily about reflecting existing conditions it's not for future wetland mitigation plans or anything subjective. These are just ministerial changes. Secondly, we'd like to clarify how the adjustments are processed. The countywide rules classifies map adjustments as administrative actions that can be performed by staff. But then it also requires the Ford Pinellas Board and CPA to take a vote of official acceptance before they can be finalized. So that also creates some confusion and it adds weeks to the process for what uh, should really be a routine action. So we're proposing to revise the process to work more like other types of administrative actions in the rules where staff is able to finalize them and then report them afterward as an informational item. So that's the second proposed amendment. The last group of amendments are just a few minor housekeeping items. We're proposing to clean up some redundancy with our provisions for submerged lands. 
Uh, the same language appears in multiple places in the rules, so we'd just like to consolidate those. We'd like to more clearly state a couple of procedural points for continuances and withdrawals of MAP amendments um, and uh, the number of days required between public hearings for text amendments like this one. Uh, there's no substantive changes uh, in that. We'd just like to better reflect what we already do. And then lastly, we had a request from a couple of local governments uh, to add animal boarding and veterinary clinics to the definition of agricultural light. Uh, they're currently classified with heavier agricultural uses. This change would allow them to locate in more land use categories, of course, at the discretion of the local jurisdiction. And uh, our staff didn't see any, any issue with that request. So those are the proposed housekeeping amendments. Okay. Um, overall, for this package of amendments, we've had a unanimous recommendation for approval from both the Planners Advisory Committee and the Forward Pinellas Board. Um, we do require two public hearings of the Countywide Planning Authority. This is the first, and we anticipate that the second one will be scheduled for August 10th. So that is my presentation. If there are any questions about these proposed amendments, I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions on the proposed amendments? Okay. I don't see any, and um, uh, I think we are are good to go, and we are not going to be taking a vote tonight since we'll be coming back. When do we come back for the second? August 10th. August 10th, okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, we'll move on to item 39. Kat? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Agenda item number... <clears throat> Excuse me. Agenda item number 39 is a proposed ordinance providing for the repeal of section 126-1 of the Pinellas County Code relating to the vesting of title to potable water lines, sanitary sewer lines, and storm drainage facilities in public easements and rights of way. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. I would ask Megan to come up and explain this one. <laughs> sure, and good evening, Commissioners. Megan Ross, Director of Utilities. So as this is a fairly straightforward repeal uh, in working with the county attorney to clean up some of our ordinance language uh, for utilities. It was determined that uh, this ordinance just sort of conflicts with our existing right-of-way permitting process. So uh, we concluded that it's, it's just redundant and unnecessary, and uh, we're recommending a repeal of this language. Okay, thank you. It's pretty straightforward. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. A motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Flowers. <clears throat> All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 40. Agenda item number 40 is a legislative petition to vacate. This was submitted by Robert W. Morgan for the south 30-foot wide portion of the 54th Avenue North right-of-way. It's lying north of and adjacent to lot seven of the Orange Estates of St. Petersburg, first edition. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Hello. The, the, are you are you Robert? Yes. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. I've been on the property, um, uh, the home I bought, uh, a little over 20 years, and I've just been taking care of the property that's around me, and I use it as more or less uh, green space, and that's all I use it for. But I did put in, and I have been taking care of it at my expense for a little over 20 years, and I have put water on it to keep it green. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Appreciate it. And we have a staff coming up for a, a okay. short presentation, and then we'll get back to you if we have any questions. All right. Thank Thanks. You. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Blake Lyon. I'm the Director of Building and Development Review Services. I have a brief presentation uh, for you this evening just to orient you a little bit to the uh, property that's in front of us. I'm Let's see if this is working. Um, oh, sorry, it's jumping too fast now. All right. The property is located in an unincorporated portion of Seminole, uh, just north of kind of the Bay Pines uh, transition where it bends into Seminole Boulevard. 
Um, one point of clarification that I wanted to provide for you on this slide, the right of way in, a, in its entirety is 90 feet. What's being asked for uh, vacation is the southern 30 most feet of it, which would leave a 60 foot right of way intact uh, should the petition be granted. Um, it is on the western side of 54th, so it's not the 54th that you often identify with the Lelman community. So this is on the west side over in the unincorporated portion of Seminole. Um, what you'll see here on the exhibit in front of you, the subject property is outlined in red, the lower portion of it there. The upper portion has the uh, blue rectangle with the yellow hashed mark. So what you see is the actual roadway improvements are on the northern side of that 90 feet of right of way. Um, and so it's, it's in, the, in the upper portion of that image. The other part that I wanted to mention here is as you look at 54th Avenue as it extends uh, as a corridor, it is at 80 or 90 feet for the majority of that corridor. There are about 13 properties between Seminole Boulevard and 100th Way that um, have yet to be acquired, but the county has not acquired the rest of the right of way. So it, it is a little bit smaller uh, in those particular areas. But as you begin to see uh, it progress on the west side of Seminole Way, it, it does extend to the full width of the right of way. And it is part of the county's comprehensive plan to uh, widen this particular section to an 80 foot right of way. So that's uh, one of the reasons for the objections proposed later. So these are just general uh, kind of visualizations from, um, from the local community. One of the things that I would like to, to point out in this context is you'll see both in the image on the left and the right, um, the one on the right has the numbers of the lots. So, so you'll see lots one through seven that are on the south side of 54th and they have a consistent kind of building frontage. All the buildings kind of line up, all the property lines line up. Those are the areas where the right of way is in full tact, where it is a full 90 feet of right of way. But you begin to see on the far left of that image uh, where it does uh, jog out a little bit. And so there are areas and that becomes a little bit more apparent um, and when you see some of this. There are utilities in the area. The blue line that you see that runs north and south uh, at 102nd is a water line that's there and it continues along um, to the west on the northern side of 54th. And then there are uh, two different uh, sewer lines in the area. One's a local main and then the other one's a transmission line. The one that's a little bit brighter and bolder is the, is the transmission line. So part of the concern uh, that has been expressed from this vacation request is the proximity to the utilities. And when we talk about right of way, that's certainly the area where we are allowed to do and perform the necessary work. And, and I just would remind you in general, when we talk about some of the utility work, uh, we have to look at the separation between the utilities, between the storm and the, uh, excuse me, between the sewer and the water, but also the area that's necessary to perform that work. Uh, and in this case, we have the opportunity to do so without necessarily impeding on the vehicular roadway traffic. So that is something of, of particular concern. I won't belabor you with these larger community views. We'll get into that a little bit more. But just to give you a little bit of an idea here, um, what we're, we're standing at the corner of 102nd and 54th, looking at the uh, petitioner's property there in the, in the left side of the image. And you'll see that the roadway is um, set back almost about uh, 60 feet from where the property line is. So that's the 30 feet is kind of where the left of the two uh, utility poles are in that vicinity, in that area. And as uh, Mr. Morgan had mentioned to you, he uses a lot of this area for vegetation and, and landscaping and so forth. Uh, as we proceed around to 54th, looking a little bit more towards the south perspective, you see again some of that vegetation. It's, it's a mixture of different vegetation types. Uh, there's some palms in there, there's some uh, bamboo in there. You can see kind of the overhead utilities running through that area as well. And then this is looking um, basically back towards the, the southeast uh, subject property being kind of in the, in the upper right hand corner of the photo. Um, we have queried all the different departments. There were objections um, from our utilities department, again, with respect to the issues 
uh, with the existing utilities, the water and sewer that's there. We also had some concern from our housing and community development department, in particular the planning division, because the comprehensive plan does call for a widening of that particular roadway. And then our public works department had some concerns about um, giving up that right away because of the need for stormwater in those areas, uh, sidewalk, pedestrian refuge, and some other potential concerns. But as you expressed in previous considerations, these are future plan projects, not something that's um, currently under construction or, or being planned. Um, Bright House, which is now Spectrum, it also indicate that if there are any utilities in the area that they would need the property owner to pay for any relocations that would have to occur there. Um, this is a little bit of an interesting one. As you may know, we're transitioning a little bit of the petition to vacate, so I'll be coming back in front of you um, for the foreseeable future on these types of things. This is a project that initially came into the county back in 2018. It was being processed accordingly. Um, there was no desire to move forward at that point in time, so the file was actually closed in 2019. And then uh, January of this year, there was a desire to reopen it again, so we're now back in front of you trying to address this issue. So that's why you see a little bit of the, the delay in the timeline. So, uh, yeah, yes. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Blake. Before you get too much further into your presentation, I heard you mention that you were, it was part of the comprehensive plan and you were anticipating needing to have access to the area. When, do you have any idea at all when you are talking about have, needing to have access? They do, the, the comprehensive plan typically is, is looking at it at a 20 or 30 year horizon, so it is a substantial duration. Uh, as I mentioned, typically what happens is you put it in the comprehensive plan to look at those longer term planning horizons, and then ultimately it goes into the CIP schedule, that looks at a slightly smaller time frame, like a 10 year horizon, and then you start designing projects. So to the best of my knowledge, uh, look at Sorry. Yep. Sorry. She's catching me. <laughs> yep, sorry about that. Um, no, we, we actually just finished the 54th Avenue and Trail um, drainage project, which is the ultimate outfall in this area where the water drains to. So we start, you know, from that location, we replaced the box culvert. That construction was just completed, and I believe that final change order has either already come to you or it's uh, on an, um, an agenda here soon. We have a planned project from 104th Way that runs um, from west to east to 98th Way across to 54th Avenue North to fix drainage problems in and around the Keswick School there. It's both roadway and sidewalk drainage issues. Um, there's also a proposal to put a, um, a sidewalk on the southern side of that road. So um, that is, uh, it is in our, in our capital plan. It is not programmed for funding, but it is in our capital plan to do that because we had to finish the, the 54th Avenue um, uh, drainage project in the, to the trail first. So again, your capital plan does it have an end date to it or a start date? We, we, these, the projects that we have currently budgeted are for the next six years, but okay. this, one is, this one is high on our list because we've had, we have a long history of drainage issues in this area and complaints from the school. Thank you. Oh, and yeah, I should have mentioned the schools uh, on the north side of 54th, right across from the subject property. Commissioner Gerard. So 54th runs from <clears throat> Seminole Boulevard to 113th or Doomy. Yes. And at, at one point, closer to Doomy, it's wider than it is here. Well, not there. Yeah, sorry, I can put it back up. But yes, it is, um, when you begin to look at the corridor across the board, uh, in most places it's, it's either 90 or 80 feet wide. Um, in, there's all but, uh, so you can, this is um, 100, 100th way is the north-south road that you're looking, that's to the right third of the image there. Hmm. Um, Seminole Boulevard would be further to the left side of this image hmm. off, off the screen. But what you see is the, that area between basically 113th or Doomy and Seminole has the full uh, corridor intact. Um, when you get to the section between Seminole and 100th way, 
it's all but 13 properties that have the full right of way and it's it's only those basically the majority of them are to the to the west of this subject property and so part of what the county's position is they're trying to create that full corridor with and establish that we do have a little bit more work to do to that front so we don't want to necessarily backtrack and start vacating a portion of that because we're getting closer to completing that whole corridor i say that that corridor gets a surprising amount of traffic between those two roads it's oh keswick never thought of that okay. so Blake, um, on that um, uh, number, th uh, I think it's page three where you have the uh, cross hatched, I guess it's the vacation request. Yes, sir. Um, just want to make sure I understand that. So, so it's, it's a 90 foot right away at this location. They're basically asking for the southern third, the southern 30 feet of, of that. That hatch area there is 30 feet? That, yes. Okay. And you're, you're saying that the entire 30 feet is what, you're not sure how much of it you'll need. The, the comp plan requests a, a, a corridor of 80 feet. The majority of that corridor, to, to my comments to Commissioner Gerard, was that it's 90 feet in most instances. You know, Kelly's efforts and the, and the public works efforts to design that road haven't been completed yet, as she described. So we, would, we wouldn't know entirely how much of that 90 feet would be necessary and so that's one of the concerns about vacating it is if that's needed for the stormwater as kelly mentioned sidewalk pedestrian refuge other places we feel like it would be premature to vacate this portion given that we have the majority of the corridor intact and so later when it's ever done um, then whatever we can vacate we did this on remember those right. that alley discussion that we had over in Palm Harbor where you just vacated the whole alley right. because you didn't have any need for it. There's a possibility down the road that some of this may not be needed. And is certainly one of the options that's available for your consideration is if it like we did with for example the Mueller vacation, if we want to do a right away utilization permit for the existing vegetation that's there. The biggest difference between this and, and, and that project is that there, weren't, there aren't the raised planters, they're not the physical stuff that's uh, posing the, the threat to the vehicular stuff. This is just some of the vegetation and it's pulled back a fair bit from the right of way, or from the roadway improvements. So we can, we can certainly work with Mr. Morgan about um, you know, the, a right of way utilization permit while you know, while the county is not, doesn't have an immediate need, and then if there's a desire to exercise that, plan a project, design a project, then, then that permit can be effectively revoked and, okay. and retain that right of way. We're just concerned that we don't want to lose the actual right of way responsibility. That's the primary concern from the staff's perspective. Okay, did you have a question, Commissioner, Commissioner Flowers? Thank you, sir. Um, just a question. Um, I didn't see anywhere where he has any intention on building any structure or expanding anything onto this property from his property. Is that correct? He just wants to keep it as green space? I spoke with him as recently as yesterday, and that's my understanding is that he just wants to be able to maintain his, his landscaping and vegetation there. Yeah. Jewel, is there anything that says that we couldn't expouse this right of way to him um, with the condition that he seed? Um, the ability for the county to come in and make any stormwater drainage improvements uh, if and when needed? Um, it, Since he has no intention on putting any structure there. Well, once you vacate the right-of-way, ownership does transfer to him, and there would be no guarantee to the county that no structure would be built there short of it going through permitting um, and other natural processes. Um, I would discourage us from trying to kind of make that sort of decision on the fly here tonight because certainly if we were to try to strike that kind of agreement, we would need to make sure that we had um, proper legal documents in, in place to, to assure our right to that property. Um, you know, worst case scenario, if we were to vacate it and then need it, we would have to condemn it okay. to get it back. And then my final question is, since he's been apparently grooming this, this area, 
um, should he not receive his vacation this evening, then we're on notice for being responsible for making sure then that we're keeping um, this area groomed, cut, trimmed back or whatever, because it is right there on the corner. And the growth of those, uh, the growth, any growth on that corner could hinder someone's ability to see around the corner. I'm assuming we've not been doing that since he said he's been doing it. Right. Okay. To the extent that there's an impact to the site visibility triangle, which is the term of art we use, um, then yes, there would need to be, you know, that would need to be maintained. Um, that's where the offer comes in if you wanted to do the right of way utilization permit, where if we wanted to give Mr. Morgan the ability to continue that maintenance, have an agreement and some effectively authority to have that, uh, those improvements in that area, then that would be a mechanism to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any anybody else with questions? Anything else, Blake? No, that's okay. it. Um, let me bring back Mr. Morgan if you'd like to come back now that now that staff has, has spoken. I don't know if you had anything else to add. It's just that the gentleman across the street from me um, vacated his property just recently within the last two or three years, and that's when I started to do this property. Um, directly across the street, you're yes. saying? Yes, okay. same, same uh, 102nd Street on the corner of 102nd and 54th. I'll have staff respond to that. Anything else that you'd like to speak up, say? No. Other than I know what your request is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Um, so if you're not planning on developing it in some way and you're basically going to keep it the same way it is now, what is the impetus for having it uh, ceded to you? Well, What's the just, reason, I guess? It just makes sense that if I'm taking care of it and I put in a water system all the way over actually to 54th Street, so I take care of the whole corner. And, it, and then I was told that I could possibly have the 30 feet from uh, to add on to my property line. Okay, Commissioner Long. Yes, well, uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. I'm just a little curious. I was going back here in the timeline that Blake was talking about, and it looks like back in 18 or 19 or, yeah, and um, in 19, you started a review to do this before, and then, and then you decided not to. What was the no? Reason? It's um, I had some deaths in the family. I'm sorry. And they took priority, of course. And I was taking care of an elderly aunt that lives in the same neighborhood. And then the pandemic came along. So. All right. I was just curious. Thank you for that. I'm sorry about the. That's all right. The death in your family. Anybody, thank you. anybody else, any questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Morgan. Thank appreciate you. it. I appreciate it. Are your comments, Blake, on his, his statement? Yeah, if I, if I could uh, ask that we put the presentation back up and I'll draw your attention to uh, slide number four, um, which is the, let me see if I can, oh, there it is. Okay, so um, you can see the in the teal colored uh, rectangle, that's the area in the, in the image that's on the right of the screen. That's the area that Mr. Morgan has requested to vacate directly across the, uh, to the east of 102nd Way. And I see if I can use the pointer. So it's this portion of the right of way uh, that was vacated. And in, in our records indicate that it was uh, 30 feet that was also vacated in 2014. Uh, so a little bit more than than a couple years ago that was referenced, but um, it does predate me, so I don't know all the specific circumstances. I've been trying to research what the um, what the particular interest was, but it, in, it was in fact that that one property was vacated. So that's one of the 13 uh, that exist that have a shorter um, or a, a smaller right of way through that. Those those three properties that there that make up the block between um, 102nd and what ultimately is a is a hundred way over here um, have a smaller 60-foot right-of-way. So you can see that portion that was vacated 
um, and then the two adjacent properties to the to the east. And then there's about um, 10 of them. If this photo were to continue here to the west, uh, 10 of them from this point over that also have this the narrower right of way. And so part of what we were trying to do in, in querying the different departments that are involved is we understand that particular issue occurred in 2014. They don't want to replicate that. We'd really like to, um, again, reestablish the full width of the corridor and move forward that way. You have seven lots here that it looks like when you get to the west, it also goes back to 30 feet. Yes. So it yes, when you get to the when you get to the west of lot one here. Right. So there's yes, that also goes back. So like I said, if this if this photo were to continue further here to the west, um, you'd see that that right of way line roughly in that location. Um, so there are from from Seminole Boulevard to a hundredth way, there are thirteen properties that have the 60-foot right-of-way as opposed to the 90-foot right-of-way. And so um, to, to the earlier Public Works comments, we know that we would have to go through, if we were trying to do a full roadway improvement that included storm drain, we would have to address those 13, uh, you know, at that time. Um, all right, well, again, it's, we've already started down that road, apparently. It's, it, well, we haven't, you know. let me be clear, we haven't vacated all those other ones. The only one that's been vacated is the one that Mr. Morgan's referring to. Is understand, just I that. understand, but there's more than just that property that. Correct. There, in the entire corridor, 13, there are 13. Out of how many? If I had to venture guess, 70, 80, okay. some, somewhere in that range. A, what I would consider a significant number. You, yeah. You're, you know. I, I, anyway, this is very uncomfortable because it, we've already, again, I'm not, I, I'm not sure why we need the full 30, number one. Number two, we've got precedent already. I don't mean precedent as in vacating, but precedent as in the road is already narrower on right of way. Correct. And that's, and that's the challenge that we have when we identify the corridor uh, at 80 feet, oh. we know we're going to have to do some property acquisition if we're going to achieve that standard throughout. So part of the direction that the all right. When I got you. I got you. Any, any, any other? Go ahead, Commissioner Gerard. Thank you. Uh, just a comment, though. If, it, if I was Mr. Morgan, I'd be concerned about the idea that I would have to pay to relocate those utilities that are there. If he, if he had ownership of the property, he'd be the one that would be responsible for moving the. <laughs> and let me tell you, it's not cheap. I mean, anything we do having to do with moving utilities is ridiculously expensive. So. Agreed. <laughs> okay. Any Thank other you. questions? Yeah. Um, I, I think I understood it correctly when the petitioner stated he's already put a water system, so I'm assuming a sprinkler system or extended that PVC piping out so that he's watering that using a sprinkler system, which I'm not sure if that system extends into the 30 feet right away that we're talking about for proposed use for the county if and when that happens, which means when we dig it up, that's coming up too. Yeah. Um, so I kind of wish he had done that, but you know, that's neither that's kind of hindsight for 2020 um, at this point. But I do understand, Mr. Chair, your, your point that um, this may be a, a bit of a concern for all the additional property owners along yeah. this way. Hey, Blake, real quick, uh, well, I'm sorry. Uh, the right-of-way utilization permit that you talked about where they can use the, use the right-of-way for a period of time, uh, what do they need to do for that? Uh, it's a fairly straightforward process. So it's an application that shows how they want to indicate it. We would, to Commissioner Flowers' point of view, we want to indicate what irrigation lines are so we just know what improvements have been made. But it's just an opportunity to use that. We would probably put some stipulations on there that there's no structural development in that area, no retaining walls, no, no buildings of that sort. But it would give them the opportunity to, to use that property for the landscaping, for the irrigation purposes, up until the point where the county had a project in, in mind. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, what's the uh, what's the will of the commission? Can we have a variance? Oh, yeah, you, did you something? I don't think you need an eighth commissioner, but uh, I mean, you know, it's hard enough to do property acquisition when you're doing a project. It delays projects forever. Um, and, you know, regardless of the one property being there, we have property to be able to do a proper project. And we have a planned project. So many other times we're coming to you and saying, well, someday we might have a project. This one's one where we know it would, obviously, I, you know, you'd like to not set a precedent for this, these properties um, to where after we could evaluate it. And Blake has a good option for them to be able to utilize the property through a right away, right away utilization permit. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the staff's recommendation to deny the petition to vacate the right of way and that I see to staff that they enter into uh, communications or negotiations with the petitioner um, for the ability for him to utilize the right of way until such time that the county deems it necessary to begin its um, stormwater sewer project on this property. Second. We have a motion, and did you get that in a second? Any other comments? So, um, all in favor of the motion to deny the vacation and to direct staff to enter discussions about the right of way utilization permit, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, we move on to item 41. Mr. Chair, agenda item number 41 is the second of two public hearings for case number ZLU-21-01. This is an application of Noel Family LLC for a land use change from residential suburban and preservation to residential low and preservation and a zoning change from RA, which is residential agriculture, and R3, which is single family residential, to R5CO, which is urban residential conditional overlay, and PC, which is preservation conservation. Since this is a quasi-judicial hearing, all those individuals who plan to speak on this item must be sworn in. Um, so for those wishing to speak, whether you're in the Magnolia room or you're in one of our overflow rooms, if you're able, if you could please raise your right hand. And then do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth signify by saying I do. I do. Thank you. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Uh, 43 comments and several petitions with a total of 5,405 signatures in opposition have been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay, thank you. All right, staff presentation. Hi, right, good evening. Michael Schoderbach, Principal Planner with the Housing and Community Development Department. And this is the uh, second time uh, you're hearing this case. Uh, first was back in April. Uh, just go over a little bit of the request. The subject area is approximately 21 and a half acres. It covers four vacant parcels in Palm Harbor. The request is a future land use map amendment from residential suburban and preservation to residential low and preservation and a zoning atlas amendment from residential agriculture and R3 single family residential to R5-CO, which is urban residential with a conditional overlay and PC preservation conservation. The proposed use is a single family attached subdivision, which is limited by conditional overlay. I'll go over those conditions in a, in a little bit here. So just some background, uh, the board approved the future land use transmittal ordinance on April 27th and took no action on the rezoning at that time. Staff submitted to the state agency for review. We received no objection letters from all state agencies. Also, uh, we sent it to Ford Pinellas. This is a tier one amendment and we received uh, favorable that it, it was a tier one amendment approved by Ford Pinellas. Uh, the applicant also met with the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary representatives between this time to discuss the proposal. Uh, they can speak more on that. Uh, county staff was not involved within that meeting. And that leads us here today uh, at the public hearing. Again, it's the second hearing for the future land use ordinance and the first for the zoning resolution. 
the conditional overlay uh, request. The conditions have changed since the last time. The original one was just a maximum of 70 one-story villas or 78 two-story townhomes. The proposed new conditions that have come back, they've reduced the number of units to 68, still keeping either a one-story villa or two-story townhome development, but capping both at 68 units. They've also included a minimum of a 20-foot setback from the western property line. That's the boundary that runs along the Pinellas Trail. And also a minimum of a five-foot landscape buffer with a 30% opacity planting along the western property line and the installation of an eight-foot tall fence, opaque fence, along that western property line. And that's all the, uh, the line that's against the Pinellas Trail. You can see the property outlined here in red, the 21 and a half acres. There's, you see the two boxes, the largest one is the three parcels on the south that are zoned residential agriculture, and the smaller box on the north side is the property zoned R3, all with the land use of residential, suburban, and preservation. The area is located in the general area of the south, southeast of the intersection of Klosterman Road and Alternate 19. The property is at the southern terminus of Pleasant Avenue. Uh, you access from Roberts Road off of Klosterman, turns into Pleasant, which then dead ends at the street, or off of Alternate 19 via Valley Street to Pleasant down to the property. Uh, the property is surrounded on the east and south by the Innisbrook Golf Course. On the west side runs the Pinellas Trail, runs there adjacent to the property. If we go west of that, which is to the left, you have the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary adjacent to the property on the other side of the trail. Just north of that is an auto-oriented business vehicle repair. And to the north of the property is the small subdivision. There's about, uh, let me get here, 34 units within that area. That's along Pleasant Valley Street and Roberts Road. They're, they're all contained zonings of RA, residential agriculture, residential rural, and most are, are residential uh, single family R3 with a land use of RS, which is two and a half units an acre. And with those, the acreage and the 34 homes, it's developed roughly at about 2.3 acres in there. You can see the zoning and future land use map. On the left is the current. On the right is the proposed. The lighter yellow of the property, residential suburban, and then the darker is the residential low. The dark green is preservation. You can see the current is it's like a boxy shape. That was an approximation uh, when the maps were created, the land use maps. On the proposed is a little bit different. That is based on a wetland jurisdiction line that was performed by the applicant, which more accurately reflect, reflects where preservation area is on this property. You can see the directly to the north, the land use residential suburban. The differing land uses as you go <coughs> off to the uh, upper right is residential low, five units an acre. And then when you cross to the west across alternate 19, you have a mixture from residential low of five units an acre all the way up to residential medium, which allows 15 units an acre. The lighter green is rec open space, which is for the golf course and the Pinellas Trail. The Suncoast Primate Sanctuary and the other non-residential use um, just opposite of the trail is institutional. It's just a closer look at the subject site. You can see vacant, it's a wooded site, Pinellas Trail, Primate Sanctuary on the very top, and then that's alternate 19. There's a like a little small piece of property that a little like looks like an alley between the the red to the far right. Yeah. yeah. Little, what is that? Who owns that? There is a 15 foot right of way. That's county right of way mm -hmm. in between the R3 portion and the RA portion. The applicant also seeks to uh, vacate that portion of the right of way as well on a different part process. 
Here's some pictures. Uh, the left one is looking south at the subject site from Pleasant Avenue. It's right where it terminates into the property. And just another view of the subject site on the right. Then we're looking west towards Alt 19 from the intersection of Valley Road and Pleasant Avenue. And then the picture on the right, we're looking north from the subject site along Pleasant Avenue. And these photos are both uh, from the trail. First one is looking east at the subject site from the Pinellas Trail, and then swinging around and looking west at the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary from the Pinellas Trail. And this is the Pinellas Trail crossing at Valley Road. The first picture on the left is looking towards alternate 19. The second picture on the right is looking south along the Pinellas Trail. What's the one on the left again? I'm sorry. Is looking towards alternate 19, right at the trail crossing, okay. Valley yeah. Road. Yeah. That second stop sign in the distance is alternate 19. Do you have a picture of the, uh, from Alt 19 to the trail um, no. at south of Alderman or south of Klosterman? No, I do not. And do you have an estimate on the number of cars that can queue up between Alt 19 and the... So between here and the trail? Yeah, between the, between Alt 19 and the trail. It's, the, a, it's a estimating on uh, our GIS is about 80 feet, so about 40 cars, or four cars, okay. not 40, four cars <laughs> could queue there. If you look at it, about 20 feet per car. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go, Commissioner. Um, going back to the, the um, double slide that you have looking east at subject site from Pinellas Trail and looking west, I'm sorry the slides weren't numbered. Yes, this um, one looking, here? Yes, looking west at the Sun Coast Primate, that is the Primate Center and the only thing that's buffering the Primate Center from the trail is those trees? There is, yes, there's these, these trees here. So from the trail, you have this vegetation. And then from that trail, Moving on to the roadway, alternate 19, the only buffer is just those few trees that buffer between alternate 19 and the trail. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because I know a concern that was raised was about the noise, <clears throat> but I really don't see anything. As, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see in this picture on the right uh, that red and white building, that's the building just north of the primate sanctuary. So then those, as you get into the trees there, just behind them, uh, this is where the primate sanctuary starts. So this is a table of the proposed acreage change since it involves both land use and zoning. Um, with the land use change with the wetland jurisdiction done, uh, the property would gain a little over an acre, about 1.4 acres of preservation, lose about the same you know, of upland acreage. And then we they're looking at the R5 and also the preservation conservation zoning, which would correspond with the preservation land use. Um, real quick on that, say you had another t added onto that table under the proposed change with the overlay you said there were 68 units. Yes. With the existing zoning that we have in place today, that so in other words, they did they would need any change done. What kind of units could they could they build? So, as it sits today, yeah. today's land use and zoning, they could build 12 units: one on the R3 zone property and 11 on the RA zone property. If the land use was left the same and a zoning change was made for smaller lot sizes, the maximum by the land use is 42 units for the residential suburban. Plus, you could pull one unit per acre off the preservation to build in the upland, so five units to for a total of 47. And if the proposed land use amendment was done and the zoning change without a conditional overlay, that maximum is 82 units. I got you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Probably come back to that a couple times. Sure. 
So the proposed R5 district that they're asking for promotes flexible site design, allows for smaller minimum lot sizes and, and setbacks, uh, ideal for, for flexible uh, subdivision development. Again, the conditional overlay will limit the density maximum of 68 residential units, which comes out to about 3.2 units an acre. Without the conditional overlay, 82 residential would be allowed. For traffic, this approval could generate about 394 daily trips with the proposed 68 units. It will not change the level of service on surrounding roadways. Alternate 19 is a deficient roadway with a level of service of F. However, we did receive no objection from the Florida Department of Transportation. The applicant did meet separately with uh, the Florida Department of Transportation, and they've come up with some proposals uh, that they've agreed with to do with uh, uh, if the development was approved, which is the installation of a southbound left turn lane from alternate 19 onto Valley Road. And the applicant is also proposing some off-site sidewalk installation from their site up Pleasant Avenue on the Valley Road to the Pinellas Trail. And staff finds that the proposed amendments are appropriate. The surrounding area is a mix of residential, commercial, and recreation uses. It's bordered on three sides by recreation open space, the Pinellas Trail and the golf course. The Pinellas Trail plus the increased on-site landscape buffer and setbacks will provide a significant buffering to the adjacent non-residential uses on the opposite side of the trail. This is also consistent with our comprehensive plan and the countywide plan. And both the DRC staff and the LPA have both recommended approval. Okay. And I'd be happy to answer any questions the board has. Any questions at this time? Okay, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Could you just, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could you just walk through again the numbers that you gave us a, a second ago? If we, if we reject everything tonight, what can they do? If we do the land use, what can they do? If we do the land use and the zoning, what can they do? Sure. Yeah, if you rejected everything tonight, 12 units. One on that R3 zone property, 11 on the RA zone properties. If the land use was left the same, residential, suburban, and the zoning was approved, they could go up to 42 units, plus pull five units from the preservation and for a total of 47. And if you got rid of the conditional overlay and approved just the land use and zoning, they could do up to 82 units. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think that should just kind of be always a chart. Because yeah. it's always like the first question we always ask. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Before I start our, my time, um, I believe we have a PowerPoint, so I wanted to see if we could uh, prime that and make sure that I am sufficiently able to navigate it. And also, before I start my time, just so you know, we do have several expert witnesses with us that will not all be testifying in our uh, presentation, but are available for answering any questions that you have, uh, including Michael Yates, who's our transportation expert, our parking study expert, uh, and Carrie Kelly, who's our environmental expert, who did the SWIFMA jurisdictional boundary for the wetlands and the preservation area, which is expanding. Uh, Mr. Sean Cashin, who's a civil engineer, and Mr. Pergolizzi will be testifying in our presentation, but all of them are here uh, and more than happy to answer any questions that you have um, or any concerns that you have. It was part of the agenda item. It was provided over a week ago to the staff. I'm sorry, it was provided oh. exactly one week ago. Um, it is on the agenda packet that I saw online. Oh, I got it. Okay, excellent. Sorry. And it was the day before the hurricane, so kudos to the staff for, <laughs> for getting it to you, and I appreciate all of their hard work on this. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, my name is Brian Unks. I'm joined by Robert Pergolizzi, uh, AICP. He's our planning expert and transportation planning expert. I'm here on behalf of the applicant for your second hearing, and I've got good news in that we have a significant amount of additional information for you today than we had on April 27th, and it's all good news. 
This application <laughs> has been reviewed by the Florida Department of Transportation, and not only has it been reviewed, but we've met with them and we've explained Commissioner Seal's request and her concerns regarding the left turn lane uh, off of Alternate 19, and they have approved it. They're in favor of it. And Commissioner Seal did state that that was something that may not be easy to do, and we got it done in a very short period of time. This is the transportation plan, that uh, management plan that has also been done that the op opposition asked for us to do. This has been done uh, and has been submitted to your staff for review. The other thing that I think is extremely important to, re to, to uh, emphasize that Mr. Schaderbach recognized, we we've heard a lot of numbers about zoning and land use. Land use is a comprehensive planning process. The countywide map is the constitution of land use and zoning. It's what guides us. It guides the planners, it guides the staff, it guides property owners. It tells us what the county wants to see in the future. The future land use of this property on the countywide map is residential low medium, which allows up to 10 units per acre. The application before you today is proposing 3.16 units per acre. We believe it is very well thought out it was collaboratively designed with your staff, with FDOT, with FDEP, with the DEO, with Forward Pinellas, and with the LPA. And it has the support of every single one of those agencies. All of the independent eyes from your experts to the state to Forward Pinellas have all said this is reasonable, it's appropriate, and it's not only that, it's consistent with the goals and objectives and policies of Pinellas County. It is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the countywide plan and the comprehensive plan. Uh, I'm going to let Mr. Pergolesi testify more specifically about all of those things. One of the things I wanted to also point out is this rezoning doesn't just allow for 3.16 units per acre. It also increases the preservation area based on a much more accurate wetland survey. So we're going from 4.9 acres of preservation land to 6.3 acres of preservation land, which is obviously a good thing because it reflects the current environmental situation that's in the area. But it also limits the development potential and it requires clustering. If you look at the Forward Pinellas letter, Forward Pinellas actually thought that was a good thing. When you read uh, the letter, they talk about the coastal uh, high hazard area and how the property, the project as proposed, is appropriately clustered in appropriate areas doesn't require any public hearings or additional review from Ford Pinellas and is consistent with the countywide plan and the comprehensive plan. So you have not only your staff, but also the Ford Pinellas staff who have confirmed that this proposal is consistent with your goals, policies, and objectives. What we've asked to do is to reduce the density. Additionally, the R5 dens initially the R5 density would allow up to 82 units per acre. What we proposed is 60, I'm sorry, 82 units total. What we initially proposed was 78 units max, and what we've now proposed is 68 units max, which again is 3.16 units per acre. The current land use allows two and a half units per acre. R5 allows five, we're at 3.16. So we're very, very close, much closer to the 2.5, which is currently allowed, just a little bit over that. So from 47 units to 68, it gets you to 3.16 units per acre. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Pergolizzi, who will testify from a planning perspective. Go to the slide with the DOT letter. Okay. Uh, good evening, Robert Pergolizzi, AICP planner, professional transportation planner with Gulf Coast Consulting. Uh, from our April 27th meeting, uh, when you uh, transmitted the land use plan amendment to uh, DEO and Forward Pinellas and deferred action on the zoning, there were three main topics of discussion, transportation, density, and coordination with the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary. So I'll start with transportation. Uh, we are committing to construct a southbound left turn lane on Alter 19 and associated widening of Alter 19. Um, we held a pre-application meeting with FDOT on May 6th, about a week and a half after our first meeting, and FDOT approves of the widening of Alter 19 to include a southbound left turn lane at the Valley Road intersection. Attached is a letter we received from FDOT indicating their concurrence with our proposed uh, imp improvement. Uh, in addition, go to the, the next slide, 
the, our transportation management plan, it's very faint because it's yellow because we wanted to put it in yellow because that's what the striping would be. The, the yellow striping is shown on alternate 19 that we would be widening it from West Winds Drive, which is to the south, up to where the left turn lane for Clostrum and Road begins. And we would also be uh, adding off-site sidewalk along Pleasant Avenue and Valley Road from our project to the Pinellas Trail. Uh, in addition, a detailed traffic analysis was completed as promised. Uh, Mr. Yates can, can talk about that uh, or answer any questions regarding that. Per our discussions with FEOT, the southbound left turn lane would solve an existing problem where motorists right now are using the shoulder to get around left turning vehicles that are stopped in the southbound through lane when someone's trying to make a left. That was direct from FDOT's uh, traffic operations uh, division. And will provide ad capacity and a major safety improvement at Valley Road. Uh, if you can go to the, the uh, slide five and six. There we go. Um, we are reducing the density from 78 units to 68 units. Uh, concept plan A shows 68 single story villas, and the concept plan B with the townhomes shows 68 two story townhomes. As Brian stated, this is a gross density of 3.16 units per acre. If you go to slide seven, the forward Pinellas ladder. Uh, forward, as Brian stated, forward Pinellas reviewed the, the land use plan amendment. It's a tier one amendment. Uh, they sent their May 4th letter to Glenn Bailey, and I, I quote, the new designation does not require a corresponding change in the countywide plan map. Public hearings before forward Pinellas board and CPA will not be required. In sum, the density is consistent with the countywide plan. Uh, next slide, DEO. DEO sent their letter on May 13th to, uh, to the county and uh, stated no objections from state agencies. I, I want to turn now to uh, coordination with the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary. Uh, at your April 27th hearing, uh, you were very specific that we need to get together and sit down with uh, the Primate Sanctuary folks. I was contacted by Pinellas County staff that they wanted to participate in the meeting with staff and they graciously offered to use county offices to facilitate and provided potential dates for a meeting. I sent an invitation letter to uh, Ms. Rubenstein, the attorney for the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary, giving her a, a choice of times to meet with county. Uh, the response I got was uh, they were not interested in meeting with county staff, but we'd like to meet with just us ourselves. I contacted your staff to make sure that was okay, and they said, fine, go ahead. We don't need to be part of it if they don't want us there. So we met at my office on May 20th. Uh, and go to the next slide. May 20th at our office, and there's our sign-in sheet. The bottom three signatures are, are representatives of the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary. The Primate Sanctuary folks confirmed that they have primate cages that are only 10 to 20 feet from the Pinellas Trail with only a 10 foot high chain link fence, not a solid fence. Although the primate sanctuary wants primates visible to the trail users, sometimes trail users disturb their primates. And also traffic on alternate 19, including honking horns and sometimes an occasional backfiring car can disturb their primates. And when the county removed trees along the Pinellas Trail, because that's county right away, that disturbed the primates as well. That's what we got from them. And we're sympathetic, we understand that, but there's a common theme among those four items and that they're all existing problems not related to our proposed homes. However, DR Horton's agreed to do what we can. So we've revised our plans to increase the buffer. We had a follow-up meeting with county staff and Suncoast Primate Sanctuary representatives on June 8th. Based on the feedback, we again revised our plans to reduce the density to 68 total units. Um, the buffer is really about 150 to 160 feet. Let me go through the math. The Pinellas Trail is a 120 foot wide right of way. We are gonna provide a 20 foot building setback. Although 10 foot is the minimum required in R5, we're going to double that to 20 feet. So that's 140 and then with the cages being 10 to 20 feet from the trail, that puts us between 150 and 160 feet from the actual primate cages to our nearest home. If you can go to the next slide of the land development code, there's a section in the land development code that applies to farm animals and other wild animals in the residential areas. It's section 138-3550. 
And it states, farm animals shall not be boarded within 100 feet of any residence on an adjacent property. This is if you're going to have animals in a residential area. So in our opinion, if a wild animal or a farm animal could be as close as 100 feet of a home, certainly our proposed buffer of 150 to 160 feet plus an eight foot solid fence and lush landscaping would be more than adequate. Go to the next slide. Uh, separate outreach was made to Mr. and Mrs. Lawless who live uh, right in the area via certified mail confirming that they will have access to a public road and an invitation to meet with them. That was sent by D.R. Horton June 1st from Chad Whaley. Uh, if you can go to the conditions of approval, Brian. Thanks. To our knowledge, the Lawlesses have not contacted Mr. Whaley. I believe they may have contacted your staff and your staff have talked to them. But I repeat, they will have access to a public road, our road. As we extend Pleasant Avenue into the site, they will have access to that public road. So in conclusion, these are our, uh, our proposed conditions. You know, we've got a gross density of 3.16 units per acre. The, the proposed conditions are townhome would be limited to 68 two-story townhome dwelling units. Twin villas would be limited to 68 single-story dwelling units. Regardless of the minimum setbacks in the R5 zone, right now they're 10. Any buildings located along the western boundary of the site adjacent to the Benelos Trail and the Suncoast Primary Sanctuary will have a minimum building setback of 20 feet. And the buffer from the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary will include an eight foot high opaque fence and a five foot wide landscape buffer at 30% opacity at the time of installation. So in summary, our gross density is only 3.16 units per acre, consistent with the countywide plan. Transportation improvements are, are proposed. I know you were all concerned about that, particularly Commissioner Seal uh, regarding FDOT, and we've, we've spoken with FDOT. Additional building setbacks are proposed, double of the code requirement, and noise mitigation and buffering is proposed by means of an eight-foot high opa uh, opaque fence and landscaping. And Brian can sum up. Thank you, Mr. Pergolizzi. Um, so just to sum up, I know um, I'm sure you're going to hear again, and Commissioner Eggers asked again about the zoning. And the residential agricultural zoning really, in our opinion, is inconsistent and incompatible with the current land use. The current land use allows 2.5 units, but the current zoning only allows one unit per every acre or every two acres, which gets you to less than half a unit per acre. And the case law is very, very clear. Land use should be the guidepost, not zoning. The zoning needs to be consistent with the land use. The land use is what's part of the comprehensive planning process that was established in 1985, and that's what we've been following as our constitution on these types of things. So in this case, the current land use allows 47 units per acre. The max proposed, I'm sorry, 47 units. The max proposed would be 82, and we've come back at 68, which is 3.16 units per acre, much, much lower than five, closer to 2.5 than it is to five, and much, much lower than the countywide map, which allows for up to 10, or asks for up to 10. We believe our 150 to 160 foot buffer from structure to structure is extremely appropriate. We believe our eight foot wall opaic fence and landscape buffer is very good for noise mitigation. Um, and we believe the left turn lane from FDOT uh, will help with the traffic situation and certainly allow ingress egress and also the improvements that we're going to make to the right of way that we control and the street that we control on Pleasant Avenue. I reserve the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman, but we are happy to answer any questions you have now we're happy to answer questions later, however you'd like to proceed with questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions now? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> I do have um, next up Michael Yates. I'm assuming you're good? Okay. And the same with Angela Matthews? Same? Okay. Okay, then we are going to first go to, there are two folks that have, that are going to be speaking for 10 minutes. They are speaking on behalf of four other people. So we'll go to Deborah Cobb, who is speaking, um, right? Do I have that correct? You're, okay. I just saw that look from you like maybe I was, okay. Um, for John Pack, Stacy Pack, um, I'm assuming they're in the room. 
Laura Grace and, and Brandy Cobb. So I have Stacy Pack, John Pack, Laura Grace, and Brandy Cobb. I'm assuming they're here. Huh? Okay. One, two, three. Okay. So is that, is that John and Stacy? And then Laura and Brandy. Perfect. Thank you all. And you've got, uh, Deborah, you've got 10 minutes. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to take the time to thank you guys for making such a hard decision in everybody else's life. I'm here representing 5,400 people. Some of them are elderly and couldn't get out tonight. We are against, we want to keep the zoning for the way it is. I do have a question, though. How many emails came in about this hearing? Anybody know? I know emails came in, and I didn't hear a number about that at the very beginning. Hold on, and she'll answer your question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I had uh, 43 comments come in, but I know that there was over 20 more that we received that we were not able to count or look at before the meeting. Okay, just so you know, I had like 140. Um, the other thing I wanted to find out was F dot. You keep using the word F dot. Is that the same F dot that deemed that a failing road? Anybody here know the answer to that? Yes. Yes. So they deemed it a failing road, and we're letting them make a decision in our community for my children and everyone around us. I have a phone here tonight where we just had a five car pile up at Valley Road on alternate 19. Anybody who would like to see that, I will gladly let you look at my phone. That happened from the last hearing to now. The other question I have is right away. I keep hearing the right away up to the property on both sides. Can you please explain to me what that means? Is it wide enough now, that right away? I don't know who can answer that. What right away are you speaking of? Up to the property you're talking about. Up to the Lawless's property. Um, the, the, the one where we're going to allow, the, that they're going to allow them to use the public road? Well, they're not allowing it. My question is the property up to the 21 acres, I went and measured that, and it doesn't meet your standards now. So if a road's going to be put there, why isn't that being looked, I mean, why isn't that being looked at now, not later? You're talking about the existing road? Yes, sir. Okay. Also, on the traffic report, and I, I looked at everything really detailed, I even went to my own traffic person, because I don't understand all this. The trail wasn't even included in it. But you asked for a full traffic report. So I don't see them, they're not gonna do their due diligence. So I'm concerned about that. We do not want the zoning changed. It needs to stay the way it is. It's impacting way too much. We're at over like 200% on that property now. And we're for, we know it's gonna be developed. We're not concerned about that. But we're okay with 12 units, not 68, not 78. It needs to stay RA. I don't think y'all have been there during a hurricane. I'm 62. I was born in 1959. I've watched the growth of that whole community. And I used to ride horses on that property. And what I'm seeing happen to our county upsets me only because I do care. I haven't been talked. Horton hasn't talked to me, and I'm on the property touching it. My name is on the property. I have seven properties that I'm part of a caregiver for those properties right in that area. To me, don't forget about the five-car pileup. I helped the lady there. I don't understand how we can move forward. And I resent the fact that a place that I volunteer is being like farm animals, farm animals. The sanctuary has been there 
for 74 years. These are exotic species that have been there. The oldest animal on the property right now is 77 years old. On the back side, I resent the fact that he said, well, people go up and down the trail. They're not allowed on the trail at night. And if any of you remember the ostrich or the emus that were down in Palm Harbor that got killed by people that were living in a development right down the road across the street from the trail that they went down and they killed the ostriches and the emus. I'm not saying these people are trying to do that, but all I'm saying is these are not farm animals. These are critically endangered species. They've been there for 74 years and we need to take under consideration of what's in our community and not just bringing in high powered development to change or destroy our area. I also help with wildlife. If you look at the green space in Pinellas County, what do we have, 1.5 million people? Where is the wildlife gonna go? So my concern is for the next generation of the children, the next generation of the animals, and I still wanna hear what's gonna happen to that roadway. If it's not wide enough now, and we're not able to handle what we have there now, a turning lane is not going to make that big of a difference. I'm going to tell you that right now. I've lived on that road for too many years. It's not going to make that big of a difference. I also know there's other things that need to be considered that are not. The lawless is on that back section there. Nobody's talked to them about that. And I think it's easy for them to paint a pretty picture. We have a chain link fence. We don't have a problem. Part of the trail is... I don't care if the people see the animals. We want to embrace our community. But at the same time, don't say things that are not true. The noise, they are diurnal. That means up in the daytime, sleep at night. They're just like me and you. For a while there, we had the ambulance down the road that we had to go put a special caregiver there just to help the animals and everybody get through that. We don't have a problem with doing that. But when you're talking of an influx that we have coming in, that's a problem. I am five generations. My daughters will be six generations. I always want to be proud of Pinellas County. I love what we do in Pinellas County. I teach in the schools. I teach at the vet, vet academies. There are kids that come there all the time. The last thing they don't want to see is more development, 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 development. So if we can keep the zoning the way it is, make sure that we take care of our environment, make sure that we have a place so on the trail that visitors do want to come, and I was surprised at how many came off the trail just to come and see what the petition was all about. So what can I do to help? DR Horton hasn't talked to me. I'm one of the people that's on properties around there. I can understand why the lawlesses don't want to talk to them. They have a, they're getting ready to take their property away. And that's a concern. And if you were any one, any one of you would be them, you would be the same way. I just want to know why does the zoning need to be changed? Can someone answer that? Why does it need to be changed? because a developer told you it's gonna, again, F dot rated a road as F. It's F, 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 F. So we're gonna take the approval of somebody that's not here, not living in the community, not playing here, not waiting 45 minutes to get out in the traffic down alternate 19 four times a day, and we're gonna put more how does that make sense? So I want to say thank you. Uh, most of all, please hear 5,400 people. And I have more tonight. I brought some of the ones from the people that could not get here tonight. But I just want to take the time to say, come out to the primate sanctuary. Come look at the community. There's no way I feel in good conscience that we can pass this and not see the impact. All these people speaking back here don't live here. It's not about them. It's about the impact of Pinellas County 
our generation, the next generation, and knowing that these senior citizens and people that have signed these petitions are getting heard by every one of you commissioners. I want to say thank you, God bless, have a good night, and please do the right thing and keep the zoning the way it is. Okay, um, next up will be Laura Rubenstein and um, if Patricia Lawless, Anthony Lawless, Matt Frisch, and Giannis Argios could come forward, please. It's 10 yeah, this is 10 minutes. If I can see, is that Anthony? Okay, one, two, three. I see three. So is there a fourth? Is Giannis here? I believe he was in the overflow room. So this is Matt, Anthony, and Patricia here. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Lauren, go, go ahead. You have 10 minutes. Lauren Rubenstein, 2700 First Avenue, North St. Petersburg. I have been sworn. And um, just to make sure the record's clear, I'm here tonight on behalf of a number of the residents in the neighborhood, um, including the Lawlesses. And the Lawlesses own about 15 parcels in that neighborhood. So they're being substantially affected by this proposed amendment to the land use plan and rezoning. We're here in opposition tonight, and it comes down to the fact that there's just too much density still being proposed, um, notwithstanding the staff report indicating that the applicant is reducing it now to 68 compared to 84 possible. I think you all remember last time that the conditional overlay that the applicant was proposing was already limiting it to 71 story villas or 78. So we're really talking about a reduction of two potential units. Uh, just just wasn't enough to make a difference in the amount of traffic and the impact that, that those residents are going to see. And the applicant made sure to uh, brief you all on all the different agencies that have given their blessing to this application. But I can tell you that those officials and those agencies, they don't live in this neighborhood. This is a small residential neighborhood that the density is nowhere near what's being proposed. Yes, the surrounding land use of Innisbrook and recreation open space, sure, they won't be negatively impacted by this. But I can tell you that the people that live on Valley Road, Roberts Road, and Pleasant Road are certainly going to see the impacts. 68 units, it, you've indicated last time we were before you, well, we might be inclined to do something more than 12, but it seems like 70 or 78 might be too much. I don't feel like 68 is really splitting the difference there. And I think the perfect example of that is the fact that you look at what your future land use right now would allow. And if they applied for a zoning change to R5 without the future land use map amendment, those are the numbers you keep asking about. They could build 42 or 47 possible residential units. Well, that certainly sounds a lot more in line, and it makes sense that it sounds more in line because that's what under your future land use map you've designated as appropriate. You know, the case law is clear that you have to file, follow the future land use map, but zoning is always allowed to be more restrictive, and the case law is very clear on that. RA zoning at two acres per residential unit is completely compatible and appropriate for that future land use map category, as well as R5 under your code would be a compatible land use or zoning under the future land use category. But what they're asking for is a land use map amendment as well as the rezoning to bump them up to those numbers of 82, 84 units, which they're limiting now to 68. Uh, this dramatic increase in density, when you analyze it in conjunction with the density and the current use in the neighborhood, is just completely unreasonable and incompatible. Uh, I believe your staff also pointed out that it is located in the coastal high hazard area. There are drainage concerns, certainly, and you're looking at upping the density to what's five, over five and a half times what currently is allowed there, and we'd submit that's not appropriate. 
And in, with the increase in density, of course, that brings us to the traffic concerns. The proposed project lies in a deficient corridor as your land development code defines it, and the access from the proposed project to the surrounding arterial network is extremely limited. Uh, they have to go out from this proposed project out Pleasant to Valley or to out Roberts Road to get on US Alternate 19 or to get on Klosterman. And Pleasant is an insufficient, a sub, substandard road right now. I believe it's 40 feet. The applicant has graciously agreed that they would give 10 feet of right of way, but they only own three parcels that lead up into that development. So the rest of that right of way is going to remain substandard. And when you're adding 68 residential units and 400 and some trips a day minimum, you're going to see a substantial impact to that. There's no way to get in and out of this property other than that, which I think is also significant. A lot of developments now that Pinellas County approves, especially of these densities, require two ingress and egresses. And right now there's only the one and the fact that it's insufficient and then leading to a level of service F, alternate 19, uh, I believe is a good reason that the commission should consider denying this application. Looking at your comprehensive plan, policy 1.2.4 recognizes that successful neighborhoods are central to the quality of life in Pinellas County. Redevelopment and urban infill development should be compatible with and support the integrity and viability of existing residential neighborhoods. I'd submit that this application that's in front of you does not accomplish that. I believe it is inconsistent with your comprehensive plan. It would propose new lots that are much less, much more dense and uh, much less overall area than what's existing there right now and limit it setbacks as well. Additionally, policy 4.2.3 of the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plan requires the following. When you're making decisions on requests to amend the future land use map or the zoning atlas, the county shall review potential impacts on the transportation system by considering the following. And two of those are ability of the surrounding existing and planned transportation network to meet the mobility objectives of the comprehensive plan and capacity of the surrounding existing and planned transportation network to accommodate any projected additional demand. We've already talked about the fact that you're, you know, you're in a deficient corridor as defined by your own land use code. It's substandard right of ways that are leading to this development. And unfortunately, the developer doesn't have the land to make those standard. So I know they're going to say if they could, they would, but that's a perfectly good reason that this project needs to be denied. So when you're looking at the traffic impacts and traffic concerns paired with the proposed development being located on that deficient quarter and the main access point requiring vehicles to cross the Pinellas Trail, uh, we'd submit it's not consistent with the above mentioned policies named in your comprehensive plan. The future land use designation as it stands right now, along with current zoning, allows for meaning development on the subject property, or as we discussed, a potential rezoning with the future land use as it stands right now could allow for additional development on that property, which would be much more consistent with the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plan, and therefore we'd ask that you keep the future land use and current zoning in place. We respectfully request that you deny the application. And I will add, uh, just since I have a couple of minutes, um, I, I did ask my clients, the lawless, if um, they received that letter. They, they did receive a letter from DR Horton. I know that might be a question that comes up. They had met with Chad several times on the site and uh, didn't feel as though any additional meetings were necessary. So just to answer that question for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, let me check something here. Okay, um, I'm just gonna uh, go with about three names at a time so we can try to get folks lined up. Uh, Brianna Cobb, Dale Jackway, and Tommy, looks like, looks like Amos or Amons. So Brianna Cobb, Dale Jackway, 
and then Tommy. Okay, hang on one second. Is Brianna there? No. Brandy was. Okay, thank you. All right, Dale, come on up. And then Tommy, and then Rick, it looks like Rick Leslie. You have three minutes, Dale. All right, pardon me for reading, but I only have three minutes. I stand before you today representing roughly 125 rescued animals, 75 regular volunteers, over 5,400 dissenting petitions and more than 70 years of history right here in Pinellas County. As you know, this is a very unique situation. I've stood here three times on this matter previously, and one of those times I was falsely accused of not being open to compromise. As I understood it, compromising the issue would be to meet somewhere in the middle. I am not against the development of the 22 acres in question or the building of the 11 or 12 homes the county would currently allow. I am, however, strongly opposed to the scope of the proposed development and its close proximity to our animal sanctuary as well as the problems it will create for the entire community. It is painfully obvious the compromise between 11 units and 78 units is nowhere near the proposed 68 units you have been presented with today. This is almost six times what is currently allowed and is something even the county planners had to point out at our most recent meeting with the builder in Clearwater. I ask who's really unwilling to compromise here? The established Pleasant Avenue neighborhood sits directly north of this proposed zoning change. The original 32 units found here are mostly old single story, single family homes. All these homes are situated on two rural streets with no sidewalks and large trees. The proposal before you today represents more than triple the current density of this established neighborhood by adding 68 two-story units. All of this added density is planned to be built at the end of a rural dead-end street, which really only has one way in and one way out. It simply is not in keeping with the nature of the surrounding area, nor the adequate property for the builder's suggested improvements. I understand there's only a 40-foot right-of-way at the development entrance, where a 50 to 60-foot right-of-way is normally required, which leaves the county the burden of any remaining roadway improvements. Traffic issues are already evident in and around the neighborhood. On these rural streets, cars must slow down or pull over to get past each other safely. To the west, you'll cross the Pinellas Trail and find Alternate 19, which is a deficient highway. And to the north is Klossman Road, which is, has a fixed median, median and only allows for a right turn. For what I have read, the extensive traffic study you requested did not collect any new data points or consider the trail safety. Aside from obvious traffic issues, the scope and proximity of this development to sanctuary is going to cause additional hardships and safety issues for our animal rescue. Proponents of this zoning change will tell you the 120-foot trail, an eight-foot vinyl fence, and some bushes will be more than enough of a buffer between our property lines, but I completely disagree. I'm a coach. I watch children throw a ball from their knees at home plate to second base to get a runner out, and that's just over 127 feet on a regulation baseball field. Besides, by placing a fence and bushes there, it isn't going to do much to reduce the noises or smells from a barbecue or a barking dog on one side or a chimpanzee and a monkey reacting to it from the other. It also will not do much to reduce the lights and sounds from a second-story window. Finish up quickly. Second-story window was a tower over an eight-foot vinyl fence and further agitate our residents and consequently the residents who live there. I have followed your suggestion, tried to find a compromise. I propose keeping a buffer of existing old growth trees and the elimination of, of buildings along the west side, which was flatly denied by the developer. In my opinion, there's been no compromise, nor has there been an extensive traffic study to date. I leave it in your capable hands to do the right thing and deny the R5 zoning changes and the development as they have been presented to you today. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thanks, Dale. Okay, Tommy, Tommy Amos. Rick Leslie, and then Taylor Woods. Is Tommy here? Rick Leslie here? Are you Rick? Yeah, okay. Okay. I actually leave my rights to uh, David. I would just like to say I do live there on Roberts Road and been there for 11 years, and it is a nice community. And there is no room for growth out there as what you guys, or what they're wanting to propose. So, you know, that's, like I said, I didn't really want to come up here and say anything, but it, it, 
it is overpopulated out there for the, the roads, Alt-19, and everything else. All right, thanks. Thanks, Rick. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. All right, Tommy, one more time. Okay. Taylor Woods, David Ballard Geddes, Jr., Taylor Woods, and then Anthony Ellis. So do I not see Taylor Woods? All right. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Thank you, sir. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Concerning this matter uh, is, and I bring up the water supply a lot. We know that. We already have catastrophic water issues. And how is this development going to make those water issues any better? I don't see that happening. What about jobs? Do we have jobs for all these people, for all this overdevelopment that's taking place to include this issue here? Um, the traffic on alternate 19 at rush hour is backed up all the way down close to Wall Springs Park at five o'clock trying to get into Tarpon Springs on alternate 19, adding to that problem, uh, I don't believe is consistent with legitimate or proper development. Um, furthermore, this commission at two o'clock had handed out an award concerning green space, concerning uh, uh, parks and preserved lands. Um, I feel as though this piece of property being an indigenous piece of land, undeveloped, should remain that way. If we have to do something with this piece of property, can't we uh, turn it into park or green space? It would be ideal for uh, weekend uh, activities for families to ride their bicycles on the trail as it's so close to the bicycle path. I think uh, developing on this piece of property is a travesty. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony Ellis, Susan Ellis, and then Dan Oliver. Anthony Ellis, Susan Ellis, Dan Oliver. They are coming. Anthony? They're waving. Oh, Anthony's waving. Susan? Okay. Dan Oliver? Okay. Jennifer Oliver? You need to come up here or wave. Okay. Thank you. And then Kathy, I think it's Durr, um, and Bill Gassaway. Kathy Durr and Bill Gassaway. Those are the those are the last two I see. Let's see, I see somebody coming out of there. I have to hear it from staff or them. Yeah, you just mentioned they're waiting. We're waiting. Okay, both get Bill and Kathy? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, those are all the comments that I had. Um, make sure I get that right. I don't think I had, no, I had nobody, nobody calling in um, or registering ahead of time. Um, the applicant has how much time? Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, before I start my time, I'd like to see if we can get that PowerPoint back up, please. No worries. And the TMP plan. Right. And we're going to have Mr. Yates uh, testify first regarding the transportation management plan and the traffic concerns. Just wait until I get the PowerPoint up.
<laughs> that helps. You like it, though. Yeah, I got you. Okay, Mr. Yates will testify now about the tra transportation management plan. There you go. Hi, uh, good evening, Michael Yates, Palm Traffic. Um, I, what is being handed out is we did a trip generation comparison so you can see what the trip generation difference would be between the 47 units, the 68 units, and the 82 units. And so between the 47 units and the 68 units, we are only looking at 159 daily trips difference. So a very small number, that's 10 a.m. peak hour trips and only 12 p.m. peak hour trips. I just wanted to make sure that y'all understood what that kind of difference was. It's very minor, and that was a table that was just handed out. Uh, we also did the traffic study and met with DOT. Um, basically, capacity is a function of delay. And so adding left turn lanes greatly improve capacities of roadways. If you look at the FDOT generalized level of service tables, it's about a 20% change in capacity by adding turn lanes. That's where a large percentage of your delay occurs on a two lane undivided roadway. And so by adding this left turn lane that we've proposed, it will greatly improve the capacity, reduce the potential for accidents, and allow for the vehicles turning onto Valley Road southbound to get out of the through lane and allow the through lane to continue on without delay. Uh, we did do a full traffic study. We did count along at the intersection, both at Valley and Roberts, uh, all the way up. We looked at the intersection analysis. We, can, we showed that it works at an acceptable level of service. We had about 40, uh, 42 cars on Valley Road eastbound. I know one of the commissioners asked about what was that separation between the Pinellas Trail and Alt 19. And so the 80 feet is correct. That gets you from basically the stop bar there of Valley to the radius return on Valley east of Alternate 19. And so with that 40 cars, that equals to less than two cars of Q maximum during the peak time periods. And so well under the four cars that could stack within that area. So even on that type of delay, there's plenty of capacity. I'll be happy to answer any more questions you may have. Uh, hi, Robert Pergolizzi, Gulf Coast Consulting again, um, regarding Deborah Cobb's testimony. Um, Mrs. Cobb chose not to attend the meeting at our office, but Mr. Jackway was there representing Suncoast Primate Sanctuary, as was John Landon, as was Ms. Rubenstein. Um, regarding uh, pileups on Alter 19 and Valley Road, well, uh, a southbound left turn would go a long way in improving the safety and eliminating any pileups along Alter 19 and Valley Road. Regarding the rights of way, Pleasant Avenue and Valley Road currently have a 40 foot right of way. We will be building in our project where we control the property, a 50 foot wide Pinellas County standard local road, 50 feet of right of way, curb, gutter, sidewalk on both sides. As you exit our property, where we have property on the western side of Pleasant Avenue, we will be dedicating 10 feet of right of way to go from 40 feet to 50 feet and putting sidewalk there. We will also be putting sidewalk within the existing rights of way on Pleasant and Valley Road to get sidewalk from our project over to the Pinellas Trail. We will not be taking any property from Mrs. Lawless. The letter that she was given clearly shows she's got access to a public road and we are not looking at taking any property from her. In fact, if we have excess property, it would be deeded to her according to the letter that DR Horton wrote. And I'll have Brian finish up. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Michael. And again, we are here to answer any questions you have. I know there was a significant amount of issues that were raised, and we can't address everything specifically. But I did want to point out one thing. No one in this room doesn't support the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary. Uh, I actually took my son there in March before I had any idea I was going to get involved with this case, and I saw the petition. I didn't sign it, but I saw the petition. I looked around the property. I took a real interest in walking around and looking at everything. And I'm here to tell you that all of the independent sets of eyes 
that have reviewed not just this new revised plan that took into consideration all of the suggestions and concerns that we heard from you on April 27th, but looked at the old plan, FDOT, FDEP, FWC, DEO, Ford Pinellas, looked at the old plan and found it was appropriate to the point that it didn't need any additional study because it had been so well considered and collaboratively developed with your staff. So what we've done now is improved it even more based on Commissioner Seal's recommendation for the left-hand turn lane, based on Commissioner Flower's recommendation to increase the buffer and not only increase the buffer, but make it better. We have the 150 to 160 foot wide buffer from structure to structure. We have the eight foot tall opaque wall with a five foot landscape buffer which increases the trees and increases the landscaping. We can't control what Suncoast Primate Sanctuary does with their property. They've received a tremendous amount of support and grace from the county. They don't have an approved site plan. They have over six or seven board of adjustment approvals over the last 20 years. The last one was for a 150 foot telecommunications tower. Every one of them required site plan approval. They don't have an approved site plan. We're asking you to approve our conditional site plan because we want to be good neighbors and take into consideration all the concerns we heard. We're happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Gerard. Um, this is a, having to do with the roadways. So if I'm reading this correctly, you're putting in a left-hand turn lane, a southbound left-hand turn lane, but there's also a northbound right-hand turn lane. Is that right? Into, uh, maybe I'm not looking it, at it right. No, but it, it looks is just the southbound left turn lane. What happens, uh, there is no northbound right turn lane. You're, okay. you're seeing some what am I widening seeing? What is because the... we have to widen because we because to put the to put the left turn lane in we've got to widen the road on both sides so oh, that's okay. what you're seeing. All right. Okay. So it's for the through traffic to get by. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I was looking at south of Valley Road, but that's okay. I'm not quite sure what those red lines are. You can tell me later. The red lines. Um, okay. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This can go to um, either our staff or the presenters. Well, I guess our staff. Do we typically include uh, trail access traffic patterns in a traffic study? I thought those were, I thought traffic study counts were only done for vehicular counts, not counting foot traffic on our trail. So am That's I? correct. Okay, so, and I'm, the reason I'm asking is because a young lady said she was curious as it relates to whether or not any traffic was counted for the trail. We, we could look at a uh, bicycle or pedestrian when there's a transportation uh, need to offset traffic. Uh, we have transportation management policies. Once you go over 51 peak hour trips, on a deficient roadway, then you have to provide a transportation management plan. And one, some of those are uh, increased sidewalks, off-site sidewalks, uh, access to the trail. Could be you provide a, a shelter uh, off of the trail on near property benches. So we look at those as a way to mitigate traffic impacts, but not traffic impacts from the trail. Okay, and I believe I already know the answer to this question, but I just want to make sure it's clear for the public. The agencies that provided their release, if you will, or their support of the proposed um, plan did so because we needed to move approval of an item and have that item transmitted for review by those state agencies and for those state agencies to give either their thumbs up or thumbs down related to the proposed project. So that is why those letters were remitted back, giving their thumbs up, if you will, for the proposed project. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, I just wanna make sure her question was answered. And um, can you speak to the coastal high hazard concern? Um, you know, we all know that if a hurricane or something comes, we know it takes time um, to get from certain areas, especially when you're coming off of um, areas that are close to the beach communities. Um, but can you speak to the coastal high hazard potential concerns as sure. it relates to any traffic trips generated from this project? 
our coastal high hazard, so it doesn't relate, re relate to trips, it relates to, to density. There is the state policy and then also our, our local, we have uh, in our coastal management element, uh, policy 135, which states that Pinellas County shall not approve any request to amend the future land use map to designate parcels of land within the coastal storm area with a future land use category that permits more than five dwelling units per gross acre. Okay. So we look at it, if they were asking more than five acres or five units an acre, uh, we wouldn't even consider uh, taking an amendment in on that. So they're asking for RL, which is five units an acre, the max they can ask for, and they're limiting it with the conditional overlay to that 3.2 units per acre approximately. Uh, most of the property, there's the southern property where the preservation is, that's in a flood area. That's in most of the coastal high hazard area is in that southern end where they're proposing to concentrate the majority of their development based on the concept plans are outside of the coastal high hazard area. So they, they are looking to, to uh, let me see, have that compact area there outside of it and any uh, portions that would be into that area still meets our countywide policy because it's less than five units an acre. Uh, they would have to do floodplain mitigation, which they have met with our, our staff and our engineering staff has reviewed uh, the concept plan at pre-app meetings and has determined that they can meet that okay. preliminarily. And can you speak to the um, concern from one of the speakers as it relates to um, the level of service for the road that's currently there being rated at a level F. Can you, are you aware of that or do you know of any contradictory information that would say the level of service for that road would be different in order for them to receive the permission that they receive from FDOT to go ahead and add that left hand turn lane? No, it, it is, uh, alternate 19 is a level of service F. Klosterman Road is a level of service C. And based on, and it's also uh, alternate 19 is a deficient roadway. Based on that, it is a level of service F. And when we got our letter back from the FDOT is one of the state agencies that, that had to review it, that they had no objection to it. Um, with the applicant meeting separately on their own with FDOT, uh, that is a way that they could use to mitigate traffic by providing that uh, southbound left turn lane. Which would enhance the level of service for that roadway, potentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, and we look at, again, goes back to the, at the site plan level, the transportation management plan. Those are ways to help offset traffic impacts. Okay. And my question regarding communication with the law, the lawlers, that was explained. Thank you so much, um, because I know we had, um, made several attempts. There have been some attempts to try to communicate with them, um, but thank you for clarifying that, Ms. Rothstein. Um, um, and that's all I had. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The left turn lane or left turn light that would be provided by the applicant, the cost for that? I, they can. They can provide the cost of that. Robert Pergoli is again. Um, the left turn lane and the associated widening of alternate 19. It's about 700 to 800 feet of widening. We've estimated that cost to be about $200,000. That will be borne by the applicant. Okay. Thank you. And then um, I, this is for our staff. The, uh, I thought I heard the applicant uh, describe that our current land use and current zoning are not in line with each other. Is that, did I hear that accurately and is that accurate? No, they, they are. They're, we are, the countywide plan has, allows 10 units an acre. That's what they're set at. We have to be consistent with the countywide plan. We can be either at or below. We're below that. And then the zoning is what further restricts. Zoning restricts the uses, restricts the lot sizes, restricts the setbacks. But 
either one of those zoning districts is are are compatible okay. with the RS or the proposed RL. All right. I just I guess yeah. I misheard that. Um, and then if again, just I know uh, I think it's the same question I asked at the beginning. So if we bifurcated the land use in the zoning and we approved the land use and denied the zoning change, it would be residential low preservation land use with a residential agriculture R3 single family zoning and that would get us to the 42 or 47 homes. Is that correct? If you kept the, the zoning? Yeah, change the land use but keep the zoning. There still would be 12 units. What, what I think you might be getting at is if you amended the zoning and left the land use as is because really it's the current, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, it's really the current zoning that is the very limiting factor because of that half a unit per, well, one unit per two acres. That comes from the zoning though. With that R5, C, or R5 um, would that be compatible with the residential, suburban, and preservation? Yes. Okay. And that'll, get, and that'll get you how many? That would get us the 40... 42 plus 5 off the preservation of 47. Okay. All right. That's what I... And, and quite frankly, when I had got a briefing, that's what I thought current rules were, were in that 40 that they could build 40-something without us doing anything tonight. So that's why I was a little thrown off at the beginning. Yeah, it's a, it's a zoning. The residential agriculture zoning is allowed only one unit per two acres. It's our, our least dense zoning right. district. Okay. All right. Thank you. Again, I've just... So, the, so RS on the land use and R5 gets you the 42 plus 5. Yes. And then um, I was looking at their site plan. Of course, I went, I'm going back and forth between both of your presentations, so it makes it a little bit problematic. I'm looking for their presentation right now. Um, I think they have um, 68 units in, on that site plan and or like location of the lots. Mm -hmm. um, and if you took out some of the lots along the western side, which again, I think that was mentioned during some of the testimony and the, the developer didn't want to do that. But if you took about, it looks like about 10 lots on the west side, leaving somewhere around 58. I mean, that seems to be about the right number and it covers most of the sanctuary area. You can do that under the overlay and just designate the amount that you want to allow, right? Well, the, the concept plans that they've submitted are not part of the conditional overlay. We can't, we can't look, they're just exhibits. They're just okay. exhibits to show us how the layout would be. We, we can't tie those to the conditional overlay. Only those conditions of the unit count, this increased setback and the increased buffering are what's tied to the conditional overlay. If you wanted to tie a concept plan we would need a development agreement. Okay, or we could just increase the setback to incorporate the width of the house, the houses along the west side. Yes. I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is we have the 47 units that are available through this one, this, this RS and, and, and R5. Mm -hmm. And then this, if we go back to their request, but use the overlay to just remove some more of the Houses on the western side, and the and the, you're you're compromising between the 60, 68, and the forty six or forty seven that's allowed, um, and it kind of addresses uh, it doesn't address the substandard roads through the neighborhood, um, but it does address the, the the sanctuary concerns of proximity after after hours. I was just trying to come up with a compromise spot, um, sure. and just thinking along the lines of. Commissioner Justice in a different way, but just compromising on, on the number, the density. So just want to make sure what we can do and what we can't do. Yeah, we can adjust setbacks and the buffering and the unit count. Correct you. We can adjust those things. However, what has been advertised for hearing tonight is what is before you. So unless the representatives of the developer were to okay. consent to that, we cannot do that tonight. Any other questions?
Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. I think you um, you have a lot of interest in in doing some kind of development here, and and yet the 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 boundaries that that are being proposed seem concerning. At least, I mean, again, I'm not I'm not trying to speak for everybody, but I think we're trying to find a place that that we can land. So I just you know, anyway, um, it, what is the will of the commission tonight? Sounds familiar to the last time we got together. That, you know, again, uh, you know, I, th I think we're, we're wrestling with the two here. The, the idea being that we have interest in allowing um, a movement in the f f on the land use to provide some reasonable development. Um, and I've heard over and over tonight about, not over and over, but from some people uh, that testified against it, that they were wanting to see some more compromise. And so I, I, it was kind of ringing in my ear and then some of the comments that I've heard up here. So I'm trying to find that, that, that spot that we get comfortable. Um, so. Um, okay. What did she speak. say? I couldn't hear her. I was going to say something, but I said I'll wait to if okay. the chair was going that's to. That's fine. We'll, we'll just wait just one minute. And let's see what. Yeah. I think that's what you said. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Renee. <laughs> yes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Yeah. Um, Brian Unkst again on behalf of the applicant. Um, I spoke to our representative, and the lowest density that works from a performer perspective, and keep in mind there's two separate concepts. There's the single family homes and there's the two-story townhouses. The lowest density that works from a pro forma is 64 units. That would get you below uh, the median or the mean between 47 and 82. The mean is 64 and a half. So we would be exactly half. And, uh, just to, and if anybody else, if you want to ask other people questions, you can give them a chance to speak. Um, to be clear, what's allowed now under the RS land use is two and a half units per acre. That gets you to 47 units with one unit per acre for the preservation, that's current. The zoning is more restrictive. That's the RA, which we talked about. <coughs> compromise, the definition of compromise is when two parties come together and make concessions to each other. It's not necessarily meeting in the middle all the time. That's not how mediation works, right? We've done as much as we possibly can to make concessions. When we met with, when we met with Mr. Jaco, he said 47 units, that was his bottom line, or 42, 47, 42, I don't wanna misquote him. They're still at that number. They haven't moved at all from April 27th. In fact, if you listen to Ms. Cobb and Ms. Rubenstein, they've gotten less, they wanna stay at the 12. So, you know, we have bent over backwards, in our opinion, to be as commercially reasonable as possible to make this property developable. If we can't get to that 64 unit number as a rock bottom number, the property is not developable. And as such, your future land use map that says it can go up to 10 units per acre is essentially meaningless. Um, I also wanted to just point out, because I don't know if it was clear, we are improving the entire stretch of Pleasant Road or Pleasant Avenue. So we're not doing the right of way where we don't own the right of way, but we're gonna repave that entire road. So we're gonna add the right of way by the Lawless's house to make it the 50 foot give them a real road, right now they have dirt, and we're gonna repave that entire road for everybody, even though that road will only be at 40 feet. So we're adding the sidewalk to the trail. You've heard everything else we're doing. I think we're providing a significant amount of deliverables. Um, and and um, so I, I just respectfully request that, that you would approve it tonight based on that. If not, I also recognize there's only five commissioners here, and we need an affirmative vote of four and if we can't get to an affirmative vote of four uh, based on consensus, I'd respectfully request you continue it so that we can have a, a full commission consider it. Thank you. So is he recommending that we continue it? Is that what you're recommending, Brian? Right. He re requested 64. Correct. He's what? He amended his request to 64 units. That's. 
Yeah, so you're talking about essentially four less than the, I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a site plan, I'm sorry, that uh, a, a plan that shows um, 20, 34, 34 units. Is that, the, is that the town home? So you have 34 times two, 68, is that where you're? If we could get the, um, I'm sorry, if we could get the PowerPoint back up, I could, I could show you the two, the two plans A and B. And if the concern is to remove the units from that western boundary, we can remove the four units from that western boundary. Okay, I'm just making sure that I have authority to see it. But, but that's if, two, the two, go ahead. If you go to concept plan A, which shows the 68 twin villas, <coughs> um, that's got the, the line of the units there and units one through 12 abut the Pinellas Trail. So that is, and each of those units, there have two, two towns. Each of those buildings has two units. So no, no, no. This is, it, it, yeah. th those, are, those are twin villas. Yeah. So each of those buildings has two units. So one through 12 is actually 24 units. Okay, e eliminating all of those is, is impossible. When we met with the uh, Suncoast Primate Sanctuary people, they discussed where they have the primates and where certain, I guess, more agitated primates reside. And they're more towards the northern end in their northernmost building where you can see their 10 foot minimum to cages up there, uh, like directly opposite building six and building five. Okay. So if we were going to take out four units, I would think that building five and building six would have the most beneficial effect to the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary because that is where they have the uh, the, the mean monkeys to, 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 to you know, not the, 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 the primates that have the most difficult time. And that's what they explained to us when, when, we, when, we, uh, when we spoke with them. So that would be the, the location that we would propose. Okay. And this is concept plan B. So this concept shows. Plan, say, okay. This shows the town home. And the concept plan B where the where we have the large amenity open space that is the one that is directly opposite of that northernmost building where the the um most agitated primates and how reside. many how many units are there that has 68 units okay on this plan on this plan has 68 units you'll see that we left vacant space here with that consideration in mind so Understood. this is vacant based on our conversations with the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary. And each one of those buildings has how many units? Uh, uh, either six or four units okay. in each of those buildings. So we could remove four it's of those units. Ones. Yeah. Uh, I, okay, I got you. And so it'd probably be either the one across the road or <coughs> the one to the north. Yeah, in, in this particular instance, we, we showed a large amenity area and open space directly across the trail from their northernmost building which is what they alluded to us when we had our meeting at my office as to where the most problematic primates reside. So we could, if you were so inclined to improve it with the condition that we remove buildings five and six on this plan, and which building would we move, just remove four units somewhere on and the western remove, boundary yeah. on this plan, that would be more than acceptable, especially with all the other conditions. Um, if we couldn't get there tonight, we would respectfully request a continuance so that we could have seven commissioners or because we have to get the four votes out of five we don't jewel so i'm incorrect all right well if we can get it approved tonight with those conditions that would be great however i would point out that some of what's being discussed here with placement of buildings and the like cannot be accomplished through your conditional overlay it would be more appropriate for a development agreement and if that's the direction that the commission would like to go in cooperation with the applicant I would recommend that we do p potentially continue this to give staff the opportunity to do that if that's the will of the commission. Because looking at the concept plans and trying to envision where the buildings might be is great for the public hearing, but it's not, it would not be included in the conditional zoning overlay, nor really could it be. Yes. I would like to recommend that we ask for continuance on this issue until we have our full commission here. I think that would be the best way to handle it since we have two members that are not able to weigh in and this is an important project for North County. I'll, I'll, I'll second that motion. Um, I'll 
I'll second that motion for purposes of discussion. Okay. Um, <coughs> thank you, uh, Commissioner Long. Um, and Jewel, thank you for the clarification on that because whenever you're altering what it is that you've already advertised, you get into really tricky water with that. Um, I, I, I'm going to support uh, the motion from, from my colleague, but what I will say is, is that um, I took notes, very good notes, from, our fir from my first interaction with this as it relates to what the concerns were of the abutting neighbors, the, the representatives from the primate center, and others. And it does appear to me as though the presenters really tried to go back in and, and, and do the things that were being asked, not only of um, the community residents, short of building fewer units, but also addressing, because I was the one that did say, is there any way we could do a buffer wall that would separate the trail from the primate center so that whatever activity is going on on that side, there would be that buffer. So if you had a barbecue or if you had music or whatever, there would be something to buffer that so that the primates would not become as agitated. Um, so I do believe that they've really tried to um, find some common ground and um, make some upgrades, if you will, um, in some areas that's costing them additional dollars, things that they didn't have to do, but they agreed to do because they heard the concerns. So I'm going to support my colleague's motion that we uh, uh, push this off until we have our other colleagues here with us. Um, I would presume, Jewel, that that would, st that would, would we need to go through this entire public hearing process again. Um, so I presume that we'll be going through that um, again. And then, I, you know, I would hope that um, the representatives would also make sure that the renderings reflect the requested changes, the things that you've just agreed to as it relates to moving five and six to give that um, open area between um, the primate center, the um, trail, and the proposed project. Um, the reason why I believe they couldn't do any additional units is because when you look at the retention area and the drainage area, all of that moves into wetland area where they couldn't build anyway. So they can't even propose that their project gets shifted further back because that's wetland area where they can't build. So I, I will support, um, I will second the motion um, that my colleague made um, as it relates to um, holding off on any action until uh, Commissioner Seal and Commissioner Peters um, are present. Okay, did you have anything? Uh, Commissioner Justice, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I guess I have mixed feelings about a continuance, but whatever the will of the board is, is fine. Um, you show up and you vote or you, you miss the vote and things, important stuff happens while we're here. So, um, but uh, with all due respect, and I have a great deal of respect for Mr. Angst and, and Mr. Pergolese and their, their team, but uh, where we are today is if we do nothing or reject it, it's 12 units. They asked for 68. If we change the zoning, it's 40. It's in the 40s, which to me sounds more like a compromise. I think Ms. Rubenstein mentioned that. So that's kind of where I would feel more comfortable. But um, if we want to come back and do this all again next month, we can do that. Any comments? Well, just, yeah, I would support a continuance too since they asked for one, or sort of, if we couldn't come to some consensus, not necessarily because our colleagues aren't here because I agree with you. Um, I think, um, I know it doesn't matter what the site plan looks like, but I would much prefer the uh, townhome concept because I think there's much more green space that you're gonna be seeing then. And if there's any way to reconfigure that, um, if we're looking at a development agreement so that some of those units are farther away from the primary, uh, from the primate sanctuary, that would be great. I don't know if you'd have to rework the retention areas or what, but um, I think there is there is a project that we can approve. Just not sure what it is yet. So, yeah, I, I think our future land use map does give us some guidance uh, to provide more more opportunity here on this land than think what is currently asked for. I do think there's been a, a, a great deal of compromise um, on behalf of the, uh, of, of behalf of the owner, the applicant, and 
Um, I'm, I'm a little bit um, like the two of you that I'm, I'm not inclined to, to postpone it to just because the other two aren't here. Um, but rather, maybe there's some work that still can be done on a, you know, again, I don't want to, I'm not forcing a development, we're not, we're not dictating a, a development agreement here. Um, I just want to make sure that that's clear, right? We're not saying it has to be a development agreement, but just, uh, just to look at the concept plan and the overlay that we can work with, I guess, the parameters under which we can work on the, uh, on the plan. Just want to make sure I'm clear. Yeah, if, if you if you wish to kind of like you said memorialize one of those concept plans as far as placement of the buildings to direct it as has been discussed the tool that, that would need to be used as a development agreement oh okay so we are talking a development yeah. agreement and but if to that point Joel how would that have to be advertised since it's already been advertised and be a continuance it would have to be a new application and a new advertisement yeah that's just so you so you understand that, then you would have to start over again on that. Nearly essentially, yeah, because there's, you know, my understanding from my staff, and I know that, you know, some of the other folks from the planning staff can speak to this, is that there's a lot of negotiation that goes into a development agreement. We've seen a lot of it here, but nonetheless, that has to be, you know, put on paper in terms of it, you know, agreed to. So it would be um, a new, a, a, an application, a new application for a development agreement and a new process in that effect. Could you speak into that? Yeah. The development agreement would require a new application. It would go basically start back over again with a development review committee, local planning agency, and then back through our process here. Uh, I hate to. Yeah. So, so we, if we don't do that um, and we're not inclined to wait for the commissioners, um, What's the point in waiting um, if we're not going to do a development agreement? And we, well, we could. It's just we take time in the process. Yeah. Well, I don't. That I guess that's their their call. Mr. Chairman, yeah. Um, so spoke to uh, my client, the applicant. The development agreement process, you know, at this point sounds um, like it may not be the most uh, advantageous for the staff and the commission and for the applicant in terms of the time. Uh, however, if you do continue it, we could resubmit again under the conditional overlay and provide you revised exhibits A and B uh, with a lower density. Um, we are willing to go forward tonight with a vote, an up or down vote on 64 units if you were inclined to approve it. Um, but I'm, <laughs> I'm hearing concerns about that. Uh, but there's only so much that can be given. Um, and like I said earlier, um, the, it is consistent with the neighborhood that was developed across the street that was uncontested. I mean, the density across the street is, is very consistent with what's being asked here. And there is so much benefit and improvement and investment to the direct community that's being given by my applicant. Um, there's not much more that we can give. Um, so if, if we can get to 64 units tonight, that would be excellent. Um, if you'd like to have a continuance for us to resubmit um, I can discuss with the staff the development agreement, but I'm not sure that it's beneficial for anyone given the time constraints and putting you all through it again. Um, and I understand, you know, commissioners aren't here and we don't have a right to every commissioner being present. I, I understand that. So. Yeah. Based on the applicant's uh, willingness to, you know, be so in a compromising mode, I would like to withdraw my motion and just move that we agree to move forward with the 64 units. Yes. Microphone. Please forgive me. I've gotten pretty good at pushing that button. I will. <laughs> Thank you. I will second the motion of Commissioner Janet and, Long. And can to go I ahead. ask for clarity from our motion maker and seconder? Is that including the over the buffers that are yes? Set yes. Forth I, in, I, I was going to say that in my. Yeah. I second the motion on reducing the number of units to 64, which will also include all of the conditions for the overlays, which include the buffering fence. It includes the left-hand turn lane. It includes um, the ingress and egress 
road pavement in front of the Lawlers, as well as ingress and egress into the property itself. And the reduction of the units would be as- I said reduction okay. of units six, to mm -hmm. 64. I, I but, gave 64. But along that western, uh, western side. Correct. Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Gerard. <laughs> so if we do not approve this motion, they don't, do they have to start all over again or can they come back with a revision? If you deny the request, they would need to start over again. Um, and let me be clear to, to at least part of the motion, um, the conditional overlay can and will impose a limitation on the number of units and impose the buffering requirements. The traffic improvements are not and cannot be part of the conditional overlay, at least out on alternate 19 and the ones that are off-site. Anything off-site cannot be included as part of the conditional overlay. Those are promises that the developer has made um, to help accommodate the traffic impacts for this development. And your staff can deal with some of those during the site plan review. Phrase. I will second the motion. That will allow for the development of 64 units, inclusive of the conditional overlays, with the exception of those items that are not under the control or purview of this body. Um, yeah. Clarification from something Mr. Ong said. Number of votes needed? Three. Majority of those present. Okay. And, and then, and so the rest of the items that have been promised are, are in a letter, agree, a letter from the applicant to staff. That, that is correct. Um, and let me also clarify, since we're trying to clarify, I'm assuming that the motion would be to approve staff's recommendation, which keep in mind is the zoning and the land use, the zoning being inclusive of the, the buffers and other items that Commissioner Flowers has mentioned. So I just want to be clear that that's that, what... That is correct. That is why I limited my exception only to the right of way. I mean, the left turn lane. All right, now I, I, I've dealt um, with a lot of these folks, or, or these folks I know to be, you know, the, the, the people that have presented tonight. How do, we, how do we ensure that the off-site issues are going to be done? Well, we have a promise from the developer. Again, this is something that could be included in a development agreement, which is not before you. Um, some of the traffic impacts can and will be dealt with during site plan review. I'll see what Mr. Pergolesi has to add. Construct a southbound left turn lane and associated widening on alternate US-19 at Valley Road. And the other improvements along? And the, we will, we will pave, repave Pleasant Avenue, and we will construct off-site sidewalk from our property out Pleasant Avenue and Valley Road to the Pinellas Trail. Okay. That's our and, commitment. And, and the attorney was coming up behind you. I guess he's going the other way now. I thought he was, I don't know what he was coming for, but um, okay. We, we've so already started the down the path that's with FDOT. Yes, on it's record. on the record. Okay. All right. Anything else? Just last, last question. Yes. So we went from a it was dead to a continuance to a passage with just four unit change. Is that where we're at? Yeah. Okay. All right. Just I want to be clear. Yeah. I think it's. I think the uh, four unit change was where they were going to be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Four to one. The motion passes. All right, we are going to move on to item 42. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Agenda item number 42 is the first of two public hearings regarding a proposed ordinance amending Chapter 138 zoning and Chapter 146 related to historic preservation of the Pinellas County Land Development Code in relation to replacing the old uh, or the current old Palm Harbor Downtown District Zoning category with a new Downtown Palm Harbor form-based code district zoning category. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Hey Hello. Evan. Good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Mm -hmm. um, I am Evan Johnson, Planning Division Manager uh, with Pinellas County Planning. I'm going to walk you through a presentation about our downtown Palm Harbor form based code, which we are uh, very excited to uh, be here. Um, we've been working on this uh, for quite some time. I know you all heard the master plan several months ago, so we're glad to be here tonight for um, our, our first of two hearings. So there are two cases um, that will be considered tonight. Uh, the first is going to be an ordinance um, that will actually amend the land development code um, for the adoption and adoption of the Palm Harbor form-based code. Uh, the second one is a resolution that will address the amendment to the zoning atlas itself. So if I am not mistaken, Jewel, we will be handling these separately. We'll have two, two, public, two, separate, two public hearings when we get there. So I just wanted to make that clear as I go through the presentation. There we go. Um, just a quick uh, summary of some of the context around greater downtown Palm Harbor. The area in question is 64 acres. Um, the central district, which is the kind of the core of what you would think of as downtown Palm Harbor is 31 acres. Um, it is the only, what we would consider often the downtown of unincorporated uh, Pinellas County, certainly um, North County. It's the only historic district uh, we have. It is a recently approved specific area plan um, with the new master plan update, which uh, you implemented the activity center future land use map designation. Um, it is one of our uh, few regional stormwater districts. So there's actually a portion of the uh, downtown central a district that has uh, stormwater provided for by the county, so you don't have to actually do it on site, which is helpful for these small urban spaces. There have been a number of public engagements throughout this process, um, and I will talk a little bit more about it during the um, discussion of kind of the timeline of approval, but there have been open houses, uh, exhibits. Um, we have hired a consultant to do testing on several um, unique sites around the uh, downtown area. There's been a number of follow-up face-to-face uh, -face meetings, uh, small group meetings, stakeholder meetings. Um, we've, uh, it's been really a, a concerted effort over the course of the last couple of years to get here and to find something and put something together that is uh, generally supported by particularly those owners and the development community in the area. Oh, there we go. So, Recent studies, as I mentioned, we've had the master plan update, which you all approved recently. Um, a couple years ago, we did a market study to identify um, reasonable projections for non-residential uses. We then used that to create a parking plan um, and to understand how parking demand is changing and what kind of supply we actually have. Um, we, are, uh, we finished a downtown historic survey. We've gone through and now we're here with our um, form-based code for tonight, and on top of that, uh, we will be presenting a um, set of form-based code design guidelines. Uh, we will be presenting those to the Historic Preservation Board tomorrow, and they will be coming back uh, for the August 24th hearing, which will be the second hearing for uh, these items here. So we'll have one more to talk about when we come back um, in August. So this is the adoption process I mentioned. Um, originally, we went to uh, the LPA way back in November of 2019. Um, they did recommend approval. Um, however, at that time, um, you know, there were, there were still some concerns. There were some issues brought up uh, from the development community, from internal departments. And so we basically began working on uh, a process of clarifying and simplifying the code to get us where we need to be. Uh, DRC in May, uh, June and LPA hearing, and now we'll have July and August for those two. So the big items in the ordinance change, uh, as I mentioned, there's an ordinance and a resolution. The ordinance uh, includes edits to chapter 138. 
there is an existing Old Poem Harbor district that will be removed. Um, we will in, then in, uh, put in the new form-based code district. Um, there are changes to the historic preservation district within the code, which is chapter 146. And what essentially that does is once the form-based code is adopted, non-contributing non -contributing structures would no longer have to go through the certificate of appropriateness process, which currently, basically any, any new development that you're doing in downtown Palm Harbor would have to go through the Historic Preservation Board. The goal here is to simplify that and limit that to those um, uh, contributing structures or um, I believe it's called, and I do have my historic preservationist here, Tom Schofield, but uh, those of historical uh, merit, which if you were to demolish those or recommend demolishing those, those would go to the Historic Preservation Board as well. But those are the changes, the chapter 146 uh, to simplify the development process within the historic district. Um, so as, as <laughs> to give you a little bit of context, um, and I'll do it very briefly, um, I know we've all had a long evening. Um, why form-based code? Essentially, uh, this master plan process that has been going on, the original one was passed back, I believe, in 2000. We finished one and adopted it um, just a few months ago. This is really the form-based code becomes the uh, implementing tool. Um, the density, intensity, the vision is implemented through the code. Um, so uh, that's the way the, the, the um, special specific area plan process works. This is gonna be something that does promote development and is a, is a small area focused um, plan, which we really wanna to try to do um, the best we can to create plans and codes that reflect our local communities and the unique local communities. Um, Form-based code is really about switching um, the current dynamic. If you look at today's code, we start with use, then you go to site, then you go to building form. You flip that with form-based code and you're really starting with the building form. Uh, and then you go into your site design and then you're looking at your uses. So it's really about let's make sure we get the form right in special areas like a downtown, historic downtown uh, in downtown Palm Harbor. And this is just the overall boundary. It's the same boundary as the master plan and a neighborhood activity center. There are eight divisions within the document that you had in your agenda package. Um, pretty straightforward, couple I'll call out administration talks about chapter two, talks about um, uh, the flexibility built into the code. Um, so there is flexibility for administrative adjustments and waivers, et cetera, that is built into the code to address localized conditions. It also talks about the approval process um, within there. Uh, the district standards are essentially, um, depending on where you are located, given your district, it'll give you the detailed uh, setbacks, height, all the details that you might need to develop. This is your uh, proposed map of the zoning district map. So you'll see the central district makes up uh, the 31 uh, plus acres. Um, it's that darker blue in the middle. That is again, the real kind of the core and the more intense areas of development. The stars uh, that you will see are the contributing structures that exist now um, and that are recognized in the historic district. And then you'll see the buildings of a historical merit that I mentioned, uh, most of which I believe are along Michigan Avenue. Um, those are also, while not contributing, are also recognized as important um, in the community. I will be glad to come back to this one later to describe those districts if you like, um, but there are four primary districts. Um, so when, we, when somebody uses the guide, ultimately you're gonna start with your district. Are you in the central district? Find your property, then you go in to find out what applies to you, and then using what you need to do, you'll, under, you'll be able to find the process that you need to follow. Generally, the goal and the intent of a form-based code is as long as you're meeting the kind of the design intent of what we're trying to accomplish, um, you can sail right through. We're trying to minimize the uh, number of public hearings you'd have to go to. We're trying to minimize, keep you from having to rezone, come through. You, you know when you go and you buy a property or you want to develop a property, you understand what the outcome, the desired outcome is, and that's where we want to start the conversation. Um, and then, of course, we can we can always um, be flexible along the way if we need to. Um, this uh, right here just talks a little bit about the specifics again. Um, I've already gone over these in general, but these are the code ordinance changes, the, the changes that are in the ordinance itself. Um, so we've got the replacement of OPHD, um, other minor edits, you've got a lot of references in throughout that have been shown in strike through underline. 
And then chapter 146 was uh, amended in order to focus on um, uh, the use of the form-based code uh, moving forward instead of uh, going through the certificate of appropriateness process. So with that, I believe we want to stop with the ordinance item. Um, the rest of my slides focus on the resolution that we'll be discussing. So I think we want to do the public hearing, I believe, for that one now. I, I would go ahead and open it up for the public hearing. And to be clear, Mr. Chair, this, both of these items are the first of two public hearings. So we'll just be accepting public comment. The board does not need to take any action tonight. This first part then, um, we'll, we, you did want to separate it. So, okay. And I'm not, I'm not sure that the speakers um, have specified necessarily. They're saying 42. I just want to make sure that, you know, they, they understand that there's the subtle differences. They've all asked to speak on 42. Okay. So we'll go with that and open it up if they want to uh, comment on 43. Um, Neil Valk. And then Dean Maratea and then David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Hello, Commissioners. Neil Balk. I think I know most of you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I want to uh, tell you I want to compliment your staff. They have done an amazing job on working with us as uh, property owners in Palm Harbor. As you know, if those who don't, I own the Peggy O'Neill's building in Palm Harbor. I own the whole block. We've been in Zoom meetings the last couple of days, going over some fine tuning, and these guys have been amazing. I've never seen Pinellas County staff, well, I shouldn't say all of them, but the staff has been very, very receptive. So, Barry, give them all a pay raise, would you please? <laughs> uh, but, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but I already met with them. There were some issues that we had. We discussed it. They've already worked it out. They've modified the code to work with me, individuals, a code. Let it go. You guys have done a great job, and, and I want to thank them again. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Okay, uh, Dean Marita oh. <clears throat> Sorry about that. As soon as I uh, sat down, Evan Johnson Planning Division, I realized there were a couple of changes, which Mr. Valk reminded me of. And I would like to go through them before we finish this item. So I just want to make sure, would we like to do them now or go ahead and do them? Okay. So um, first of all, um, there has been changes to state legislation recently um, and related to building design standards. It has to do with single family and two family units. Um, so we do have some modified language that we've been working on with the county attorney's office that we'll be putting into the document between first and second reading. Uh, it's very it's very minor language, but it just ensures that we're consistent with that new that new law that just came into effect. Um, there were some recommended suggestions from the LPA uh, related to um, allowing for we had proposed allowing for some flexibility. Um, around if you were um, adding on to your property a uh, small amount, you wouldn't have to build sidewalks and landscaping improvements, those types of things. Um, the LPA did recommend, uh, asked us to look into that and before we came to you all. We discussed it again internally um, a couple of times and we've decided that the flexibility, there is a significant amount of flexibility um, and that if there is really a hardship or issue that we'll be able to address it, but otherwise we We've taken that piece out of the out of the equation. Um, there was the other issue was one that uh, we did talk to um, about uh, related to uh, Mr. Valk and others. There were some concerns about some of the sidewalk standards that we have uh, in the plan. Uh, we have a table of kind of minimum sidewalk sizes, so we will be making a rec we're making a recommendation to make some adjustments. Um, Georgia Avenue has a 10-foot requirement. Um, we'll be bringing that down to eight. Um, I believe Florida Avenue uh, also has a 10-foot requirement, and we're going to bring that. Um, I believe we're going to bring that down to eight as well. Um, again, out there right now is generally eight feet, eight to 10 feet, depending on the situation. Georgia has a six-foot sidewalk currently, um, so eight feet would be an expansion of that. Um, 
We also, one little edit we'll be making to that table just relates to Alt-19 and the sidewalks along Alt-19. Um, we need to acknowledge that ultimately DOT will have uh, quite a bit to say about what happens on Alt-19, so we didn't want to, to presume that we will get the, uh, the sidewalk sizes and all of that exactly as we had, we had shown in the plan. So we we're gonna make sure to caveat the table as such. And I believe those, oh, the one other issue from LPA, they had requested us looking into um, making pre-apps mandatory uh, for the form-based code area. Um, again, we had discussions with BDRS staff um, and you know the consensus around the table was that almost all of the folks who come in get pre-app meetings anyways, so to add a requirement was not necessary, um, particularly if the process itself is doing what it's supposed to be doing, which means hopefully clarifying development goals. Maybe we won't need them as much. Um, so that we decided to leave that requirement out for now, but I did want to make you aware that was an LPA consideration. And uh, what about on um, the uh, flexibility of on on setbacks? Um, oh, uh, thank you. Um, yes. So there were two other items: uh, setbacks, um, and we also talked a little bit about building frontages. So there are. There's one area in the code that allows for a zero foot setback and it's in the central district and it's along Florida Avenue. Um, after discussing with some property owners and others, we would like to look into some possible flexible language um, to allow for more flexibility in some of the other areas. So maybe where we have a five foot requirement on Georgia could, if, if the design was right or something like that, could you reduce that to one, two, whatever. Um, we're gonna talk in the interim uh, between these meetings. We're gonna go talk to Public Works. We're gonna talk to and make sure everybody is comfortable um, and come up, come back with you with some recommended language to allow for that flexibility. Um, and the other issue that was, that we've brought up that's been discussed was the, and I had it right here, I just didn't get down to my bottom bullets, uh, was the frontage requirement. There is a requirement of 60% of the face of a lot needs to have building frontage. And the goal there is to kind of create that street wall in the central district in the urban area. So there's been some concerns, particularly for those properties that are maybe corner properties or have you know awkward, awkward lot sizes. Um, so we haven't come up with a solution yet, but we do want to work in um, trying to figure out some some alternatives, some flexibility within that. So maybe instead of 60, it's you know. 50 or something like that, but also we need to make sure that um, the big other concern with frontage is we just don't want a significant portion of a property to be fronted by parking or, you know, uh, a parking uh, screening wall or something like that. So we just have to walk that line and uh, we're going to take a little time and figure out the best language and bring that back to you. So that'll come back, that'll come back in all Yes, we will, and, and we will have them in the presentation, so I'll walk you through each of the changes okay. that we made from the version you have now. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I did call for Dean. Is he here? Dean? And then David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, all Commissioners, Barry. Uh, so I, I represent the Chamber of Commerce. I'm the president of the Palm Harbor Chamber of Commerce. So definitely have my finger on the pulse of downtown, the small businesses in the area, and uh, and I'm happy to speak on the, on behalf of the uh, majority of the property owners downtown and the downtown merchants. At the end of the day, this form-based code is good for business, right? Um, the, the idea is to serve your constituents both residentially and commercially, and this really satisfies both, in my opinion, that it's going to bring economy down to the downtown area. It's a thriving area already that has the potential to be so much more. Um, as mentioned in Evan's presentation, the uh, unincorporated Pinellas County downtown Palm Harbor is the only one and only downtown district with its own zoning. Uh, it's a historic district. None of that needs to change. What this would just allow is to be more inviting for businesses to come downtown and, uh, <clears throat> and bring the economy to, to where we can most, uh, where, where it's most needed and, and applicable. So um, yeah, that's, that's really all I wanted to say and, and again, I'll echo uh, Mr. Volk's words that the Pinellas County Commission and everybody that we've had to deal with through the chamber has been nothing but great. I won't recommend raises. I deal with the budget myself. So, <laughs> but yeah, thank you for everything. Thanks, Dean. All right. Appreciate it. Okay, David Ballard Geddes Jr. Hi, good evening, Commissioners. David Ballard Geddes Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue uh, and 
this form-based code development area. A political insurrection, an armed political insurrection. Is this what is taking place in the Lealman community redevelopment down in St. Petersburg? Is this insurrection also a part of the Palm Harbor master plan as well? As I see it, the Palm Harbor form-based code development, transfer of development right, is based on what exactly merits this third party incorporation of unincorporated county property? And why does the county want to transfer such power? Based on Home Rule Charter Section 2.04Q, a transfer of political function and power is to take hold in an attempt at enumerating special powers jurisdictionally. I see the word capture is also used in section 138-2100 of the development code. I ask, are there any ad hoc fee simple captures involved in on this? Uh, development practice, or are there any reclaim water variances that may apply relative to this development privatization of such? Do you feel that this form-based code development is engaged in any long-standing licentious or wanton, degenerate or transgressed forms of political behavior, or maybe fraud, maybe willful misrepresentations? in and of the county as based on statute 817.034. Article 1, section 10 of the U.S. Constitution states that there shall, there no state shall enter into any bill of attainder, letter of marquee, reprisals, or alliances of such. Is the county itself being used as, as a, a false front operation, a platform? possibly used as a medium, used to aid and abed, is the county being used as a bill of attainder to allow this to internal transfer of political function and powers as revealed in the Home Rule Charter to privatize these functions and, and political power through infrastructure scheming, enumerating such powers jurisdictionally are, and thereby subjecting uh, us the residents to third party privatized forms of direct taxation. I feel as though as a resident living inside this development area that we've got set up from a long way out. Thank you. Um, I have one final co uh, co card here. Phil, Phil Phillips, Phil Phillips. Sorry, I was late in filling out my card. Nope. Nancy gave me a hard time about it. So. <laughs> I'm Phil Phillips. I'm uh, a resident of Palm Harbor, 1834 Melanie Way in Palm Harbor. I'm also your uh, fix a Palm Harbor Community Services Agency chairman. Um, so if I haven't met you yet, I will hopefully in the future. Uh, thank you for all that you do. I'm up here in support of the, uh, the form-based code changes, and it's exciting for us, and especially as a um, I mean, I'm not a property owner, but we do control the uh, Reba Sutton White Chapel and, and you know, that building you know, for you all. And uh, it's, it's really exciting to see the changes come into Palm Harbor. It's been a long time. I know we've tried and tried through the old town, you know, old downtown Palm Harbor, and it just takes so long to get developments. And it's exciting now to see that builders and developers and owners want to put more money into the downtown and seeing this. And I had to look up what form-based code really meant and what it really did imply. The 115-page document, you know, that's available. I didn't really read through the whole thing. I hope you all have, but it's a, <laughs> it is exciting to see it. It's going to help us uh, downtown to see a more vibrant, you know, move for development and to get some people to understand what downtown Palm Harbor really is. I was mentioning to some of the other people that are here tonight that. Um, I don't know, uh, Oliveri has, is building a new building on Alter 19, and anywhere else in the county, uh, you know, you would hear them saying, oh, it's another building, it looks nice. In Palm Harbor, we go, oh my God, this is great, you know, to see new development coming downtown. And so through this, you know, through our next board meeting, hopefully, uh, you know, the next presentation that this will get passed, and you'll see a, a vibrant downtown, and I'll see you all down there enjoying it in the near future. So that's all I have to say. We're Thank excited. you, Phil. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, I don't have any other cards. Any other comments? Um, any questions from the board? Any comments? Okay. Well, I just really wanted to say, um, for I know we're not we're not voting tonight, um, but I did want to just for the record thank Barry, um, the planning folks, um, Nancy McKibben, our new advisory group in downtown, um, our merchants association, our chamber of commerce, who've really just come together um, and and started, uh, you know, rowing the boat the same direction with the same intensity about trying to get things done to, you know, just improve um, development in a measured way for downtown Palm Harbor. And um, we're connecting the, the east and west sides of Alt-19. We're connecting to the east. Um, golf cart access is made, of, made possible. There's just a whole lot of activity going on. I'm really excited about it. And it is controlled and it is measured. And it has been based on a lot of input from residents that have lived there a long time. Um, so anyway, um, r r congratulations to everybody that's been involved. And uh, with that, we'll move on to the resolution piece. Mr. Chair, agenda yep. item number 43 is the first of two public hearings for case number ZLU-28-11-19. This is similar to agenda item number 42. It's an application of Pinellas County for a zoning change from, and I'm gonna have a lot of acronyms here, so bear with me, OPHD, which is Old Palm Harbor Downtown, C2, which is General Commercial and Services, C2H, which is General Commercial and H Services Historic Preservation Overlay, R3, which is single family residential, R4, one, two, and three family residential, LO, which is limited office, GO, general office, C1, neighborhood commercial, E1, employment one, E1CO, which is employment one conditional overlay, and E2, employment two, to DPH FBC, which stands for Downtown Palm Harbor Form-Based Code District on approximately 64 acres, comprising the greater Downtown Palm Harbor area, the public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. One comment in opposition has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Go ahead. With that, um, I, I think Kat covered most of it. Um, my goal, <laughs> our goal here is to make sure she never has to read all of those again at one time. But the, uh, the resolution will actually change the zoning atlas amendment from the existing zoning uh, categories that are out there to uh, the new form based code district. It's uh, and the, the document itself will then direct you to the sub areas, which will include um, the detailed development standards, et cetera, within that area. So that's um, it'll match up, as you can see, with our activity center neighborhood, which has already been approved on the comprehensive plan. So that'll be the uh, uh, cleanup on the map itself. Okay. Any questions, comments? Commissioner Gerard on the motion. You don't need to take action oh. tonight. But you should take yeah, thanks public a lot, comment. <laughs> I was going right along with you, so. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're moving on to item 40. Mr. Chair, did we have any public comment on this item? Yes, we do. We have one comment. I'm so, so sorry. Liam Blaney. Is Liam here? Is that a no? Okay. It's a good thing there's a lot of people that keep me straight, thankfully. Okay, moving on to item 44. Mr. Chair, agenda item number 44 is a proposed resolution approving the fiscal year 2021-2022 annual action plan and authorizing actions related to the administration and operation of the Community Development Block Grant, Home Investment Partnerships and Emergency Solutions Grant Programs. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Go ahead. Yeah. Staff's available to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes, Mr. Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was, and we've been doing this for many years, and there are always great projects. 
my question is more curiosity. How do how does the uh, organization that's getting funded how are they become aware of the application process? Is it chicken and egg? How how does that all happen? Okay, sure. Uh, good evening, Bruce Bussey, Community Development Manager. Um, we do a several efforts to reach out to the public. Um, we advertise public hearing notices in the Deputy Times, publications of general circulation. We maintain a list of nonprofit agencies, anybody that contacts us throughout the year who's applied in the past. We send out email blasts to them to let them know about that. Um, early February, we held a, a meeting to, um, to solicit public input on priorities and needs. A lot of agencies attend those meetings, provide input to us to formulate the recommendations and the priorities. And then after that meeting, we do an um, application cycle. So again, we publicize those applications. Okay, very good. No, it's, uh, uh, they're not always huge dollar amounts, but uh, the organizations that receive them, it's very valuable. So thank you very much. And, and those recommendations, once we have those, we also advertise those publicly in the Tampa Bay Times for a period of time prior to this meeting, which then is another public hearing. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I do have one public comment. I think uh, it's coming in online, I think. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, Ms. Virginia Frizzle had pre-registered to speak on this item, but there is no attendees on the Zoom right now. Okay. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, do I have the move approval? And a second from Commissioner Flowers. Any final comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Boy, that was not a really good eye. <laughs> I mean, everybody's tired, I guess, aren't we? All right, um, anything else for the good of the order? If not, uh, the meeting is adjourned.